actually good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the 12 p.m. public portion of the closed session of the January 14th, 2020 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the council members will move to the courtyard conference room for the closed session. I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Watkins? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Glover? Here. Crone? Over here now. Vice Mayor... Vice Mayor My Myers? Here. Mayor Cummings? Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak on any <coughs> items listed on the closed session agenda? I'm first. <laughs> You'll have my, my two minutes. Like You'll have two minutes for public comment. Okay. Uh, my name is Spike Murphy. I got a letter saying that because I filed a claim uh, for some damage done to my car uh, at a city work site a few months ago in November that I had to show up here. Uh, long story short, when I was driving down River Street uh, around the 500 block, there was some construction going on at the intersection there. Uh, I, some contractor truck was pulling out from there, ran through a bunch of the cones uh, in the work site and dragged them into the road right in front of me and the other vehicles was not able to swerve and avoid that first cone that popped out from under their car. Uh, it got stuck in the undercarriage of my car and tore the boot off of the axle. Um, and so I had to pull over and it was leaking grease everywhere and had to call AAA. Took it over to Motec down the street, which is my regular mechanic. Brought the bill with the day and the time. They had the part on hand. We got it for 200 bucks, which was cheaper than anywhere else and just looking to get the money back for that. I did try, it was a chimney sweep contractor truck. I called every chimney sweep in town, was unable to find them. So I don't know if they're unregistered, just not listed or what. But that's my story. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, uh, I guess we can adjourn this portion of the session. Or is there anyone else who would like to address us on any item in closed session? I don't want to address it, but I'll just ask staff, has there been communication about our process from this point forward with the, uh, with the claim? We did tender this claim to the city's contractor who right. had indemnified yeah. the city, and the claimant received a copy of that. And I was just going to catch him after. That, that was my point. It. We, we don't just yeah. put it off into space, and, and hopefully the staff will communicate yeah, that, with you about the follow-up. Okay. Yeah. That went out yeah. over a week ago, so. Yeah, I got the, okay. I got the letter saying that it went to Don Chapin, and then I got this a couple days ago saying that. Okay. Yeah, Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, we can adjourn this yeah. portion to closed session. Good afternoon and welcome to our 12.45 p.m. session of the January 14th, 2020 meeting of the City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Glover? Here. Crone? Present. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. And I'd like to ask the clerk if she could please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States. All right, before we um, move on to the introduction of new employees, I'd also like to announce that this will be the last meeting uh, where Lieutenant John Bush will be our Sergeant at Arms, as he recently was promoted to Lieutenant, and so I'd like to thank him for all of his service at Sergeant at Arms over these years. At this time, I'd like to invite up the Acting Finance Director, Cheryl Fife, to introduce Brooke Rosso, Payroll Technician. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Brooke Rosso. Brooke, Ros Brooke, Brooke Rosso uh, is a native of Santa Cruz, born and raised, and uh, she has about 20 years experience working at local, finance, local businesses in the area, and uh, she is our new payroll technician. And uh, she has a partner named Mike, uh, a daughter named Riley, and a son named Nico. And she likes hiking and gardening and anything to do with outdoors and spending a lot of time at the beach with her family. So welcome. Welcome.
Next up, I'd like to invite the Director of Public Works, Mark Dettel, to introduce George Juarez, Parking Facilities Maintenance Assistant, and Novim Spencer, uh, Wastewater Plant Operator too. Good afternoon, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. Unfortunately, George could not be here this afternoon, so, um, but it is my pleasure to introduce Novim Spencer to you. She's a new Wastewater Plant Operator 3, and she was born and grew up in Santa Clara, and she currently lives in San Jose. She has a spouse, a son, and three cats. Um, but her past work experience includes five years as an operator, wastewater treatment operator for the city of San Jose. And she has a she went to Foothill College in San Jose State and attained a, a bachelor's of science in parks management. Uh, when she's not working, she enjoys snow skiing, camping, and playing ice hockey. Um, and then a fun fact, uh, she's also an airplane mechanic in the Air National Guard. So please join me in welcoming uh, Novim Spencer. Thank you and welcome. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite our Director of Water, Rosemary Menard, to introduce George Fernandez and Jennifer Shelton. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Happy New Year to you all. Um, I'm really happy to be introducing to you a new water distribution operator in training, Jorge Fernandez. He's a, uh, his background is a water pump mechanic for 20, 21 years and at the Salinas Pump Company. And uh, he's worked there as a crew leader also. Uh, his, his experience in drilling water wells and pump installation will be really valuable for him in helping us, him learn about the distribution system. And um, we're really happy to have him joining us, someone with his background and experience as a distribution operator in training. He likes to work on classic cars and currently is working on a C10 1972 Chevy Suburban, which I don't expect is a um, hybrid vehicle at all. <laughs> um, and he enjoys barbecues and watching footballs with family and friends. He has a 21 year old son that he's trying to get interested in becoming a sort of a public servant along the lines of his dad taking up this kind of work over time. So welcome Jorge. And then second, I'm really pleased to um, in, introduce you to Jennifer Shelton's. Jennifer has just joined us as a management analyst in our operations division. It's a new position up there that we've created this, just this last year, and she is really a great first person in that job. She brings a bachelor's in, of arts in pub, political science and a master's in public administration from San Jose State. She's worked a, a number of years at uh, Healthier Kids Foundation, which was a nonprofit that helped provide healthy health-related services to low-income children, Santa Clara County, and then also went on to work with the city of Santa Clara, where she worked in the city manager's office, the city clerk's office, no stealing, and, um, <laughs> and most recently in the Department of Electric Utilities over there. So that's been her, her, her primary responsibility over there were contract negotiations and compliance on their website. So this is really great background for our operational issues. And one of the things she'll be working on is the risk and resiliency analysis that we have to do under the American Water Infrastructure Act from 2018. It's sort of a thing that all water utilities have to go through, depending on your size, our, our analysis is done by, due by the end of this year. Uh, she's the youngest of four girls and loves spending time with her family, especially her seven nephews and nieces. And she loves to travel, most recently went to Thailand where to celebrate one of her sister's weddings and she recently moved to SoCal with her boyfriend and looks forward to more outdoor adventures in the Santa Cruz area. So please welcome Jennifer. Thank you and welcome. <laughs> Next, I'd like to invite up Coach Bubba Trumbull, and head coach of Santa Cruz High School Cardinals football team, joined by the athletes of the football team. And this, I'm inviting them up as we're proclaiming January 14, 2020 as Santa Cruz High School Cardinals Varsity Football Team Day. Oh. So, um, I'd just like to read a couple lines of this proclamation, which is pretty impressive for the football team. Um, on November 29, 2019, the Santa Cruz High School Cardinal varsity football team, led by Coach Trumbull, earned its second CCS championship with a 27 win over Leland for the Division V section title. 
And whereas this was the second CCS championship in Santa Cruz High School's history since opening in 1897, the first championship was won in 2007. And whereas the CCS title was made possible due to the hard work and dedication of all the players and coaches and through the support of alumni, fans, family, friends, and community members throughout the season, and whereas on December 7, 2019, the Santa Cruz High School Cardinals varsity football team became California's Interscholastic Federation Central Coast Section 6A runners-up on its first ever state championship run, I now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim January 14, 2020, as Santa Cruz High School Cardinal Varsity Football Team Day in the City of Santa Cruz, and I encourage all the citizens to join me in congratulating the team on its 2019 Central Coast Section Title. I'd like to invite the coach up to see if you'd like to say any words about the season. And, and, and <laughs> uh, thank you for this tremendous honor. I'm fortunate enough to, to be able to see two different groups of young men and women come through the, with, and receive this. Um, most of them I had to show them where City Hall was, so that was a good learning experience for us. <laughs> But it, with a group of young men and women like this, it was, it was an easy experience. They do all the hard work and they make us look good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Before you all leave, I'm just wondering, since in order to get a picture of all of us, I'm wondering if you guys could come behind the dais and take a picture with the whole city council. Yeah. <laughs> All right, at this, at this moment, I'd like to invite up Rosemary Menard, our water director, to present Toby Goddard with a 25-year service pin recognition. Good afternoon again. Um, it's somewhat a bittersweet pleasure to find myself in front of you today. Uh, giving Toby Goddard a 25-year service award. Often when this happens, the next thing that happens is you get a little note saying, my retirement date is, and Toby has done that and will celebrate the retirement a little bit further out in this calendar year. But I think it's very appropriate for us to acknowledge Toby for really the unique person that he is and the unique contribution that he's made to the city water department. Um, he joined the water department in January of 1995 as a water conservation coordinator. Uh, and then he became the manager of conservation in 2005. Prior to joining the um, water department staff, Toby served as the outside city uh, representative on the city's water commission for a number of years. And so he, um, he basically came to the job in understanding more about our business and who we are and what we were trying to do than most typical new hires. And that trend really has continued for him. He has really brought a lot of uh, innovation and individuality and perspective to the job in a way that's been really, really unique and a, a great benefit to the department. So in addition to Toby's accomplishments in um, water conservation that are really legendary throughout the state. He's had a great impact on many of the programs that are being implemented all over the state, things that we tried here and worked well. 
And Santa Cruzans, uh, as a result of that, can take credit for a, um, having one of the lowest water use per capita consumptions in the state. And I will tell you just an example of that that is just completely hits the target um, exactly. So in the uh, Santa Cruz Municipal Utilities newsletter that comes out, the Shamu Review that we call, it comes out every couple times a year. In 1999, Toby wrote an article for the 2020 version, or 2000 version of that, that was a projection of what was gonna happen in 2020. Well, he unearthed that as he is wont to do in this last week. And uh, his projection of demand for municipal water in Santa Cruz from 1999 was 5.2 billion gallons of water a year. And our current demand is actually half of that, 2.6 billion gallons of water a year, which is a really uh, great example of the kind of impact that Toby and his team of folks have had on water consumption here and just generally in water consumption in the state. <laughs> but I think it's really worth uh, noting that he had this idea and then was able to dig up the, the facts from 20 years ago. Maybe he's cleaning out his office, I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so I think that he's, uh, the other thing I want to mention about Toby here was he's, uh, he's been really the person who's done the urban water management plans for Santa Cruz for a number of years. And those also have been a really great uh, opportunity for him to provide leadership to the organization and to kind of create a set of skills that then he's applied in different ways, including, for example, he's been work recently working on updating our emergency response plan, which was pretty much in need of it, but it's been really doing a great job of trying to pull a really complicated uh, program that has to look at everything from floods to earthquakes to fires together and create some action plans that we can use in the event that we uh, find ourselves in one of those emergency conditions. Another notable for Toby is the uh, famous water school. In uh, 2014 and 2015, he created a method for people who are getting really big bills as a result of leaks or other kinds of problems to have those uh, charges forgiven if they went to water school. And that um, got international uh, coverage in the summer of 2014 in particular and was copied by many organizations throughout the state in 2015. But with all of that said, one of Toby's most notable accomplishments, probably which you don't see very much, but I see and my colleagues and I see all over the place, is Toby has been doing an excellent job of mentoring other employees in our organization. He's become uh, really the go-to guy for history and uh, perspective about the system's history and what we were doing when and why we were doing it. and. Um, you know, that has been a really great contribution. He's bringing along a lot of younger people. There's a group of uh, folks that walk with Toby during the lunch hours, and I think that they discuss uh, not just work-related stuff, but when they do discuss work-related stuff, almost always it comes back with some good idea that came out of that, that I'm sure Toby had his hand in. And in his free time, many of you know that Ter Toby serves as a commissioner of the Port Commission, and that has been a really important job for me also. So please join me at this point in thanking Toby for 25 years of service and um, wishing him the best in, as things move down the road. Thank you very much, Rosemary, for the kind remarks. I just have a short prepared statement. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, thank you very much. I'm just extremely grateful to have had the opportunity to serve the public and to support and promote the mission of the Water Department over the last 25 years to provide safe, adequate, reliable water service for the great, greater Santa Cruz region. Uh, to me, Water service is one of the most important functions that the city performs in terms of protecting the public health and well-being of almost 100,000 people who live in the community, as well as those that work and visit this area. I'm also very thankful to be part of a team from customer service staff to the meter readers, operators, distribution operators, treatment operators, chemists, park rangers, resources staff, 
who are dedicated to maintaining and improving the system and managing our watersheds. So it's this group, not to mention all the other departments that we work closely with on a day-to-day -day basis that make the city of Santa Cruz such a positive and productive place to work. So personally and professionally, this has been a very rewarding career and I thank you again. Toby, I would just like to say that um, the city of Santa Cruz is very much grateful given that you know we grapple with so many issues around water conservation and the need to be better at conserving water. You know, your efforts over these past 25 years show uh, how committed you've been to this and you've made Santa Cruz one of the leading cities in the state in terms of water conservation. So thank you very much for all your time and service and I'm sure that we here in Santa Cruz and folks throughout California will thank you for all your hard work. Right, the next item on our agenda for today, Dr. Ricky Erickson, marine ecologist from the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation, will provide a presentation on the all-female 2200 nautical mile expedition on plastic pollutions. Uh, can you see that? Yes, on your screen? You can. Yes. Okay, there, there it go. is. Got it. Um, and how do I go forward with this little clicker? <laughs> Great. Um, hi, my name is Ricky Erickson, and I'm here today to talk to you about something called X Expedition. And I have my colleague, Louise Tremorin from England, who is also on this expedition. So, what is the expedition? It's an organization that is running a pioneering, it just started in England all-female sailing research expedition to investigate the impacts and causes of plastic pollution around our world. And what we were on, um, Luis and I were on one leg of a journey that's two years long. It started in October in England. It's 30 individual voyages. Each voyage has 10 women on it, so that's a total of 300 women sailing 38,000 nautical miles around the globe. And these are some of the amazing women who became my family. They are women from Latvia working with local governments. They're women from Austria in the plastic packaging, one of the largest plastic packaging companies who gave us her insights. Australia from Teachers Louise works with um, children on something like O'Neill Sea Odyssey. So these are really passionate women who are making a difference on the ground. For those of you non-sailors or sailors, this was our vessel. She was called Travel Edge. She was 73 and a half feet long. She's steel um, and very sturdy, which we were very happy for. She was actually specifically chosen by the British Army, which is where she was built for an expedition to Antarctica. And you can see she has um, four sets of sails on her, so a lot of sail power. We were, again, on the second leg coming from the Azores. You can see that she's uh, the Azores. Azores is a set of islands off the coast of Portugal and Morocco out about a sixth of the way across the Atlantic Ocean. And we were the first leg that was sailing across an ocean. So we went 2,200 over 2,200 nautical miles. We had 17 sunsets and sunrises and did all sorts of research. We had anywhere from no wind to 40 knots of wind, and we consumed over 55 packets of biscuits during our journey. <laughs> Um, and we had some bad weather. So many of you may remember, I think that it did make national news here in Santa Cruz. We had two very late season hurricanes, which came smack on top of us. So we had first Pedro and then Rebecca, and Pedro is up the one on the top there, went directly over the Azores, and this is what the weather looked like when we finally left port. And basically we got to sail around the swirl created around Rebecca which made for 40 knot winds as we left the port of Sao Miguel. And while we were in port on this five day departure, we did and we continue to do like this, all sorts of outreach and education with giving talks, making people aware of the work that's being done, doing cleanups, um, and I'll talk more about some of the um, outreach that's been done. But with those 
poor conditions that we had, this is what the deck looked like um, down below as we left port from Sao Miguel. One of the girls said, it looks like a battlefield up there in the cockpit. So you can actually see, you know, a lot of the girls were very, very seasick for the first couple days. We did have up to, you know, 15 to 20 foot seas. Um, and so it was not fun on deck for the first bit. But everybody recovered rather quickly. And so the point of this was, you know, to look at how much plastic was out there. And I know you guys are one of the most innovative and in taking action. You know, California certainly is a leader in the nation and Santa Cruz is a leader in the state. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this, but certainly plastic production around the globe is on the increase. And this curve, if you talk with the production companies, just look you know, worse and worse if you project this out over time. So more and more per, uh, plastic is going to be coming into our communities, and I think that's why keeping plastic out of our communities is such a big issue. You know, just some of the numbers, there's more than one dump truck load per minute. There's over nine million tons per year. The number projected for this year is actually already at 11 million. And the top three, it's important to realize, is not just, you know, individual consumption bottles with like, you know, the plastic shampoo, but things like packaging, construction, and transportation. So any innovative ways that you guys can look towards, you know, taking action action to keep it out of our communities, I think is where we're really gonna make a difference. So this is just some of the fun, you know, a lot of people ask, we actually were all women. There was no male captain on board. Our captain was a woman, the best captain I've ever sailed with, the most passionate, positive crew I've ever sailed with. I am a sailor, some of the women before. Louise had never sailed really, you know, before one girl um, had never actually even hardly stepped foot on a sailboat, and I was like, really? Sailing across the Atlantic is your first foray that you wanna take? But um, it was so you know amazing to be a part of this group, and we did everything from sail the boat to cook, to laugh, cry, hold each other's heads while individuals were sick, um, and then do the science. And we did do over five hours of science a day, so we collected microplastics. This is what the ocean looked like. It looks beautiful. It does not look like a garbage patch. We are in the middle of the garbage patch right there. And that's what's really just kind of insidious about this problem is that the plastic actually gets accumulated into these smaller and smaller bits. And this is what it looks like. So you're looking at sargassum and plankton from the sargassum sea. And all those little tiny white bits are actually microplastics. So the the plastic, and I didn't even as a marine scientist realize this is how bad that it looks. We did find one plastic spoon while we were out there on um, the sea, but it's called the big breakup. So any piece of plastic ultimately gets broken up into smaller and smaller pieces, and there's over 250,000 tons of the raw materials called myrtles that are entering our ocean every year. And this is a little bit of what it looks like. Um, there are live materials. Actually, I got this um, image in the bottom. I was really intrigued because he looked like he had a real nose to him. And it's actually a juvenile marlin. But if you're a bird or a whale and you're in, you know, ingesting this, there's more than, in our samples, there was more than seven to one plastic <coughs> to zooplankton or plankton. And they're not discerning, you know, they're just opening their mouths and consuming this. And then we eat them. And so this is, you know, moving up the food chain. This is again an image from National Geographic of what it looks like. And we found this type two, so we actually would analyze the samples of small plastic to try to find out where the source was on board. We had equipment to do that, and it was this big type two, which is most likely what we find here off of our beaches as well. 
And the problem with this is that the majority of this plastic ends up straight in our landfills. I'm sure Santa Cruz is doing a better job than this six to seven percent, but you know, even if we are recycling, that means that over 90% of this plastic ends up in our you know, communities and, and us having to deal with it. So again, I think that keeping it from coming into our communities is such a brilliant way um, for us to do this. Just a few you know, fun images of what we saw up there. We saw Shearwaters, Albatross, Stormy Petrels. We had multiple schools of spotted Atlantic dolphins and some as we came into the tropics. And a cool story about this minke whale who followed us for two days, a juvenile looking minke whale who was feeding on all of this. Our captain was afraid that he was gonna actually ram us because they've been known to do that, but it was really cool in the swells. He was following us. But, you know, Louise and I, and I'm understanding that there's another woman in Santa Cruz who may be part of this as well, um, we're part of this international expedition. It's going on for another year and a half, and it has been getting, you know, CNN, BBC, we've been on all sorts of news media. It's much bigger um, than we actually anticipated. And many sponsors locally, both Patagonia, Santa Cruz, all the clothes I wear, wore, were either West Marine locally or Patagonia Santa Cruz um, were supporters of it and certainly my organization the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation supported my participation in this. And with that, I just wanna say thank you to all the active and bold initiatives that you all are taking and you can follow this. There's great information and alternatives that you know these women are identifying along the way. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. You were talking about actions and uh, keeping it out of our communities. What, what's, give us some suggestions. What should we do? Because none of us up here have ever produced plastic that I know of. Uh, other, you know, corporations produce plastic. Right, and, and so it was really intriguing to have the woman from um, from Mundi, is the largest, wor the world's largest plastic packaging company. And she threw that right back at us, right? And said, you know, it's your demand as individuals and consumers. And I think that things like the store that's down, you know, the bamboo store um, and the zero waste store in Santa Cruz are, you know, encouraging places like New Leaf. I think, the, to answer your question outright first, is education and outreach with the community, and we need to make our citizens aware of it. You know, secondly, promoting and finding ways for, I mean, even Patagonia, I went into the store, and we weren't allowed to have certain materials on board because we would taint the samples, right? And I had a challenging time, and Patagonia was quite aware of it, that, you know, these, these materials are cheap, you know, because they're subsidized for a reason, and so I think that any actions that we can take as a community to incentivize. You know, third is things like, you know, banning things so that, um, you know, companies or businesses do find alternatives like bioproducts. There's lots of great bioproducts that are out there. So that's why, like, I gave this talk to the Santa Cruz Yacht Club, and they are um, helping to try to make them go, you know, plastic free, and then connecting them to what are those products that are plastic free that are competitive. And I kind of, I envision us, you know, if you look back 20 years ago with organic, it was hard to become organic and it was hard as an individual to select organic products because they were so much more costly. And look at us now. And I think that it's small ways and certainly banning products as a council, you know, puts pressure on businesses to find alternatives. Any other questions? Well, I'd just like to say thank you for all the hard work you're doing. I think one of the things you touched on was education and outreach, and you all are doing a fantastic job of that. And so please um, keep us up to date with all the work you're doing so we can be supportive in this effort to remove more plastics from our oceans. Absolutely, and we're you know to be a source of that for you. So if there's specific products or examples, you know, Luis is here from England for a month with me, and we're all a community who are you know, trying to link examples of successes around the world. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, and then our next presentation will be heard shortly after 3 p.m.
So moving on to our next, um, actually no, we have one presentation left, which is Nicole Young, a City of Santa Cruz three year strategic planning process. I think that is the one that's moving to th through. Oh, that's the one that's, that's moving. The one that's oh, moving. okay, got it, thank you. Okay, so I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left and it's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you're inside the council chambers. Um, and before I um, move on to statements of disqualification, I just wanted to have an opportunity to um, remind council members of our rules of procedures for conduct of city council business. And so those rules include um, that we are respectful, that we engage in open and honest communication, that we are honest and truthful, that we address difficult issues, we find areas of common ground, that we're open to different perspectives, we give the benefit of the doubt, we role model good leadership, and that we are considerate of each other's time. So I hope that as we uh, move into 2020 that we can keep these uh, rules in mind when we are engaging with one another. Uh, the other thing that I would like to add and I would like to ask of my council members is that uh, when council members are making motions, I would urge that council members either make comments before making the motion or reserve their comments until after making the motion so the, that the city clerk can clearly capture the motion. Additionally, it will be best for council members to send motions to the city clerk prior to the meeting so that they can be displayed and edited as we're moving along. And this was uh, brought to my attention given the fact that sometimes there's difficulty in capturing the motions and so this would help us to clearly understand what we're voting on. And additionally, if there are friendly amendments, it's gonna be my inclination um, to limit discussion after two friendly amendments so that we can um, make sure that we have clear motions that are being made. As we're, as we're making decisions. Right. And so statements of disqualification, I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Hearing none, um, Mayor to call on the city clerk administration to announce any additions or deletions. There are none. Uh, the announcement of oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda, and oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. So at this time, I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the city council. This afternoon, uh, the council convened at 12 p.m. in the courtyard conference room to uh, discuss the following closed session items. Item A was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims. Those are the claims of Sarat Vihari Murphy and Ralph Walter Boroff. Uh, those are also listed as item 13 on your consent calendar this afternoon. Um, there were two items of anticipated litigation, um, one involving the consideration of initiation of litigation and one involving significant exposure to litigation. Council received a report from the city attorney's office on those items. Um, there was no reportable action. Uh, item D was a conference with labor negotiators in which the council received a report from its negotiator, uh, HR director Lisa Murphy, concerning the police officers association. Um, there was no reportable action in connection with that item. Lastly, was an item of real property negotiations, which the council received a report from Economic Development Director Bonnie Lipscomb concerning the property at 125 Coral Street. Owners James P. Gillespie and Jean Gillespie, trustees, and Harley F. and Sandra I. Gillespie, co-trustees. Uh, there was no reportable action on that item. Thank you. I'd like to call on the city manager to report and provide updates on any city events and business items. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I've got a couple of items I wanted to report on and uh, just wait for the presentation to go up on the screen. Uh, one is the HUD consolidated plan and the other is uh, just an update on the uh, armory uh, shelter. So first, uh, 
with respect to the HUD cons consolidated plan, just for really for the public, uh, just to inform the, the council and the public that the city is developing its uh, 2020 to 2025 HUD consolidated plan, and uh, we're in the process now of conducting a survey to help provide feedback that will be incorporated into the plan that will come back to the council. And I uh, wanted to make you and the community aware that there's a link on the city's internet homepage under the new section. If you go to the homepage, you will see the new section and you can click and it'll take you to it. The um, survey results will help determine how best to prioritize funding designated for eligible programs and uh, projects and uh, services that are really focused on our low income uh, communities and neighborhoods. And it's available both in Spanish and English until January 31st, 2020. So we encourage everyone in the community to take the survey. That'd be really helpful, particularly those that live in, the, in these areas. Now, with respect to the armory, just to give you a, an update on the winter shelter there. So the armory is currently under the city's control uh, with a signed lease and the right of entry given by the California State uh, National Guard. Uh, city staff have been preparing the space for the last few weeks and ensuring that all the systems are operational at the facility, including heat and lights, and we're working really effectively to, to make the space suitable for a shelter. It had been vacant for about three years, so it needed a little bit of uh, preparation. Uh, today or tomorrow morning, the state fire marshal will be conducting an inspection and determining the occupant load. Uh, with that number, we will determine the potential winter shelter expansion, uh, but again, hope to make it uh, as, uh, uh, as much as possible. Our hope is to shelter at least 18 individuals at the armory. The uh, river camp, uh, street camp, will be moved to the armory uh, tomorrow. Um, city staff across nearly all departments will be involved with the move, uh, which was operationalized under our uh, emergency operations center. So we've got all the departments working really hard to, to, to take this and to uh, make this happen. Uh, the Armory's uh, program model is, is really an exact replica of the River Street uh, camp. 24-hour uh, security will be on site to ensure safety uh, is maintained for clients, uh, the area, and staff. Uh, the program will be fully staffed with Salvation Army employees and the only access uh, uh, will be uh, through, um, uh, by clients will be through hourly shuttle, uh, shuttle service. And there will be no walk on walk off. Then uh, beginning next week, uh, there also will be uh, uh, bathrooms, wash stations and storage provided for, for uh, clients there. Uh, beginning next week, the city and the Salvation Army will begin to accept new clients to the River Street Camp 24-hour uh, shelter model, as well as overnight drop-in clients, and those clients will be in, uh, intaked through the current uh, Salvation Army process and likely consist of a combination of current Laurel Street clients as well as new clients that are currently unsheltered or shelter waitlist and are through law enforcement or service provider referrals. Um, since we have... Uh, uh, you know, wait lists at the, at the Laurel Street facility. So it's really just trying to maximize the facility to provide as much shelter space for those that are in waiting lists, those that currently have shelter, uh, and those that may need shelter moving forward. Um, and uh, our hope is to use the Armory, uh, again, as an increased capacity for the program overall. Uh, just by way of background, too, we did hold a neighborhood meeting uh, around the armory on January 5th, uh, where we were able to discuss the, the operational model, answer questions, and uh, provide uh, an opportunity for residents of the area to provide feedback, uh, which they did uh, around, they had questions and also had uh, uh, some suggestions around the shuttle uh, uh, schedule as well as the shuttle um, route, um, which were uh, taken into account. Uh, but by and large, they, they expressed support, uh, they understood the need for shelter, the need to address uh, the uh, helping individuals, particularly given the, the current climate and, and how cold it is, and uh, generally supported the, uh, the move to the, the armory. And uh, we will continue to update the council uh, and the public through our outreach channels during the coming weeks as we move forward with this. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any, qu well actually, uh, wanted to actually provide you an update with a couple other items really quickly uh, on, on homelessness. So the AFC and the Police Department Safe Spaces Pilot Program, uh, that's up and operational. Uh, and we'll give you an update on that as we get that going further. Um, the council approved a homelessness resource manager position uh, last year, and we're in the process of doing that recruitment. We hope to hopefully have somebody in place uh, at least hired in the next several weeks, but that really is moving forward. Uh, like I said, the uh, recruitment process is, is ongoing right now. 
And uh, we are moving forward with uh, also, as council is aware, the relocating the shuttle pickup and intake site over at the county. Uh, and so they're working really hard to get that in place. And that'll have some really significant improvements in terms of uh, the way individuals are intaked and, and uh, uh, put into the system as well as provide uh, just better facilities uh, uh, for individuals who uh, wanna uh, move up to the, uh, the shelters. And then uh, we are looking at installing an additional RV sewage dumping site at the River Street uh, property where the current River Street camp is. And then we expect that the cash will report back to the city council on February 25th. So that's just a quick update on some homeless one these items. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Yeah, thank you for the update. I have two questions. Uh, I and, and also thank you for all of your efforts to get the armory back online. I know that's been a long time, pro a long term process and a lot of work. So I really appreciate, um, and Ron Prince who was in the back there, I know was really um, very much a, uh, working, working hard to make that happen. Um, I do wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the process for, um, and the rationale for moving the River Street Camp to the armory. Uh, I know as we've discussed this over time um, and the council hasn't weighed in on exactly how it were to be used, but we did express support for that. Um, we didn't, you know, I wasn't aware until quite recently that this would be uh, used to, for that transition. So I guess if you could just talk about the rationale for that, because um, I think the goal for, for all of us is to expand shelter capacity and, and so we're not really quite getting there. Um, so that's one question. And then I, my other question is, is logistical, and this is specific to the, um, the kind of on and off, get, you know, getting on and off uh, privileges for the folks who are gonna be at the armory. What plans have you made for addressing uh, people whose work hours do not fit with the shuttle schedule? I kind of ask about this every time we do a managed camp program, because I know this is a concern for at least some segment of uh, the population, the residents, and I know, and I just happened to hear one person yesterday came in and said he was worried because he works until 2 a.m. and he, he bicycles on and off at River Street, but he can't do that at the armory. So what plans are being made to, to make sure we can accommodate people with work schedules? All right, uh, first with respect to your first question, um, so yes, ideally, and I think initially our hope had been to uh, add a facility that would just increase capacity in general, uh, and that would be uh, really, ne it's really needed, and, would, and would, it was the sort of the first uh, thought with respect to, to um, again, increasing capacity. Um, however, as, um, as well all the aware, the, this year we just have had a really cold winter and um, the, uh, we've just sort of realized that uh, the uh, River Street Camp has is, is just become uncomfortable uh, and it's just been really difficult uh, for the staff and the clients to be there given the weather conditions that we've had. Also, we did have some, some flooding issues there and just with the anticipated uh, winter weather, how cold it is and, and the potential for rain, uh, the thought was that uh, it would make sense to try to provide some relief, uh, some assistance to the current clients there. Um, and that became a priority. Again, just I think it was just really just the, the humane thing to do to really improve conditions uh, and, and to try to do both. Uh, so that was the rationale behind it. Uh, the other part of it too is that uh, uh, to open up another facility was a, a challenge for the Salvation Army with respect to ha having to quickly hire and bring on new staff and this provided for the opportunity to really get it going quickly because then we could just move up the entire staff and it just operationally made it uh, uh, easier to implement too. So those are the two sort of factors that uh, uh, were considered with respect to just again trying to do in general really how could we best improve the situation for the, shel the unsheltered currently in our, in our system as well as to um, improve it to the extent that we could. And uh, with respect to the second question, um, Susan can come up, but I do know that uh, we do make uh, arrangements, that currently is the case, and we make arrangements uh, with individuals that to 
to work out situations for them so that they can uh, work and, and, and do whatever they need to do, because we don't want to discourage that, uh, but uh, Susie maybe can add to that. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Council. Susie O'Hara, Assistant to the City Manager. Thank you, Council Member Brown, for asking that question. So to also um, talk about the intentionality around moving to the Armory, we've conducted two community meetings at the River Street Camp, and by and large, every single one of the campers is actually quite pleased with moving up there. From the staffing perspective, perspective, it's a little bit more challenging because we do have Salvation Army staff that don't have vehicles. So in addition to that, we have a few clients, one that works at the Foster Freeze, for instance, that works until about 3 a.m. So we have assigned a city pool car to be up there for the use of city employees, as well as hopefully Salvation Army employees, but we need to work that through. Um, that can also shuttle folks off, on and off um, for appointments, things that might be outside of the shuttle schedule, we're working through that. Um, we are also considering either a taxi service or an Uber service for thing, things that fall outside of that. So we do have a number of folks that we really are working closely with to ensure that they don't have barriers for using the armory. I think we'll take this first couple weeks to really figure out where we have challenges in terms of um, getting people on and off the facility, but in large part, people are really looking forward to getting indoors. It's cold, we have a lot of pest issues out there, um, rodents of unusual size, I've heard. So we're, we're just hoping to get people out of the elements and into a space where that can be more accommodating. We're going. I was wondering, um, did this go to the cash to get their input on whether the uh, facility was going to be moved? I, I don't believe specifically, um, other than the general subject of increasing capacity. I think you know this has all been moving very, very quickly because we've uh, needed to the. the the directive from council is let's let's increase capacity as soon as possible, and so we've been working really hard, largely with the the National Guard, to uh, really make this happen as quickly as possible. We only have use through March 18th, and so um, that really has been the focus. Although I, I do know that the the staff does keep them aware of what's going on and that sort of thing. Ron, you may have more to add. Yeah, thank you, um, Mayor and City Council. Um, I mentioned this to the uh, catch uh, subcommittee a couple of different times that we were looking at both the VFW and the armory over the last couple of months. But yeah, we didn't really know until just a couple of weeks ago that we were going to get all the conditions approved to, <coughs> to use the armory. So it's been, it has been very fast, like the city manager said. But because this is just a, a, a snapshot in time, 60 days, <coughs> we thought the catch would be better uh, utilized for expertise to look into permanent siting a more a more long term <clears throat> arrangement so this is this is very much of a, a winter shelter band aid and it didn 't seem to fit the model of using catch for developing standards and so forth for the use of the shelter a uh, follow up um, so March eighteenth what will happen then well and I think that is really our major issue moving forward is that we have uh, that we have to come up with an alternative uh, by then. Um, and that's something we've had in place uh, as a result of the River Street property not being available. Um, so we are looking at uh, options there, and, and certainly, again, we can include the cash to the extent that we can as we move forward with those options, but we have to look at a variety of options um, to really continue our shelter capacity past March. I heard that the neighbor, the neighborhood meeting, correct me if I'm wrong, the neighbors were surprised that we were closing 1220, even though they were supportive of opening the armory? Um, I think, uh, yes, in, in a sense that they, uh, obviously, I think like, like mm -hmm. everyone, the hope it had been and the thought was, let's increase capacity to the extent possible. But I think once they understood the rationale, you know, they understood, I mean, that really we're responding to an ongoing changing situation. I think the winter that we've had this year has been unseasonably cold as compared to other years. And so I think in, in other, for example, perhaps last year would have been a different story, but this year, given the conditions and given how cold it was and the opportunity that came up, uh, that seemed to make the most sense. But I think in the end, by the end of the meeting, they were supportive uh, of, of the approach and, and the model. Uh, I'm, I'm not supportive. <laughs> Councilmember Glover, thanks. Um, with the looming March 18th deadline, which is really problematic, one, because it'll be the closure of the River Street, and then in addition to that, the closure of the, 
the armory, um, you had mentioned that that's something that y'all are trying to deal with. Can you kind of expand more on what it is that you're doing to address that and get a head start on identifying potential sites or locations? Um, are you taking into consideration the executive order that was given by the uh, the governor and or what role is the county playing in all of this and being able to identify potential locations in the county that the city can partner with them on to to uh, establish either transitional encampments or some kind of model? Because I mean, if we had, you know, just, it's hindsight's 2020, but if we had been able to move a little bit more intentionally back earlier last year, then I think we may have ha had more stability uh, when we're going into this unseasonably cold winter, as you say, uh, and having people at risk for hypothermia and other kinds of issues. So what, what else is happening to identify additional spots outside of just like acknowledging that it's a crisis? Well, the s siting is, has continuously been the problem and, and the issue uh, and the obstacle moving forward. Um, there hasn't been a lack of, uh, of suggestions that have been provided or options. I mean, there are options. It's just a matter of the entities that have authority or control over the various sites, our willingness and also the willingness to uh, work uh, on uh, considering those, as well as the impacts to the, the work that has to be done in, in the neighborhood to address those issues. So uh, again, we do, have, we do have a list of potential options. Um, what we try to do is to uh, work on the various issues, uh, engage with the neighborhood, uh, and then we'll bring that back to you. Uh, we do have some viable options, uh, but we have to do that work first. Um, and so I'd rather, you know, not put them out there and, 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 and provide conjecture. Um, there's others, you know, there's some that we've looked up, looked at in the past uh, we, that we can continue to have available as, as options. Um, and, uh, and we'll update you as soon as we can on those things. Uh, but it's, you know, it's really, a, the, the challenge is that, you know, every, side has a variety of different challenges that are associated with it. And we have to get past those issues uh, before we can really move forward with, with anything significantly. I think the other part of it too is that, uh, you know, the county does have to play a more critical role and vital role. Uh, we've asked them to, and I think they've agreed to do that. And so our staff is really working diligently with their staff to uh, com come up with those uh, options for you uh, as soon as possible. Um, I don't know if you want to, want to add anything, uh, Ron. To... Yeah, thank you, uh, Martine. Um, yeah, we are working with the county, and actually the catch is planning some public engagement uh, regarding uh, siting and, and what the criteria would be. The, um, and there's a challenge with every site that's been previously identified, but um, we do have some options. Uh, it's we are actually on a full court press to try to decide what's the, of all the sites that we have, have been identified. What's the best one? And what's the, has the most likelihood of of being actually implemented? Uh, but my my suspicion is we're going to go through a few iterations before we get what would be considered con permanent uh, transitional uh, sheltering of some kind. But the catch is working hard on this. The sleeping subcommittee, in particular, has been working on this. So I think that's really where their efforts uh, in the next 60 days, and actually hopefully the next 30 days, will get some traction on a specific site, and then the associated public engagement that goes along with that. And and then just is there conversation or communication with the state in identifying potential partnership of city, county, Caltrans sites? As recently as today. Recently yeah, as today. I'm working with their real estate department. And uh, I've been talking to them for the last few weeks about that, that specifically. And I think uh, the 31st of January is when all those state sites are supposed to be identified. Thank you. So there's Watkins. a procedural question. Given that this isn't on our agenda and is listed as a city manager attorney report, I'm just curious. Yes, I, I, was, I was about to make a comment about that. This is intended as a brief update on city manager activities. And I think it's kind of getting a little a field of that perfectly appropriate topic to discuss as an agendized uh, council item at a future meeting. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to say thank you for your work <clears throat> on um, getting, the, no, at this point in time, we're not gonna open. You're not gonna allow public comment on this item, is that uh, correct? No, this is just, just a Just establishing out. a record that you're not. This was just a report out from the city manager. It's not okay, but I'm <coughs> glad you're making it clear. <coughs>
I'd just like to say thank you for the work you all have done to get the armory open. And as we continue to see this changing landscape um, with the governor being very intentional about trying to figure out ways that communities can have more flexibility around opening up lands and places for sheltering, um, I think that we're gonna see a lot of options that weren't possibilities in the past become options uh, for the future. So thank you for your work on this. Um, moving on to uh, our next item. Um, I'd like to call on the city clerk to provide any updates on the calendar. Um, just one. I think the calendar in your packet has the advisory bodies removed, the interview. So I just want to remind everyone it's now on the 21st. It's back on the 21st, 7 o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, moving on to consent. Uh, the first up is the consent agenda. These are items 6 through 19 on our agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who would wish to pull any items today? I just have a question on 11. Question on 11. But I'm, you know, I won't pull it. Pull um, 16 and 18. 16 and 18. I have a question on 17. Question on 17. Any other items to be pulled? Hearing none. Um, is there any member of the public that would like to speak on any items on our consent with the exception of items 16 and 18 pulled by council members, um, by council member Crow? I request that the council pull item seven for discussion. Seven. Is there anyone who would like to speak on, okay. There's an, is there any interest of, from a council member to pull one of the items suggested by members of the public? Yeah, uh, since it was requested by the public, uh, pull seven and eight. Right. Again, is there any member of the public who would like to address the council on items that, were, that have not been pulled the pulled items have been 7, 8, 16, and 18. If you would like to speak on any item that has not been pulled, you can please um, step up to the podium at this time. <coughs> You'll have up to two minutes. Hi, my name is Hillary Martitius, and I wanted to speak on 15. Is that permissible? Because I... Correct. Okay, cool. Okay, so I'll leave this. This is a reminder of the property that exists there 130 years ago. <laughs> they designed walk, uh, walk circle, wilk circle, arid circle around a very special piece of property, and the purpose was to break ground for a religious building, actually Christian building, but that was 130 years ago, which means there was a real early start on something intentional, right? So I just want to remind everybody that uh, if it were just a church building there for 130 years, which really there was, uh, there was a mighty church there in the 1880s that started everything off. But it did burn down. However, the, the uh, inspiration and everything remained. There was always a church right there. And today we have a beautiful church from the 1930s in the middle of Eretz Circle, okay? And since it's there, we can't, we, no one can go to the west side without running into those circles, which reminds us that that layout was put there for very specific purpose. It is the heart of the west side. It's the heart of the west side. It's the neighborhood where many people that are here, if you raise your hand and show how many people are here for Circle Church Preservation. Anybody want to raise their hand here? Okay, well, we've had more. Thank God there's some people here. But, you know, uh, we don't know what the destiny of this property is. We know it's up in limbo. And I'm here to just stand really strong with the others, and there are many people who aren't here today who really want to see it preserved. And so, as far as I understand, it's being, um, it's, it's being whether it's qualified or meets the criteria for preservation, I don't think there's really a question. However, okay, I, I say, 
I just close it by saying thank you for listening, and uh, I hope that we can preserve the Circle Church. Thank you for your time. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council on, on any of the items with the exceptions of 16, 18, 7, and 8? Seeing none, I'd like to bring it back to council for uh, discussion and, and action. I just have a question on 17. Oh, yeah. So if we could. Sure. Yeah, question questions first. We can revisit yeah. uh, questions on 11 by Councilmember Myers and then followed by council by questions for 17. Did you, did you want to move the rest of the. I just had a comment on item 10. So. Okay. Good. I'm happy okay. to move. Questions I'm happy to move. The questions, questions first. Yeah. I just had a question um, regarding 11 on the second part of the, um, the item um, with regard to directing the city attorney to consult with the California Attorney General regarding his plans um, and then bringing a recommendation to the city council at the first meeting in March. Um, I didn't, didn't, wasn't completely clear whether there is a current suit that the state is pursuing. Um, so is the intent here that um, if the state sues the federal government that the city potentially could join as a, as a, as a city of, of California? That's the intent. Um, okay. And I guess I'm just wondering, is there costs associated with, I mean, is that something you would bring back to us in closed <coughs> session, Tony, if there was a statewide? Um, yeah, first of all, um, what I know about this topic is what I read in the report and the attached article. And, um, and, and so I don't know at this point if the Attorney General's office has made a determination that there is a potentially viable legal challenge here. Um, what I intend to do, assuming the council moves forward with this direction, is to assign one of my uh, attorneys to delve into that and prepare a report for the council. And so what I anticipate coming back with is um, an update with any potential um, uh, actions that the council might take should it be inclined to do so. And assuming that that involved intervening in or participating in litigation, then certainly there would be a cost associated with that. Um, but the council can make that determination um, that. depending on what information we're able to come up with. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Councilmember Brown has a question on item number 17. Great, thank you. Uh, well, first, I'm really pleased to see that the state will make a contribution to uh, support our efforts to um, move in the direction of the mission, the um, Vision Zero mission, excuse me. And I am wondering what the timeline is would will be like on this for in terms of uh, actually preparing a local roadway safety plan. Just would be helpful to know when you anticipate doing that and if we could at that time get a report back on, you know, so we can see the plan and get a little more information about what we're doing there. Certainly, uh, Jim Burr, Public Works. Um, we'll start off uh, per your direction with a subcommittee at the Transportation Public Works Commission and we'll be beginning that process in February. We've already um, requested the allocation of the funds and so um, we will bring a consultant on board for some of the data analysis, but I would expect we'll see early results within six months or so uh, on some of the visioning around that plan. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council Member Watkins. I just had a brief comment on item number 10. I just want to just sort of bring a little bit of awareness and thank my colleagues for co-signing this item, which is essentially declaring the month of January 2020 as um, Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month. And um, just awareness on the issues and the work that's happening in education, resources for potential victims, enforcement, as well as intervention. So just sort of a brief uh, shout out and, and appreciation to the colleagues on that. And I'm, go I'm happy to go ahead and move the consent agenda this time. Second. And we have a um, motion by Councilmember Watkins, seconded by Councilmember Brown to move all the items on consent with the exceptions of 7, 8, 16, and 18. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? That passes unanimously. I'd like to bring back um, item number seven, which is 
um, Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women appointments. Since this was brought for, was asked to be pulled by a member of the public, <laughs> I'd like to open it up for public comment. Um, if you would like to comment on this agenda item, I'd ask you please line up to my left, and you will, and members of the public will be given two minutes on this item. So, if the member of the public who brought this up, would you like to speak on this item? You ready? Two minutes, please. <clears throat> okay, well, the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women didn't meet at its last commission meeting uh, because two of the members resigned. And this happened in the wake of a questionable meeting that involved essentially um, what some of us regard as a smear and inappropriate denunciation of one of the members of this council, to it, Council Member Glover. Uh, seem to be politically motivated. So the reason I'm at raising this issue here is because this is a, a motion to approve Councilmember Watkins' nomination of Delphine Burns. Now Delphine may be fine, I've got no idea about her, but I'm concerned about that there be no further political manipulations of this kind using these commissions to essentially push the political agenda of the reactionary minority on this council, to it Councilmembers Myers, Watkins, and Matthews because a lot of us do not share that agenda. And so I, I would like to uh, perhaps uh, Council Member Watkins to advise us as to whether this her she has conferred with Ms. Burns to make sure that this is not going to happen again. We're not going to have these sort of last minute resignations that happen and uh, or before that, this attempt to use a political commission for abusive political purposes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sir, yeah. I was going to ask if there's any other member of the public who would like to speak to this item. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the, the Council for Action. I'll go ahead and move the item and just briefly, if I could say, uh, it's in the agenda packet in terms of her qualifications. Delphine is, is highly qualified for this work, um, is willing to volunteer her time and contribute on this commission, and I feel comfortable with her as my appointment. So I'll go ahead and move the I'll item. second the motion. All right, uh, we have a motion made by, Mar by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member Myers. Uh, is there any other further uh, discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll move on to uh, consent item number eight, which is the University of California's Long Range Development Plan Advocacy Program. This was also pulled by a member of the public. Um, if you'd like to, any members of the public would like to comment on this item, please line up to my left and you will have up to two minutes. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Eric Rodberg. I'm a um, party to the 2000. I pause you for one second. I don't think the timer. There we go. Thank you. Um, my name is Eric Rodberg. I'm a party to the 2008 CSA, which settled the uh, litigation over the 2005 LRDP. I am supportive of this item, but I think that the, um, the public and maybe even council are not aware of the magnitude of the problem. UCSC housing prices are outrageous. They're not a little bit more expensive than town housing prices. They are crazy, two to three times more. And if you uh, go through my packet, you'll see I documented all that. <clears throat> so just so the public knows, four bedroom apartment on campus, that's not including food, $9,528 a month. The campus housing west proposal is on the last page. I've, um, I've, this is from their demand study, so their projected prices are about the same. You see a, a five bedroom apartment, $10,220 a month. A two bedroom apartment with no kitchen, $5,580 a month. So I would like the scope of work of uh, Ms. Bostic to be revised because there wasn't one word in the scope of work about the price difference between on-campus and off-campus housing. And to me, that's the heart of the problem. And the university has successfully buried that to everyone. So I think that's a really critical issue that when we engage with the university, we don't let them get away with that. Whatever the negotiations are, this has to be front and center. <clears throat> And I have more information in this, and I also have a wealth of knowledge. I've been at this for a long time. Um, another thing I noticed in the uh, scope of work was that the, I fully appreciate engaging all different community groups. It seemed like the community groups listed were heavily skewed to, towards Measure M proponents, who I, I think it's great to engage them. I think Measure M was misdirected, and if their energy had been directed towards the university, it would have been more productive. But 
the community, all sectors of the community are really united. And so I think we need to expand the scope of the, the, the community groups to engage. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, is there any other member of the public who would like to comment on item number eight from consent? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council for action and deliberation. Uh, council member Brown, then council member Matthews. Well, um, so I, I just wanna say that we, I've been on the task force, the city county task force that has been working to establish this contract position and the hiring process. And so the scope of work that we have here is based upon the application of the advocate who, was, who has been hired, the consultant, and she can't be here today to introduce herself. But um, this certainly does not preclude, this was her list that she kind of preliminarily put together and it certainly does not preclude um, reaching out to community groups in the, within the city, in the you know in the area affected in the city, <laughs> on campus, and in the county as well, and also potentially other uh, allies in other parts of California. So the um, the, the scope of work is really kind of the the basis upon which we will develop a work plan. So that's been certainly talked about and when it comes with respect to uh, housing affordability on campus, this is certainly something that we've been talking about internally and um, the person who has, is coming on board is well aware of and so we will be paying attention to that in um, our efforts as well and there will be opportunities to weigh in once the work is happening. From Matthews. Yeah. Um, without repeating all of that, I'm also on the city county group and the, that group as council members know has an advisory group as well that it works with. Um, and the work plan, uh, as council member Brown mentioned, that appears in the agenda report is a starting point, not exclusive. And Mr. Godberg's points are very well taken known for detail work, thank you. Um, and um, they absolutely should be incorporated and I agree that the list of community groups to reach out to uh, is a starting point and not an end point. I'm looking over that, I could think of plenty of others to add. Um, it, uh, one of the key elements to engage in outreach is the students who are impacted by university growth with, without adequate um, facilities. And so um, these comments are very well taken. And um, given all that, I'd like to approve the agenda item um, as it's shown uh, with the intent to incorporate the current and ongoing uh, input from the public. I'll second that. There was a motion made by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Brown to um, pass the recommendations with ongoing um, input from the community. Mm -hmm. um, Councilmember Crone. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Grodberg, for bringing um, this information forward. Um, you and I know what's going on up there and um, it's been going on for a long time. It's sta it's incredible what, what's being charged on campus. I had a, um, someone wrote an email in and I, um, Responded. I wasn't planning on reading this, but I, but I think it's, it could be somewhat informative just to give uh, council a sense of what's what's been happening. I've spent 20, uh, the last 20 plus years helping educate young people at every level. The past 15 I've spent at UCSC, I have, a, I have to level with you and say the atmosphere on campus among staff members, undergrads, and grad students is tense at best and toxic on many days. People are way past angry with the current administration. <coughs> in Oakland mainly, wages and benefits have plummeted. I am taking home less than I was 10 years ago. Raises are a thing of the past. We've had four academic coordinators in my department in two years and three graduate coordinators in the same time. Unless you are fortunate enough to get a home a couple of decades ago, no one can seriously live very well on what the university pays. If we did not, if you did not own a home, I could not, if I did not own a home, I could not afford to continue working at UCSC. Concerning the workload, for example, I run the internship program. I had 60 to 70 interns per quarter back in 2005 when I started. The program now routinely draws 150 to 250 interns per quarter. I have more student workers, but no real staff has been added. Buses are overcrowded as our classrooms. I can honestly say the housing crisis in Santa Cruz is the crisis of doubling the number of students in the past few years. Why can't we stay at 19,500 and say no more? We are doing 
uh, our share given we are the smallest city in the UC system. Let's carve out a special place for UCSC within the UC system. It began as a special case. Why not continue that legacy? Other cities in California would love to have a university. Why not open five more? Thank you, Mayor. Are there any further comments? I'm um, happy to call a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll move on to item number 16, which was pulled by Council Member Crone. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I had a couple questions. Um, we took this up at the Public Safety Committee as well, um, had a lot of uh, nice dialogue, information exchange. Um, I had some other questions. I. Um, contacted the chief, but possibly it was too close to the time of the meeting. Um, I was just wondering uh, about the failure. I don't know if anybody's here to answer a few questions about tasers. I was wondering um, if, if there's a, a standard failure of the taser, you know, the, the, a, a failure rate of, the, of each taser, like how often does it fail? I don't think we've ever, um, I'm sorry, Bernie Escalani, Lieutenant with the Police Department. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Cummings and Council. Um, we have a very low failure rate. I don't know that we've actually collected the data itself, um, but they are very reliable. And um, out of the 16 folks who have been tased uh, this past year in, in Santa Cruz, uh, how many would you say went to the hospital? Everybody that is tased has to get medical clearance before they are uh, transported and booked into the jail. So it's it's in our policy. So it's routine that you would go? Absolutely. And I didn't understand the hands and feet issue. Is that, um, yeah, it, in, it was in one of the things. It says hands and feet. It's just another uh, application of, you know, if we have to use force, it's just grabbing oh. somebody that sort of thing. Okay, got it. Just I, I, another tool. Okay. Um, people in the community, I'm asking this question for folks who I've met with this past week. Uh, they said that tasing is um, a form of militarizing the police. Uh, what, 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 you, how would you respond to that? I'm not even certain that the military has tasers, to be honest. Uh, I know that over 18,000 police agencies across the country uh, use the, the tool. Um, and it's a very effective tool, and it has uh, saved lives, really, uh, and has prevented injury both to civilians and to officers. I read where San Francisco and Detroit uh, don't use tasers. Is that, do, do you know anything about that? I am aware San Francisco does not. I do not know exactly why. Um, since it's a five-year contract, does that mean the tasers only last five years? No, it uh, usually is a way for Axon to rotate out older equipment and supply you with newer equipment, or they have the next generation that comes out. It's kind of a the standard operating for a, a company that's turning over their uh, their supply. So basically, we don't own the tasers. They do still. We're just sort of leasing them? Right. Oh, okay. Um, where do the old tasers go? Do they just go back to Axon? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Are there any other questions at this time by council members? Seeing none, thank you for uh, providing some feedback. I'd like to open up to the public if there's any member of the public who would like to comment on item number 16, which is award contracts for tasers and associated licenses and accessories. You have up to two minutes. Members of the public and uh, council members, I'm with Huff Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom and another group called, though not usually active in the, in the recent days, Stop Police Abuse Now. Um, it, it seems to me it's always natural for the police department to look for new tools to be using, whether it's a, an armored vehicle or uh, military equipment that's surplus or tasers. The issue for us is whether we want that in Santa Cruz, whether we want to spend that in Santa Cruz, how necessary it is, and what kinds of injuries this 
produces. I'm glad the Public Safety Committee looked into this issue, but by the way, the recording of that uh, hearing, you could, you could hear the police department quite well, but you couldn't hear the council members' questions. Really hard to do that. Maybe the staff can look into that. Um, tasers have killed people. It is, in fact, the case. There was an ACLU report in 2005 that noted, I think, 73 deaths in the previous eight years from tasers. And, you know, you can say, well, the, the, the drug overdoses were involved or weak hearts or whatever, but these are sort of secondary. The issue is whether we want, we need to arm the police department with tasers. And in terms of the stats that have been given, there was no actual clarification of the issue that concerns me, which is how frequently are, there used, are these used on a particular population, to wit, poor people, people who are visibly homeless. Because a lot of the recent re regulations passed by prior councils involves criminalizing homeless people in parks and elsewhere. Uh, the city manager, for example, has talked about uh, this very limited armory space. They'll have nothing to do with the vast majority of people who still are in tents all outside around the city and who face constant and frequent police harassment and movement. So. I think this is really an important issue to be considered. I think the data needs to be considered, and I think that that wasn't entirely given, as I'm, Council Member Glover, who chairs the committee, can tell us regarding, for example, most recent use of tasers in October. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public who would like to comment on item number 16? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to Council for Action and Deliberation. Member Matthews. Um, I will uh, go ahead based on the information that's provided us about the uh, departmental policy and record that we go ahead and move the recommendation. I'll second. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember mm -hmm. Watkins to move the um, staff recommendations. Um, before we take our vote, I noticed Councilmember Glover had his hand up, so let's acknowledge it this time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a tough topic the tasers, um, the price tag is really high, and then getting a chance to talk with the police department at this public safety committee, so thank you for being there to talk about it and kind of shed some light on some stuff, uh, that it was basically like leasing a car. You know, you're, you're leasing tasers and they come with a warranty and each taser comes with a certain amount of refills and they're worried about uh, police officers using other tasers and sharing other tasers with other police officers for levels of accountability, which I can totally understand and appreciate. Uh, a little, uh, I do share the concern of the community member that met spoke about the, the frequency of use on people from specific demographics. I know that when I requested that information at the meeting, I don't think that they had the data to provide to show how many people were marked as currently, I think the term that they use is transient, but experiencing homelessness um, while they were uh, being used. Uh, and uh, also that they have tasers that work, they just wanna make sure they have the newest um, materials. I understand and wanna acknowledge that tasers are used as a tool, like you mentioned, um, uh, to avert danger, both for, to police officers and to people that could sustain more critical injuries if other tools besides tasers aren't used. But I'm also uh, looking at uh, the s official stance of the local chapter of the ACLU uh, and the ACLU in general, the AC uh, from a uh, letter, they, their position remains that the, AC the police should not use tasers because they're lethal and often misused and are urging us not to authorize the Santa Cruz Police Department's purchase of new equipment. So, I'm, I mean, I, I would love for us to have a more robust discussion amongst uh, the council in general instead of just going through it because it went to the Public Safety Committee. But what are the thoughts about the, the use statistics? Did y'all that are making this motion right now listen to the Public Safety Committee uh, recording or look at the data that was provided by the police, what are your thoughts on that? What about the potential risk of people that are unhoused? We don't have the data associated with that, or the cost associated with it. So I'd love for us to have like a, a conversation about it instead of just rubber stamping $230,000 for new taser equipment. And I'll just interject before um, allowing for further comment that when we're making comments on items that we should you know, stay, make sure that we're staying focused on the item. That, that being said, I will allow if any of my council members wanna make comments um, 
for the additional comments on the item before taking the vote. I'll just say personally that um, while I do um, share some concerns as well around the use of tasers, I've just based on some of the statistics that were shown with only, the taser's only been used 16 times within the past year. Uh, additionally, as a, as a less lethal form of um, being able to control situations and then the need to ensure that um, when you have equipment that it's up to date and constantly being replaced because what we wouldn't want to see happening is that our police force is using old equipment that then fails during its use and could actually result in causing more harm towards either the person or it's not effective in its use and then we're causing, we're opening up our officers to more harm on themselves. Um, so I think that making sure that we find this balance and in the interim, if there can be further discussions by the uh, Public Safety Committee and members of the public as to considerations for um, even more less lethal or potentially lethal forms of tools for engaging um, with people who might be committing crimes. I think that there's an opportunity for those discussions to continue as well. And I want to recognize Councilmember Crone. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I feel kind of uncomfortable because uh, I'm still not wrapping my brain around why San Francisco and Detroit um, do not use tasers at all. And there has been according to Reuters um, 2017 article that since the since 2000, there's been over a thousand uh, deaths attributed to tasers. Um, a follow-up article said nine in 10 of uh, folks killed by tasers uh, were unarmed. And there's $172 million in lawsuits that resulted from, from those deaths. So there is considerable liability to, to the city. Um, so f for those reasons, I'm, I'm just uncomfortable. Any other comments by council members? Council Member Brown. Yeah, I, I share some of the concerns that have been raised here and um, also by the ACLU. And, you know, I do have concerns. I also understand uh, the position that uh, the SCPD is in and, um, and I appreciated hearing a little bit about the policy around their use. I'm wondering if that is something that perhaps could be uh, reviewed by the Public Safety Committee at uh, a meeting to kind of look at what, you know, what the policy is. Do, do we get some public input about its effectiveness in terms of um, ensuring, you know, health and, and safety of, of individuals involved in those incidents um, and maybe come back to the council with a report on that? I just maybe speaking uh, as the other member of the Public Safety Committee, we, um, we actually received a pretty extensive presentation on this, uh, much of which is in the packet. Um, and also some of the training, the policy and training work that the, the department conducts. Um, I believe we had a unanimous vote as well. Um, and, and certainly these tools, um, uh, you know, have risk. They have risk to um, any individual that they be, may be used for. Um, but I know during our discussion with the um, police department at the Public Safety Committee, um, I felt like we really got a fairly um, detailed um, understanding of, of why the department is asking for this particular action, which is primarily the, uh, the replacement and the, the proper um, timeline to make sure that our equipment is as safe and efficient as possible. And so, um, but I, do, I will comment um, that uh, the department actually uses the top line training and, and, and other uh, uh, best practices in the, in the field for making sure our officers are really, um, really taking into account the situation before these, before these particular um, types of uh, equipment are used on anyone. I guess, and I'll put Councilmember Matthews and Councilmember Brown, um, but I'd also like to say that um, I shared some of these sentiments and to Council Member Crone's point, um, I would maybe make, make a recommendation that the um, Public Safety Committee maybe look deeper into why certain cities have now banned tasers and um, maybe provide some recommendation on policy at a later point in time, sh should we want to explore that. Council Member Matthews and then Council Member Brown. Again, not to repeat all comments, but I, I just want to add that um, the tasers are one of many tools that the departments um, uh, uh, have increasingly uh, explored and utilized. 
um, to find less lethal interventions in <coughs> truly significant threatening situations. And um, we up here know that um, the department has done a lot of training uh, successfully uh, on de-escalation of situation, training with mental health people to, to whenever confronted with a, um, a really extreme threatening uh, uh, situation of harm, either to an officer or to other individuals, they look for the uh, least harmful intervention as I've just mentioned, and this is one. So um, I, I just wanna put it into context. And also the idea that we don't wanna keep going on using outdated equipment. Um, so this, this makes sense to me. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I, I, would, I don't disagree with um, anything that's been said with respect to the training and the um, kind of non-lethal alternatives being preferable. Um, so I'm not disputing any of that. And I'm just, and I understand that there was some data in the report um, at the, that the Public Safety Commission received. I read, I did not listen to the meeting, but I did receive the um, PowerPoint uh, attachment. And so what I'm, all I'm saying is that um, in addition to kind of providing those statistics and, and information that if the Public Safety Committee wanted to do some further discussion and kind of you know, further inquiry into the policies. I don't. I, I don't think that's suggesting that um, the police aren't doing a good job and the policies aren't, um, you know, helpful. But if there are maybe perhaps there are other best practices that haven't been considered. I mean, we can always improve, right? So uh, it's just simply to say, if this is a concern and it's a community concern, that seems like the place to pursue it at a future date. Just a um, clarification, uh, Council uh, Vice Mayor, uh, was that a unanimous decision to approve the contract or send it to the City Council? I, I thought, believe it was. Um, yeah, I we just clarify. It yeah, it was. A, it was. A, we did take action to send it on to Council, but it, yeah. Um, and also, I wanted to make a, a correction. The article I read about Detroit uh, was before 2018. So 2018, um, as a police chief in real time, just let me know that they, they were testing. Uh, tasers. Any further comments? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So that is council members Watkins, Matthews, Brown, uh, my uh, Glover, Vice Mayor Myers, <laughs> voting in favor. That's <laughs> name. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the Vice Mayor oh, Myers. Yeah. yeah. And then um, voting in favor and council member Crone voting against. Yeah, just to make a comment after the vote um, is that I support it because I want to provide the police department with the tools that they need with the current structure that they have right now, but I am all in favor of us reevaluating and identifying ideally uh, as creative of uh, options as possible moving forward through analysis of the Public Safety Committee. So I want to make sure you all have what you need. Thank you for those comments. Moving along, um, the last item that was pulled from consent was item number 18, purchase of two refuse trucks, and that was pulled by Council Member Crone. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I just wanted to get some, uh, a, a clarification on, on and our efforts of pursuing um, electric vehicles, because I know we had quite an extensive conversation during our budget deliberations, and uh, I've been prodded by several members of the public to, uh, ask why we cannot get, uh, seem to get an electric vehicle. And I've had uh, several exchanges with our, our uh, public works director and with Tiffany Wise West, our um, climate coordinator. Uh, I just, a couple things came up like charging stations. Um, we don't have the capacity right now at the courtyard to charge the, the, the batteries uh, in an electric truck. And I'm just wondering what it would take to get us up to speed and be able to get it, purchase an electric truck um, and have it be able to be charged at the courtyard. Hi, I'm Wava Lupa Sanchez with uh, Public Works uh, Resource Recovery Collection. Uh, good afternoon. And I, <clears throat> well, there's several different issues, not just the charging station. Um, we have issues with capacity and the range of how far they can go. So um, there, and there's really nothing available that's in full production. Right now they have 
me a handful of trucks in the major cities and uh, the cost is also an issue. Mac has uh, their prototype um, out in New York and that is a, close to a million dollars uh, for the truck that would cost 350,000. So the cost is real prohib prohibitive as well. Um, but as far as the corporation yard goes, um, that would have to go through our fleet. I mean, that's nothing that I could move forward myself. It's through PG&E and, and NC. They'd have to do significant upgrades for for that. Any further questions, Councilmember Brown? I think it's. I mean, is it, uh, do do we have a sense of when we might be able to um, get? A, um, I uh, spoke to the dealer in Mac at Mac this afternoon or this morning, and and she said that. You know, we can get a demo out, it's gonna be a million dollars. And and then we can figure out how the range goes, but we still don't have any any where to charge it. So and I, I thought it was very interesting. Um, the public works director cited a uh, uh, an electric vehicle that we were gonna get because uh, Palo Alto had it on loan, is what I understand, and they couldn't get it here because it didn't have the capacity to drive it all the way here um, and charge it along the way, I guess. Um, it's kind of interesting, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah, there's no charging station. They do have a portable charging station that's diesel-fueled, so it would kind of be redundant. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Ah. All right, is there any member, well, is there any member of the council that has questions at this time? Seeing none, we'll open up to um, the public for comments on item number 18 which is the purchase of two refuse trucks. Is there any member of the public who would like to come up for two minutes? Sure, I'm uh, Brett Garrett, and uh, whatever we can do to get that charging infrastructure in place, you know, for, track, for trash trucks and for other vehicles um, as soon as possible would be really good. Um, my feeling is that the trash, the electric trash trucks will be available reasonably soon. I, I don't really have specific details, but I, it, it looked to me reading the agenda report that it was very much a business as usual. You know, seven years is the optimum time to replace according to business as usual and therefore let's do it now. But it, it looked to me like there would be a reasonable possibility of holding back and waiting for electric trucks to be available or possibly purchase a used truck instead of a new one. Um, I personally am very uncomfortable with the city of Santa Cruz supporting the diesel truck industry because I, I just feel like, you know, all the benefits of some of the other wonderful things on the agenda, reducing plastics and avoiding fracking, it just feels to me like buying a new redu diesel truck cancels those benefits. So thank you very much. I, yeah. Is there any other member of the public that would like to speak to us about item number 18? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to Council for Action Deliberation. Council Member Matthews. Yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and move the recommendation as presented to us, and I'll just make a couple of comments. Certainly we'd all like to move to electric vehicles of every size and function as soon as possible, but I think uh, given the need of our fleet and maintaining service and reducing service time and, and getting to the point where it's no longer worth it to keep the older trucks, um, it is time to, to get some new trucks. I wanna just compare uh, the experience here to uh, Metro. Um, Council Member Myers and I sit on Metro and there's a state mandate to move to electric buses, but when we got uh, some for, uh, with a grant um, for a trial, they couldn't make it over the hill to Highway 17. I mean, there's a real um, industry <laughs> Um, trajectory of research um, that isn't at a ripe stage yet, let's put it that way. And um, I have absolutely no doubt that as the industry matures and the capacity improves, we will be early on to, to move our fleet in that direction. But um, I think we're not there now and we do have to maintain um, service to our customers on a daily basis. So those are the reasons behind moving the uh, motion before us. Yeah, I'll, second. Yeah. I'll second the motion. and. Uh, just in the, uh, just for time, yeah, I, I, I echo um, Council Members Matthews' comments. Uh, Metro's done a lot of, um, we've been talking about uh, the electrification of the bus fleet for uh, about four or five months now, and so 
we've learned a lot about um, both the exciting uh, potential, but also the limitations right now on the technology and, and the availability of uh, really getting the, the truly the travel distance out of some of these vehicles right now. So I think um, we have to keep up the pressure to uh, continue to get these vehicles uh, working for, for broader than just uh, personal use. So before I take any further comments, so I acknowledge we had a motion mm -hmm. made by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers to accept the staff's recommendation. Um, Council Member Crone. Just wanted to add thank you um, for those comments from both council members. Um, <clears throat> the reason I pulled the um, item is because I wanted to hear what folks were thinking and um, you know get us have us all on the same page. And I do, I, I do hope my sincere hope is that the council is supportive of change the changeover as soon as it's it's mm -hmm. possible technologically. Uh, and we may have to pay a, a, a little bit more for those vehicles but hopefully they, they might last longer. I, I don't know, and I, I know the capacity needs to change too. They can't fit as much uh, recyclables or garbage into each, uh, in, into some of these um, electric vehicles. Are there any further comments? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes unanimously. Oh. Okay. And that ends our consent um, agenda and I'm just gonna ask if we could take a five minute break in case people need to use the facilities. And so we will come back at 2.35 to our consent public hearing items. Welcome back. Um, up next is the consent public hearing. These are items 20 through 24 on our consent public hearing agenda. Are there any city council members who would like to pull items 20 through 24? Councilmember Matthews. Yes, I'd like to pull 21. Are there any other city council members that would like to pull any items from consent public hearing? Seeing none. I'll open up to the public to comment on items 20, 22, and 23 from our consent public hearings. And, 20, any member? and 24. And 24. Oh, sorry, and 24. Is there any member of the public that would like to comment on all consent public hearing items with the exception of item 21? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Uh, council Member Myers. I just wanted to make a comment. And I have a quick comment I like to make. Yeah. Matthews. Um, I just wanted to make a comment um, on 24, which um, I think really, so this is the um, TEFRA hearing for approval of the California Public Finance Authority for issuance of tax exempt bonds for the benefit of the Riverfront Apartments Affordable Housing Project. So that's a long title um, to what I, as I read the staff report to um, an incredibly um, uh, exciting project, which is um, preserving um, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 103 affordable units for uh, for uh, long, long, for, for many decades in the community. And I think this project really speaks to um, both the expertise of our housing staff that we have here at the city of Santa Cruz, that they are facilitating this. Um, and uh, I just think it's incredibly important for our community to understand that uh, we are working to try to protect and preserve affordable housing. It was the number one, uh, one of the highest priorities from the housing blueprint process. Uh, and we are engaging in that every day. So um, we hear a lot of, of frustration around affordable housing in our community, but I think this is an example of an excellent project that um, will preserve uh, a lot of units for uh, families in our community who um, need to be uh, safely housed. Uh, and uh, so I just congratulate the staff and thank you for bringing this forward. Councilmember Matthews. 
Continuing on that one, um, I can remember in the past the struggle to retain these um, Section 8 units uh, with five-year contracts with the owners, and it, was, it kind of got kind of dicey at times, you know, the effort going, and these will now be permanently protected. So it's, it's not something we have to keep renewing. And also, these are really older units that are um, in real need of uh, upgrading and uh, renovation so that they are uh, desirable units um, and really maintained for the future. So it's really sound policy and the city can be the vehicle for this to happen. So it's, it's really, we're playing a wonderful role on this. I also wanted to make a comment on item 22, which is the childcare impact fee. Um, I'm actually a little reluctant on this because of reasons that I mentioned at the first hearing. This is really um, an impact fee, uh, as I understand it, framework without a percentage. And I did ask at the first hearing uh, that um, this not be considered in isolation because we do have a public safety impact fee coming up and then we have a whole lot of other fees. So I would, if, if it's all right, I'd like to ask staff, um, how will this come back? At what point will this come back with a percentage attached to it and in combination with what? So is that you? <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, the Planning Director. And um, we have um, engaged a consultant to evaluate the, um, basically a spinoff of what the county did to make sure that uh, the impact fee uh, nexus study is accurate for um, our um, city boundaries. We are expecting that we have that response. There's a lot of the groundwork that was already done as part of the uh, county uh, work. We're expecting that response this month. Um, we do want to coordinate this to your concern mm -hmm. with the public safety impact fee that is also being proposed so that it is something that the council can consider um, holistically and not in isolation. <laughs> so we're working with our counterparts in the fire department and police department to identify the timing for that. But in the, the coming months, we should be able to um, return to council. We, we had given a longer time frame um, uh, when we initially talked with you. We're hopeful mm -hmm. that it can, can happen faster in part because um, the consultant is gonna get their um, initial work back to us so quickly. Um, so we're hopeful that we will have a shorter time frame. We had, we had talked about sort of um, mid-year, probably right mm -hmm. after the break, I believe, um, when we initially said we would be reporting out and we're optimistic that we can uh, do that ahead of time, assuming we can get um, both police and fire uh, to complete their work <coughs> in the, the same time frame. And then um, because one of the um, housing blueprint recommendations was to examine the uh, totality of the impact of fees on um, the willingness of developers to proceed with their projects. So um, when you bring back child care impact and public safety, will, will there be a context for that? Yes, I think that is an important component, is, is looking at um, not just what's uh, being added, but uh, what's the, the full picture. And there are a few things in flux, um, but they may be worked out by that time. For example, the um, water department is updating their um, water connection fees. And uh, so that, that timing uh, may be completed by the time we're um, done. They're, they're hoping to have it completed by the time, about the same time that we're coming back. So we will have that uh, complete package of um, all the fees that we're charging. And um, I'm, I'm sure you will hear from um, the development community. Um, we, we had initial interest um, from them when we brought it out and we conveyed some of that as part of the report. Um, the last time uh, when this was heard in, in December. Um, you know, the development community isn't happy about fees as you would expect, um, but there weren't members of the development community here opposing it. And I think, um, you know, everyone recognizes the need for childcare and looking at it holistically is going to be important to understand where that fee lands. And I think there will be um, substantial interest when that comes forward of, of pinpointing the exact amount. Okay, thank you. I, I just wanted to bring up, again, context. I don't, I don't doubt the validity of this specific 
geography either, but um, it was seen by the housing blueprint as a legitimate issue to pursue seriously. So uh, with those comments, um, do you need public comment on this or? No, I think there's still a couple of comments okay. by council members. Okay. Actually, um, it wasn't pulled. That was just my comment. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. And then I just had, um, I just wanted to kind of echo sentiments expressed by the vice mayor that I'm really excited that you all were able mm -hmm. to, you know, find and a way to keep some of our affordable housing affordable and also um, the necessary repairs for being able to get these, um, to, to keep them up to standard. And uh, I did have one question regarding the um, item number 24, which was just some concern around, uh, I know that it says that the tenants are gonna, they're gonna be able to do the, the repairs with the tenants in place. And is, can someone speak to that a little bit just so that um, we understand what that might look like? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Mike April from Reliant Group. Um, and we're the ones that are gonna um, do this renovation. We've done this uh, on a number of properties, 4,000 units across California. And what it is is there's a hospitality unit that's set up. And so residents will be able to, are required to move their items from the living, or the, uh, excuse me, the kitchens and bathrooms for a period of like five to seven days. And then they will go to hospitality units for the day from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And uh, that renovation will take place during the day. They will return their unit at night. And the unit will have a working toilet and working faucet every day. They may be without a kitchen for a couple days. We will provide meal stipends for every uh, tenant, so every person within that unit uh, for three meals a day. And we found that that's been very successful. And um, you know, it causes us to be limited to the kitchens and the bathrooms, but it's a great uh, product and um, it gets done in a very short period of time. And that's the way we're able to you know, finish these projects in a timely manner and uh, yeah, limit the disturbance to tenants. Thank you. Council Member Brown and then Council Member Watkins. You just answered my question, so thank you. And I, I just add my, uh, my thanks to everybody who has been involved in making this happen. I think that especially given the kind of unstable potential tenure for this project, that having that and then also knowing that uh, current residents will not be displaced um, is, is really just an amazing, wonderful thing to be hearing. Um, so thank you and, and thanks to our planning staff. Yeah, we're excited about the project. Councilmember Watkins. Sure. I don't think I need to say what has already been said, but I'll just go ahead and reinforce what's been said in regards to the improvements and the opportunity, and especially in terms of some of the um, programming that could be accompanying it in the future and ADA com accommodations mm -hmm. and green. It's it's all around a really great thing. So kudos to the staff and thank you for being here. Um, I just briefly wanted to comment on item number 22. Um, just to really uh, thank the council, thank the community. If we really think about uh, our holistic needs as a community and childcare and the needs of families and having to keep people in our community. If you're sometimes looking for childcare, you'll drive all the way to Capitola then back in for work and it's a huge issue. Facilities is a huge issue for childcare. Um, this puts Santa Cruz as the first city in the county to really prioritize that. So I just want to thank and acknowledge this council and the community for leading um, our, our community on this issue and what could be potentially transformative for um, the future of childcare. And although I know um, it's a balance in terms of the fee structure, in terms of developers, I hope that they also know that they're contributing to the well-being of our, of our community and to the future generation of Santa Cruz. So see it as also a really meaningful contribution. So with that, um, I don't know if you need a motion or if you're gonna take- It hasn't been pulled. It hasn't been pulled. Hasn't been pulled. Okay. No, um, no, but I would, at this point in time, if there's no other comments, I'm, a, I'm looking for a motion to move items um, 20 through 24 with the exception of number 21. Um, I'll move in. Okay, so moved by Councilmember Matthews. Take your pick. Second, second by sure. uh, Councilmember Watkins. And if there's no further comments at this time, all those I've got one further sure. one. Anyone who can remodel a kitchen bath in five to seven days, my hat's off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Okay, so with that, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. And now we will move on to the pulled item, item number 21, which is the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2019-25, amending Title 24, 
Santa Cruz Municipal Code, the Zoning Ordinance Part 1 of Chapter 24.16, inclusion, inclusionary housing requirements, including sections 24.16.010 through 24.16.060. So I would like to invite up, um, our Economic Development Director, Bonnie Lipscomb, for a presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, members of the council. So I'm, I'm here today, uh, even though it's the second reading of the inclusionary ordinance amendment, um, because we had some discussion between the first reading um, for uh, some potential consideration of some additional language um, to provide some flexibility, uh, specifically around um, allowing 5% of the overall project to count towards the inclusionary requirement for Section 8 vouchers. And so, specifically, we talked about mirroring some language that the City of Watsonville has in their inclusionary ordinance around um, Section 8 vouchers. And so, I uh, provided that um, with the mayor um, today and um, available to answer any specific questions. I also have a few slides that ha have it so we can pull it up on the screen. So I guess just as a starting point, I'll go ahead and put it there and then happy to answer any questions that you have. Be great. So the, the language before you, um, where this would relate in your packet for the ordinance would be in the ordinance in your packet, it would be under number five and it would be a new D. And so this would apply to rental projects only. So ownership projects um, would uh, continue with a 20% at 80% of AMI and the rental projects would have the opportunity for 5% of their overall inclusionary requirement, um, I, you know, which is 25% of, of their 20, sorry, it gets a little confusing um, when you're looking at that, to be similar to Watsonville's, which would qualify for Section 8 tenants. Any questions from council members? I just, I just want to make sure I understand because I always have to do math to do these things. <laughs> so the proposal really would be, so for example, say you were going to do, ah, there you go, okay. Yeah, so I have just an example and then I can back up, sorry. Okay, I'm um, right. So for example, for again, we're only talking about rental projects um, because this is Section 8 vouchers, which are for rental units. So for a 20% inclusionary requirement, that would be eight units total to meet the 20%. So 15% um, would be low, which is 80% of AMI, which would be six units, and an, an additional 5% to make that total of 20% um, could be made available to Section 8 um, Section 8 tenants holding Section 8 vouchers. And those would be verified and issued through the um, County Housing Authority of Santa Cruz County. And so that would be two units to get to the total eight units or 20%. Do you, and just for clarification for the public, could you, do you know the, the salary range of the 80% area median income? Well, for a family of four, uh, for median, it is 98 thousand for a hundred percent. So you would just take, you know, 80%. So roughly 78, 80, 80,000. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's helpful. And to just to look at that a different way, and this is similar to how Watsonville has it um, in their ordinance, just so you can see it visually as the percentages. Sometimes that's easier than reading the language. Um, you could see that for the ownership, it would just stay 20% low, which is 80% of AMI. Um, but for on the rental side, on the right-hand side of the screen, it would be 15% low, 80% of AMI, and an additional 5% um, that would accept Section 8 vouchers for the total of 20%. Um, I have just have a quick question. I know that when we had the first reading, you expressed um, concern with moving in the direction of 20% and sort of uh, clear on the why, unsure uh, without further data and information on the how. And um, what I'm seeing here today, just to make sure I have clarity, is that this is so somewhat of a, a how fix to get to the 20% for rental projects. but. Um, absent more data or another independent analysis, do you feel that covers the um, 
the need to meet, the, to kind of reach that 20% that you expressed concern about when originally proposed? I think this does address it. The reason why it does is by explicitly calling out this language for Section 8, it provides some certainty that this is an option. And by mirroring the language in Watsonville, um, and just to go back there so you can see it, all the, all the language that's underlined in this in the lower part of, of what's on the screen is exactly the language that's in Watsonville's. And so what this does is it provides some certainty for a developer to know that they can advertise for 30 days for um, an eligible Section 8 tenant. If there's one holding a voucher out there, the unit is theirs. However, there are some times where they are not available. And this provides some certainty for the developer to know that in this situation, I can still then rent the unit. Um, so that provides that flexibility. That's what's in Watsonville's. We did sit down with Jenny Panetta, um, the head of the housing authority, and she was pretty excited to have ex you know, very explicit language around this that also included, as it does here, that it would be made available to the County of Santa Cruz Housing Authority so that they would also be able to mark it out to their list of all their Section 8 tenants. So um, this is something that I think gets at still meeting the 20% um, but providing some flexibility and some certainty for developers that they wouldn't otherwise have. You know, part of the uh, being able to go forward with a 20% is being able to finance it. And if you don't have explicit language in there that shows, you know, particularly on that 5%, that you're guaranteed to either have a voucher holder or then be able to market for, to the general public after a certain time period, that gives you that, that certainty that you can go and get a higher mortgage to be able to finance your project. If you have don't have specific language and you have that 20 percent, and um, you could have you could accept Section 8 tenants, but you don't have guarantee of getting that, and so you would be required without explicit language to do the 20 percent at 80 percent of AMI. I have just a follow-up question. Then, in regards to the development that's not for rentals, what is your position on that at this time? We haven't analyzed that yet, so. Um, in general, the, the, the rental market is, uh, you know, generally harder to finance. It's not always the case, but it is, you know, it is, it is pretty hard right now. Um, we would really like to look a little longer at that. We haven't done any analysis on the ownership. Um, that's part of, of what we would like to, the work we'd like to do with the Planning Commission and also with the, the Council Housing Committee. Council Member Brown and then Vice Mayor Matthew, or Myers, sorry. <laughs> Um, so I have a, a quick question. At our first reading, the additional direction was to send uh, a direction to the Planning Commission to consider um, ways to um, help implement the 20% and make, make it um, viable. And, and so I, and I understand there are kind of a range of possibilities for incentives and other, other ways of, of doing that. So I'm just wondering where that's at um, with it, where the Planning Commission is getting to work on that. Um, yeah. And the timeline. And the timeline, yeah. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, the Planning Director. And um, we jumped right on that. Um, you met on uh, December uh, 10th. 10th. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, later that week, we released a report to the Planning Commission for their meeting on the 19th. And um, at that time, we recommended one, that they form an ad hoc subcommittee to look at, among various other things, um, like the enhanced density bonus and um, uh, encouraging a variety of housing types. Um, with uh, uh, Those were sort of the subset, inclusionary housing being the first and foremost priority. Um, so we have a ad hoc committee of the Planning Commission set up. Um, uh, following uh, the discussion today, we would uh, anticipate reaching out to the uh, Planning Commission uh, subcommittee members to get the ball rolling on that. Um, that is their first priority. With it being an ad hoc subcommittee, they've got six months and a lot of things on their plate, but we certainly don't want this topic to take six months. We wanna get recommendations back sooner rather than later so that we can get them back in front of the council as soon as possible. I just had a question. I just want to make sure that we're developing policy that will be effective. So um, I know that uh, typically we have less availability of Section 8 housing 
than the demand. Is that correct? Is that is that our current still sort of state of affairs, both within the city and the county? Okay, thank you. Um, Council Member Matthews. And then I was curious how the Planning Commission subcommittee would um, relate in terms of uh, work program and time with, I think you have proposed a task force. How do those things mesh? I don't know if that's a question to you or to Lee or both of you. <laughs> I'll take a sure. first go at this question. Um, the last week um, I was able to meet with Bonnie Lipscomb from Economic Development, mm -hmm. Lee Butler, and also Laura Schmidt, and we um, discussed the makeup of the uh, subcommittee and um, the hope is that we will meet in the beginning of February to begin outlining some of the scope of work that we'll be doing over the course of the next few months as it relates to the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee and what's been accomplished, um, areas to prioritize that, um, that are areas of potential to address affordable housing needs. And then um, this is a consideration of how we can work, this uh, committee can work with the uh, Planning Commission subcommittee as it relates to the recommendations that they're bringing back to um, this 20% inclusionary ordinance. So a council subcommittee and a Planning Commission subcommittee. The only I just put in a plea for some degree of efficiency. <laughs> sure, and um, uh, not necessarily along those lines. <laughs> I would say that uh, to the council, to the Planning Commission's credit, Every single member who was present volunteered and expressed mm -hmm. interest mm -hmm. in being on that committee. So we have a, a very engaged and wonderful planning commission who really wants to help this uh, this effort and um, help promote the housing development that we have here in the city. And um, so one of the discussion topics, because so many people were, so many of the commissioners were interested, we talked about bringing discussions back to the planning commission so that those who aren't able to participate in the subcommittee mm -hmm are able to provide their comments as part of the, the full commission discussions. And so, again, it was just preliminary conversations that we had with the mayor and uh, the economic development director, Bonnie Lipscomb, and our assistant city manager, interim assistant city manager, Laura Schmidt. And uh, we talked about bringing those recommendations to the council subcommittee so that they've got um, that information and then that could then, uh, the, the recommendations from the council subcommittee could then be brought to the full council. So very preliminary conversations, but that's how we anticipate it uh, moving forward. Just to comment on that, I, I agree that um, trying to make sure that this is an efficient process is something that I think um, I myself am also mm -hmm. uh, very in favor of as well, mm -hmm. so. And if I can just finish up, uh, I know you want a public comment, but um, um, I did pull this and at the appropriate time, I would like to um, uh, make a motion incorporating this language um, to give that flexibility and certainty and um, uh, increase the availability sure. of Section 8 houses. So okay. just. Okay. Um, if there's no further comments from council members at this point in time, I'd like to open it up to public comment on item number 21 from our um, consent public hearings. Okay. And you'll have up to two minutes. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Andy Schiffer, and I'm a member of the Planning Commission. Um, I want to urge you to not approve the staff proposed changes at this time, but to approve the second reading of the ordinance. Um, a couple of uh, informational inf uh, items. Uh, the Watsonville ordinance is fundamentally different than the Santa Cruz ordinance because it doesn't only require the 5% uh, Section 8, it requires 5% at median income and 5% at low income, as well as 5% at very low income and 5% at Section 8. The, the current um, city ordinance, inclusionary ordinance, provides all the flexibility you need. I wanted to just read what it's the relevant section so that you can see that there's no need for this additional language. The ordinance already allows all inclusionary units to be Section 8 units if that's what the owner of the project wants. 
this section of, uh, is says rental residential developments that would create five or more new additional dwelling units or live work units at one loca location shall provide, and it's hopefully gonna be 20% of the dwelling units as inclusionary units, which shall be made available to low income households at an affordable rent. And low income is defined as 80, as income, household income that does not exceed 80% of the median income. So any household that has an income below 80% is eligible to have, uh, to, um, it's eligible for an, one of those inclusionary units. So that would include Section 8 tenants. Uh, Section 8 is available to low income units. The benefit of for developers of having a Section 8 tenant is that they get market rents from, market fair market rents from the housing authority. Um, so I'll finish there by just saying there are, there are a lot of vouchers that are out there that are looking for places to rent. I'll invite the next member of the public up to speak. You'll have up to two minutes. Good afternoon, my name is Gail Jack, and I'd like to, um, this is off the cuff, I'm always unprepared, sorry. But um, I'm concerned, and as I have been for a while, that we're totally missing the population in this community that most needs our help. If our family of four, Median average medium income is 89, I think she said, 89,000. Then 80% of that is approximately 72,000. If you have a single parent with three children, I've calculated that that's an hourly rate of $34 an hour for that one parent supporting three children. So what's happening in our community is monthly our AMI goes up as wealthier people move here. So I am i don't know the answer to this problem. I'd like us to address the very low income and even you know, 60% of AMI for a single parent or a single worker is kind of a stretch. Unless you want, you know, maybe we'll send our kids out to work. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm serious about this. I'd, I'd like the council to address the people most in need of our help, and that's the very low income people. We're not building any housing for them. Thank you very much. Okay. Next speaker. <laughs> I am Rafa Sonnenfeld. I'd also like to uh, uh, support what the previous speaker said about the very low income uh, challenges in our community. Um, I feel like uh, assuming you guys uh, pass this ordinance today, um, you should move very quickly on addressing um, how to uh, increase incentives for the very low income um, development uh, without uh, making any changes to the density bonus as it is. Uh, there's actually a disincentive for developers to be uh, building any very low income um, because they can reach the same density bonus doing the 20% of low income as they could for currently doing 11% of very low income. So they could just switch all of their development to low income increase their, their profit margins, meet the, the, the inclusionary requirement, and then we're missing out on the very low income um, uh, extra developments that we could have had otherwise. So we need to find some way to incentivize very low income, and um, you have lots of tools that you could do that, including, including the enhanced density bonus. Um, I won't speak to the other ones, but I just wanted to, to reiterate that that uh, the longer we wait to figure that stuff out, the the more likelihood there might be projects coming in that that uh, if they do meet the the twenty percent inclusionary, that they they won't have any very low income development or any any very low income units at all because um, it's it wouldn't be required of them. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm here to speak in favor of the 20% inclusionary requirement. It'd be very helpful for our community to have less market rate units built and more affordable units built. I'm basing this on research I've done tracking the number of units available 
daily on Craigslist. Those are rentals. Over the last year, there's regularly 593 available units for rent per day. That's taking in consideration Aptos, SoCal, and the surrounding areas, but 354 average for Santa Cruz rentals. Most of those are market rate. Again and again, I see the same ones up there. They're not being rented at market rate. We need more units, which are for two combined incomes of under 80,000, as well as what the speaker spoke before me, to take care of our teachers and service workers to sustain our largest industry, which is tourism. 20% inclusionary will help with this. We do not need more market rate units, but it's the only way developers might want to build unless we have public funds like Monterey and Salinas has done. The governor's just allocated $1 billion yesterday towards homeless housing. So let's find out about public money for low income. Thank you. And no other members of the public who would like to comment on this time. I'd like to bring it back to the Council for Action and Deliberation. There's a motion made by Councilmember Matthews to approve the proposed additional inclusionary language for the new rental developments. Is there a second? I'll second that. Seconded by um, Vice Mayor Myers. And I'll open it up to comment, starting with Councilmember Glover, followed by Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember Crone. Thank you. Um, so I'm a big fan of affordable housing, something that I think we should be prioritizing in any way possible. Also section eight, because of the dismally long wait time that people are having to experience, especially those that are currently living on the street, uh, to get into a section eight unit. Uh, I'm curious from the comments that Commissioner um, Schifrin uh, made, thank you, um, with regards to the differences between Watsonville's and Santa Cruz's and how the current language of the ordinance already includes the option for us to be prioritizing or specifically allocating units to be section eight. So what's the benefit of this additional language? And if we approve this today, then wouldn't it take it back to a first reading and then make mm -hmm. it so we'd have to come back for a second reading. So I just wanna make sure that uh, there's a really clear understanding as to why <laughs> this language is necessary as opposed to just adopting the 20% uh, as it is currently and then coming back later if we decide to and maybe amending the ordinance later on, but at least at this time being able to move forward with a 20% uh, affordable housing requirement. Um, yes, Councilmember Glover, it would um, make this a, f a first reading. Right. So it would then have to come back for a second reading. I, th I think the reason this is coming forward today is there's some concern that by changing it to 20% with the 80% um, of AMI, which is more restrictive than any of our sort of comparison um, cities, and I actually have a chart to, to show that if you want to, to actually look at um, some of the other cities. So specifically Watsonville, um, does have flexibility, and I have that broken down here. Um, and uh, Commissioner Schif Schifrin is correct in that they do have variability in theirs. They have 5% median, which is at 100% AMI, which is higher than ours. They have 5% at 80%, which is the same as our 15%, and then they have 5% very low. Um, and then they have the 5% section eight, and that's the language that we were mirroring in its entirety for ours. So when you look at and compare their 20%, which is also just on rental, and another thing to note is theirs is on projects that are seven units or more, whereas ours is on five units or more. And you know, from some of our previous discussions, the lower number of units, the harder it is to, to get, secure that financing. So our 80% at 15% at 80% of AMI is more restrictive than Watsonville's. The reason why including that language and that explicit language is that provides some certainty for the developers that they can actually take and get financing because they're guaranteed an either or. If we don't right now, we're, we're silent on Section 8. And so they can't use that to be able to secure financing because they'll have to do, they'll have to, uh, the financiers will look at what is the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is that there's not going to be an available Section 8 tenant. Therefore, you have to provide those units at 80% of AMI. Right, um, so thank you for that. I think what I'm getting at is knowing that we have such a vast list of people waiting for Section 8, almost guaranteeing that we'll be able to find Section 8 uh, 
tenants to fill Section 8 units and having the ordinance, uh, according to what we just heard from Commissioner Schifrin, uh, allowing us the flexibility to work with developers to ensure or to incorporate in their plan that there are going to be Section 8 units, then what precludes, with the current language, developers saying, okay, we're gonna develop this many units and we're gonna have this many Section 8 and not be able to go and get funding by making the commitment to having those Section 8 units outside of it being written in an ordinance. It's just not a guarantee. And so having that explicit language, if if there is the you know situation where there are ample Section 8 vouchers available, it will absolutely secure those units as Section 8 units, which is great for the community. Um, if for some reason they aren't, they advertise for 30 days, the way our ordinance is written now is if there is not a Section 8 tenant available during that time frame, the developer would then have to um, delay longer and secure um, as a non-Section 8 tenant for that space. You can't take that in advance and get financing for the project in advance of that uncertainty. So by having and including that explicit language, that actually addresses that need, and that's not in our ordinance now. Thank you. Okay, Council Members Brown. Uh, yes, I um, I think I understand the the rationale, and I'm not um, unsympathetic to the concern. I also am very very interested in finding ways to incentivize uh, landlords, uh, property owners to rent to Section Eight tenants, and so I um, you know I want to make that very clear. Um, I, from what I understand, uh, developers can can rent all, up to all their 20% of in, their inclusionary units to Section 8 tenants. Um, and I understand that there's no guarantee for, that they're gonna get the market rate um, rents, right? I mean, I, that's really what it's about, is making sure that, that developers or property owners get that uh, market rate rent for the additional 5% that we're considering. Um, and I'm sympathetic to that as well. However, I, I think that um, given that developers were telling us they couldn't do 15%, um, they couldn't get financing for 15% and we needed to reduce our affordable housing uh, or inclusionary rate, um, it's hard to say, well, you know, what, what's the cutoff? I mean, they're gonna tell us they can't do what, <laughs> whatever, and they're gonna tell us they can only do whatever our uh, rule is, and so I think it's very important that we uh, today uh, adopt this ordinance on a second reading and that we um, we send the uh, inclusionary language that Watsonville has, including the additional language with the, the other baselines um, to the Planning Commission subcommittee. So I'm gonna make a substitute motion that we do that, that we um, adopt ordinance number 2019-25 uh, implementing an increase of the inclusionary percentage citywide for all housing developments, both rental and ownership, to 20%, and that we refer consideration of the amendments uh, uh, that to address Section 8 related issues, uh, including the Watsonville uh, ordinance language, to the Planning Commission uh, subcommittee uh, to be considered with the uh, other. Um, uh, alternative, all, the other recommendations that will come back to us. Second. Before we move on, I just wanna check to see if the city clerk was able, able to capture that motion. Okay, so that, since that's a substitute motion, my understanding is we need to vote on that, vote to accept the substitute motion and then we can continue on with, with discussion. So, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? No. no. Okay, so that passes with Council members Glover, Crone, Brown, and Mayor Cummings voting in favor. Council members um, Watkins, Matthews, and Vice Mayor Myers voting against. Okay. And so to bring it back for discussion, uh, I had Council Member Crone, then uh, Council Member Watkins. Is there any other Council Member? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm trying, Bonnie, I'm trying to wrap my mind around the idea of, so somebody puts up 100 units and 20 of them are affordable. 200 people or 100 people apply for those 20 affordable units. So their incomes can be anywhere from 30 to 80% or we're only gonna accept folks with 80% of the AMI. 
No, I was, I, what I was speaking earlier was specific to Section 8 vouchers on the holders. If we're talking about the 80% of AMI for our, our inclusionary ordinance, it's that a developer will be holding the rents to 80%. So we're talking about, just to clarify, two different two different areas. So I, I'm, yeah, I still don't understand. Uh, we'll be holding the rents to 80%, but there is not the flexibility. I, I was interpreting what um, Commissioner Schifrin was saying that we could choose any any folks, for, you know, income levels uh, that are deemed affordable by housing and urban development in Washington. Um, I think he was referring to Section 8 tenants, which could be a variety of income levels that qualify, and that's and that's true. And from what I heard the last time they and they closed the list, as far as I know, maybe someone knows differently. There was over 10,000 people on the Section 8 uh, list looking for vouchers, or you know wanting a Section 8 voucher. Um, why, do, why do we have it at, okay. If I could maybe just make one comment to a couple of the early, earlier comments. By not having this explicit language, we have the most restrictive ordinance, not only in the county, but probably in the larger Bay Area. And by mirroring at least Watsonville's language, it levels the playing field a little bit more for developers that may consider building affordable housing in our community. I think our concern is by having a restrictive ordinance, as restrictive as we do, is that we're discouraging housing and affordable housing to be built. So I think by mirroring at least Watsonville's language for now, we are at an interim period understanding that we have our planning commission that's gonna be looking really closely at this at a much more deeper dive and our and our council committee looking at this as well. What we're trying to do now is because we're we're all trying to move quickly is make sure we're uh, you know, not causing any unforeseen circumstances by putting the most restrictive ordinance out in the community. We don't wanna prohibit affordable housing being built. By mirroring Watsonville's section eight language, which has been in place for over 10 years, we know we're not going to do harm with it. We're not turning away section eight tenants. We're providing a mechanism to be able to not inhibit affordable housing to be built in our community. We're just trying not to make a mistake in the interim while we give the Planning Commission and the City Council Committees time to really look at this more closely. How, how is it that um, we got 15% 80, at 80% 80 of the median and I, I think, do I hear you suggesting that we should, when we mirror Watsonville, we should go to 5% low and 5% very low? That's not what we're proposing today, but it's something that I think the Planning Commission, looking at the inclusionary, may want to look at is taking, you know, breaking that down, similar to Watsonville or some other cities that have, you know, to get at that sort of lower income, provide the opportunity for 5% to go at very low income, you know, maybe have a 5% that's, uh, you know, at median or to looking at some of that variety. Ours right now doesn't have that. And how did we arrive at 80% and not like 15% very low? Um, how did we, I just wanna make sure I understand, how to, instead of 15%, what did you say? No, why did we arrive at 80% of the median income rather than 50 to 80%? Um, just because it, it's, if you're going at something that deeply affordable, the delta that's currently in our ordinance for being able to provide that is just financially unviable for for developers to build. The, I don't know any ordinances that are out there that are 15% at 50%. I mean, we would need to have a public subsidy, which I would love it if we had, um, to make up that delta. I Typically, you do see for a lot of cities, um, they build, and they, if they have affordable housing trust funds, that they have uh, affordable housing funding sources, that's really where you build some of those sizable projects with those really deep subsidies. So the very low or even extremely low projects. So for example, Water Street, um, Lindbergh Street, the Riverwalk, um, Riverfront Apartments, and the Tannery, and hopefully the upcoming Metro project downtown will have those very low and extremely low units, and we'll be providing public funding to make those financially feasible. Thank you, Mayor. If I could add a couple of things. Um, I was just conferring with um, our housing staff and I just wanted to be clear that because um, some Section 8 tenants um, qualify for assistance up to 120% of AMI, 
that um, those individuals who have Section 8 and are between 80% AMI and 120% AMI would not income qualify for the affordable unit. So even though they have a uh, Section 8 voucher, they would not be able to move into one of the affordable units. So I wanted to um, uh, just make sure that the council was clear because I, I wasn't entirely clear and just wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page. Um, and then um, I also wanted to uh, to speak to Councilmember Crone's uh, discussion about uh, the 50% um, AMI and, and getting units at that level. Um, one of the speakers, Rafa astutely pointed out that um, the interplay between the city's inclusionary ordinance and the state density bonus is um, an important one. And um, it's a policy decision for the council um, at the level proposed, the 20% um, at 80% AMI, that will qualify every project that comes through um, and is, that's meeting those requirements for the 35% state density bonus. So what we've seen right now is many projects coming through at 15%, um, the 15% uh, uh, low, uh, which is 80% AMI. What they do to get that 35% density bonus is they provide 11% at very low and then the additional 4% to get them to 80%, uh, excuse me, the additional 4% to get them to 15%. Those are provided at 80% um, at AMI. So, so what? It's a policy decision, and so if if the the most important thing is the very low income units, um, it, and you're anticipating that developers are going to capitalize on the state density bonus, the the 15% with. Uh, has in the past been used by developers to do the very low at 11% and then 4% at low. Um, but that is, that's just a, a policy decision. So I, it, it speaks to your comment about trying to get to the very low income and it's certainly something that we'll want to consider when we're talking about it with the um, Planning Commission subcommittee when we're getting down into those details. But I wanna make sure the council understood that as well because it, it was a, a good comment that the member of the public pointed out. Thank you. Um, council Member Watkins. I just have a quick um, question and then I have just a few comments. In regards to the first reading of this ordinance, we had folks from Santa Cruz City Schools come and speak to us about their concerns with the ordinance and we talked about potential solutions. Just really wanting to have a quick touch back with you all that that's being worked out and those discussions are happening so we're not inhibiting them from their work. Housing. Yes, they have not submitted an application yet to the city, but we have sat down with them since the last council meeting and talked about various ways of exploring of, of, that we could work with them. One of the things that, and we also subsequently met with the Housing Authority about, is the possibility for their project of including project-based vouchers, um, a little different than what we're talking about today with the tenant-based vouchers, but for that project, since they're looking at providing 100% workforce or potentially providing for, with a preference, and whether or not that would work for them for a Santa Cruz City School employee to meet our existing ordinance of 20% um, inclusionary if that we were able to secure project-based vouchers for them. So we're, we're look, working through that possibility. The um, other avenue, um, because they're a public facility, a school facility, um, that they were requesting was an exemption. Our preference would be to find a way to enable them to meet our ordinance um, with, I'm just worried about precedent without being able to, um, to to think about what other entities that could that could impact versus being able to find a way to work with them to meet the ordinance. I share that interest and hopeful that we can start to move in the direction of getting more workforce housing projects going forward. So I understand the concern of uh, the exemption approach as opposed to having a policy that helps facilitate that. Um, I guess just a, a few comments in regards to the uh, proposal before us today. I think um, given that we've moved in the direction of adopting it as the second reading, I would just briefly say I appreciate the interest in trying to have some fix around the 5% for um, some of the Section 8, uh, but I know that that's uh, off the table in terms of the discussion at this time. I guess um, my comments would be that I certainly agree with the folks who are 
championing moving in the direction of the 20%. I think everybody here on the dais agrees that we wanna see more affordable housing in our community. It's obviously a time of crisis in our community um, and we wanna get to that place. I guess where I struggle with this policy particularly is that um, it feels uncertain on the how. And we can all agree on the why, but without more certainty on the how, it feels like an uninformed policy that could potentially have uh, negative impacts. And at this time when we're experiencing um, so many uh, folks leaving our community because of the lack of affordability, I don't think we want to unintentionally contribute to um, more uh, lack of affordability. So for me, um, given that uh, without further data, and for me as an individual wanting to make an informed policy decision, I just can't support um, moving in the direction of having this second reading go forward at this time. Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I think part of the calculus that we sometimes mi miss in being so focused on trying to get to sort of a, I would consider somewhat of a politically policy, po political policy outcome is that um, you know, 10 years ago, the state took away our ability as a local community to build housing. And um, we, especially at this point in time, are greatly missing the opportunity to use redevelopment funds to do exactly what they were used for, for um, a really good run in this community, and they created some wonderful housing for people. And so we're so focused on sort of achieving um, this number, but we are not looking at the backdoor problem of who's going to build that housing. And I will tell you a story about a young couple that I that um, uh, reached out to me recently. They had taken a gamble and bought a, a piece of property, um, actually in Lower Pacific uh, area. They wanted to build 10 to 12 units of housing. They wanted to build a small market that would be walkable to the community because there's no actually there's no food market in that area. Um, and they contacted me recently and said, we just can't do this. You know, so we, you know, these are the kinds of developments that we want to be encouraging. Our, our community is not very favorable of density. It's not favorable of height. This would have been an, an infill type of um, project. They were going to try to, to meet our affordability requirements. Um, so they stopped work on it. They had spent almost $250,000 of their money trying to figure out how to make this work. And this policy kind of put the nail in the coffin. So I think that um, what we aren't really recognizing is that there are people who are taking real risk. And um, that risk is reflected in the ability to actually finance their project. And if you're taking risk and you're not able to finance your project, you're just not going to build a project. And so... Um, I'm not going to be able to support um, the second reading and, the, and achieving this, even though I believe very strongly that we need to be focusing on building um, very low and low income housing as well as uh, workforce housing. We really need a um, what I would call a uh, balanced ecosystem of housing in our community. And um, but right now, the way we're approaching this is we are um, we are setting the risk level by this policy approach. And uh, I think people are gonna stop, stop investing in our community. I really believe that. It's gonna be easier for them and more predictable for, for people who do this work to go to other communities right now and spend their dollars doing that. And they'll just let their pieces that they own here sit. We're not gonna get new housing and we won't get the, the type of housing we're trying to get because um, the people who build housing they have multiple sites in multiple communities and that's where they're gonna spend their dollars right now. So I'm sorry I won't, I won't be able to support the, uh, the effort, but um, I, I understand the intent. It's just not meant to, um, uh, it's just this is my feeling on where we're at right now in this policy. Thank you. I'd just like to add before acknowledging the other members of the council that um, while I'm a bit reluctant and hesitant to support uh, the second reading today, um, one of the things, because I definitely am also concerned with our ability to get these units built, um, I am pretty hopeful that the subcommittee of the Planning Commission and the City Council will be able to work over the course of the next few months to hopefully less than a year 
on really trying to figure out ways to implement this 20%. And one reason why is because there's a lot of talk around different properties being developed within our community. And if we have these low levels of affordability within those projects, if those projects go through, then that those units are going to be the, you know what those units are. We're not going to be able to go back and you know change the affordability of those units. And it sounds like there's a lot of potential motion at the level of the state to provide funding towards housing as it relates to homelessness. Um, and that we're in a time where there might be a lot of potential to see funds coming down from higher levels of government that could help us subsidize some of these units. And so if we were, eight, were to build on these sites now, um, and it turns out a year from now there's you know additional funds, or we're able to come up with innovative ways to make this happen, if, if those units are built, there's no way we can go back. And so at this point in time, I'm, I'm you know hesitant, but I'm gonna go forward with this um, second reading. However, with the caveat that um, I think it's really important that the Planning Commission and City Council members and folks from the community we, that we really try to work together to figure out how we're going to make this work and should it seem like you know, we may not be able to make it work or we identify the difficulties that we can adjust the ordinance to make sure that we're able to um, get housing built, especially affordable housing. And with that, I'll pass it over to Council Member Brown and then Council Member Glover. And I'd just like to point out that We've gone um, a bit over time in terms of uh, our general consent public hearing, so I'd like to ask the council members that we um, um, try to move the meeting along after these comments. I'll be brief, thank you. Uh, so I, I just wanted to, uh, in response to the uh, suggestion, council member Watkins, that you made, I wholeheartedly agree that the how is really a huge question. And, and I, I, I want to be clear about that. I think that that's, some, that's part of the reason why we really wanted the Planning Commission to take a look at this and spend some time um, trying to bring back to us recommendations about how to make it work. Um, I will say that I really feel that it's important to provide some additional incentive to developers to help us figure out that how, because without um, the requirement, they have no incentive, they have no reason to come to us and say, hey, we'd like to kind of figure out a way to make this work, um, here's some ideas. And so having a requirement like this will probably cause them, I mean, I'm hoping it causes them to, to think about how to make it work because um, housing development is costly and it is risky, but it's also has the potential to be highly lucrative in one of the most expensive uh, land markets in the country, if not the world. Um, and one of the least affordable places to live. Um, so I feel that um, that's, I, I believe, a risk worth taking and, and seeing if we can actually find some ways to uh, increase those incentives and, and certainly um, get developers at the table to tell us how they might be able to make it work um, rather than just coming and saying they cannot. Because, um, it, and then I would also just add really quickly, um, we are in a situation now where um, we worry that increasing the requirements is going to lead to this sudden loss of the of developers' um, ability to, to build here. And um, I'm just gonna remind us that last year we received an update on where we're at with our arena targets and with way less restrictive requirements we're still not building very low and low income housing to meet our arena housing goals. We built um, between 2015 and 2018 or um, approved uh, 630 total units, 337 of those were above market. So over half were above market, 12 were very low income. So with it's the idea that somehow uh, greater restriction is going to make it impossible to build this housing that already isn't getting built, just, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time accepting that. So um, I, I think I'll leave it there. Um, I think I've, I've spoken on this enough times now that people know where I stand. 
Councilmember Glover. Thank you, Mayor. I'll make it quick. First, I want to appreciate your statements uh, a bit ago, just explaining your position, but also in some of the analysis that you incorporated. I want to just respond to a statement that was made a little bit ago that uh, the five percent is quote off of the table. I don't think that it's uh, fair to say that anything's off the table at this point because the whole point of this second reading is for us to be able to move forward and then open up potential solutions through amendments or recommendations coming from other places uh, like the subcommittees. And also the the how I think is another area that we're going to be working on as we move forward with this if it should pass today um, by figuring out how to incentivize and especially it was, was mentioned by community members had to incentivize the very low income housing which we so direly need uh, in the community. So I, I would encourage us to move forward from this not say, thinking that everything's off the table but that this is a jumping off point if nothing else to a conversation uh, that will hopefully be beneficial for everyone. Um, and then also just uh, to push back a little bit against the statement political policy outcome uh, that this is a pl political move. First of all, we're trying to maximize affordable housing development in Santa Cruz uh, and looking at the history of what we've done locally by reducing affordable housing requirements recently, uh, to, to which to my, in my opinion, I think as was uh, brought by Councilmember Brown has been ineffective in having the development that we so direly need that uh, it's, uh, a tool that we have now to ideally encourage more development, but also at the same time, we are in the world of politics. Everything that we're doing is political. The, the personal is political. And so to say and try and discount the attempt and the work that's being done to try to maximize affordable housing and discount it as political, I think is, is a problematic uh, opinion to have. And additionally, to bring up the loss of redevelopment funding, the reason we are where we are right now is because after the earthquake, there was a failure to adequately invest in affordable housing and livable cities. We invested in a bunch of other things which were great for certain demographics but not in addressing our affordable housing. So now we have an opportunity to move forward and with the uh, likelihood of there being state funding on the horizon that we can offset into affordable housing development. So uh, I'll leave it there but uh, there's a lot of things that we can be positive about with regards to this policy move instead of being worried about it. Vice Mayor Myers and then uh, Council Member Watkins. Uh, I just have uh, one request, maybe a note for the subcommittee work as well as the mayor's task force. Um, I think it's important then we really look at in uh, both the entitlement timeline. Um, I don't think it, it, our entitlement timeline is long. Um, I think it takes, I don't know what the average is, but I would imagine it's probably somewhere between three to seven years to actually build a project, um, to actually break ground from submittal to um, especially a complicated project. So I'd like to make sure that entitlement and financing is part of what we look like look at as well. So thank you. Councilmember Watkins. Sure. Um, just, for, just for brief clarification, there was a 5% motion that incorporated the language that was no longer being discussed. So it was the substitute motion in terms of just the reference for that being not considered as part of the, the, move, the movement we want to go in. Um, I guess my, my thoughts are, and I, I won't go on for too long, is, is it just feels like that we're putting the cart before the horse here on this, on this policy, and we um, are taking a risk. And, and that seems clear. And I guess what I don't, it's sort of hard to know what you didn't get or what you're not seeing because coming from a world of prevention, and which is my background, it's really hard to measure what you didn't have happen. But I wonder if we can measure or have some sort of information anecdotally, if that's what it is, in regards to the impact of this policy as we move forward with having it in place. Because I think data is important. Mm -hmm. And for me, this doesn't have that, so. There are no further comments. There's a substitute motion that was accepted to adopt um, this as a second reading that was moved by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Glover. Uh, there's no further comment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? No. no. Okay, so that motion passes with Council Member Glover, Council Member Crone, Council Member Brown, Mayor Cummings, and the no's were Vice Mayor Myers. Um, Councilmember Watkins and Councilmember Matthews. That concludes our um, our consent um, public hearing. Thank you. And um, now we move on to our next agenda item uh, for general business, item number 25.
Um, oh. Do you want to go back to the presentation? That oh, you, that's right. Yeah. Yes. So before we do that, there will be a presentation. Um, oh, I lost my notes. By Nicole. Yeah. On our three year strategic plan. So is Nicole. So, Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, Ron Prince, um, you all know Nicole Young, and she's been working with us ever since last summer on strategic planning. And today she's got a, a, a brief overview of the roadmap of what we hope to start off. Actually, we're already in progress, but she wants to give us a quick update on uh, a three-year strategic planning process. And this is consistent with uh, our six-month work plan that we were gonna initiate this three-year process uh, before the end of the year. So we're pretty close. But anyway, with that, I'll just uh, hand the meeting over to uh, Nicole Young. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. It's good to see you again. Happy New Year. Um, and I'm sure this is the part of the meeting you've all been waiting for, right? The, <laughs> the update. And so I want to give you just a quick kind of refresher and reorient reorientation to how I typically approach strategic planning, just to make sure that we all are thinking about it in the same way, that we clarify some of the terminology and, and, uh, and words that we're using so that we're clear about what we're doing in this part of the process. And then I'll walk you through what we have planned for the actual, we're calling it process roadmap, meaning what are our key steps, what are the timelines, kind of what are the things that we're working on. Uh, and I'll, as part of that, I'll give you a little update about what's already in progress and what is coming ahead in the next few months. And then we'll wrap up with any questions that you might have about the process. Uh, and again, summarize the next steps. And so just to be clear, today isn't about giving you an update about things that are emerging from the process, but just to make sure that you're aware of the process we're going through. So in terms of the just kind of general orientation to strategic planning, I like to think of it as an opportunity to really pause and reflect and, and try to answer three key questions. Who are you and what are you now as an organization, an entity, meaning the city of Santa Cruz? And what do you want to be and do in the future? And so part, you know, answering those questions requires looking at a lot of different information, gathering input, really looking at the current context that you're in, so that at the end of it, you can develop a roadmap and answer this question about, well, how do you get from where you are now to where you want to be? And so those, those questions that answer about how, how do you get from here to there, becomes your strategic plan, becomes the basis of your strategic plan, which I often refer to as a roadmap to your future. It's a high, often a high level roadmap. It's not getting into the weeds about your everyday tasks or the tasks of staff, but really a broad statement that articulates the council's priorities. Uh, it's meant to be a tool to guide your policy decisions and then be a tool that enables staff to go and develop those feasible, actionable strategies and implement the policies that you've set forth. And also really importantly to prioritize the time and resources that, they're, that are being invested in implementing those, those actions and those strategies so that it's in alignment with the council's priorities and just the reality of uh, time and resources available. And a good strategic plan also provides a tool that allows you to focus your efforts around engaging community members and different partners in achieving your city's mission and vision. So sometimes I see strategic plans and I um, have heard of, I've never really been part of one or led one that ends up in a plan that's, you know, like this thick that contains, you know, every imaginable scenario and, you know, it's kind of like everything and the kitchen sink <laughs> type of approach to strategic planning. So we are not going to do that because we want it to be a usable living tool uh, for you as, as policymakers. And so I like to think of a strategic plan as just one of many tools. And it's a, this really iterative and ongoing process. So it's not even just a process you have to bear through to get to a, a specific product, that written plan, but really it's an ongoing cycle. And it often begins with what we're doing now, 
what I call landscape analysis, where you're just taking a look at what are some of those factors both within your organization, within the city as a governing, uh, as, a, as a local government, what are some factors within the, within the city as well as externally, meaning out in the community, whether it's locally in this county, things happening at the state level, the federal level, that might inform and influence the kinds of things that end up in your strategic plan and how they get framed as priorities. That landscape analysis then helps inform, again, the strategic plan, which in turn informs the way you think about your budget and your operational plans or your work plans. And so that's an important distinction I like to make, that a strategic plan is really focusing on the longer term, longer horizon. It's a broad statement about your priorities that you've adopted as a council compared to operational plans or work plans, which is more along the lines of what we worked on in June. That six month work plan was very specific, very short term. Um, usually work plans are more like an annual work plan, sometimes a two year work plan, but they tend to be shorter term than a strategic plan, more tactical, um, because it's, it lays out a more specific plan about how uh, you as a city will then work with uh, council and staff right, to achieve your strategic goals. But the work plans are usually developed by staff right, in consultation with the council, but think of the strategic plan as that's your, that's your time and your opportunity to articulate your priorities, and then really then staff uses that as a tool to figure out, well, how did, how did they get that work done? Operational plans or work plans in turn then can help inform how you communicate about the strategic plan, your priorities, your actions and what kinds of metrics or, or data, right, that you would wanna be looking to and looking at to, to use, not only to see are you achieving particular goals and, and benchmarks, but really to use for continuous improvement, continuous learning. And then that feeds right back into the whole process of doing a landscape analysis. And you'll see in the middle of that uh, little kind of wheel there, a communication with stakeholders. You know, so community members, different partners, staff, you know, within the city, uh, each other, Right, so that's kind of a constant touch point throughout the process. And so some typical components in a strate strategic plan that will build into the city's plan usually starts with a vision, so that aspirational picture of what success looks like in the future. And as much as possible throughout this planning process, we're gonna build on things that you've already started to discuss, things that are already in the works or where you feel pretty strongly about, okay, we've got something good there to work with. We might need to refine it as part of this process, but we'll build on, on things that have already um, been, been discussed. And so, for example, you might remember that in our council retreat in June, uh, we created this beautiful looking uh, vision board, right, where you had a chance to think about your vision for the city 50 years into the future. So really thinking long term, beyond even your own uh, terms on the council, what, do you, what are your hopes, what are your dreams for the city of Santa Cruz? So we did some of that, just very preliminary thinking. Um, I read in, I think, some of the comments that uh, Mayor Cummings said in, in that meeting where you were appointed mayor, kind of a very nice and, art and short, concise statement that I'm considering like a working draft of a vision statement, right? So taking the elements that were brainstormed in the retreat, kind of thinking about a working draft of a vision being a community that's inclusive of all people, it's family friendly, environmentally sustainable, affordable and safe. Those were a lot of the themes, right, that emerged in the retreat. And so as part of the strategic planning process, we'll just keep refining that to make sure that we feel solid about that, that there's some agreement and sense of a shared vision. Uh, so we'll refine that during the actual planning process. And we'll do the same thing so that we arrive with a, at a vision, mission, and set of values that are clearly articulated and talk about and identify broad priorities and goals. So, so it's that high level focus areas and results to aim for <clears throat> and strategies or your key approaches to achieving your goals. So here's the, <clears throat> the planning process roadmap that we've laid out. Um, and so right now I'm just gonna walk you through at a high level what the key steps are. And so you can see what we have planned between what we started in October and what we have planned uh, to accomplish by June. And then I'll walk you through some of the more specific actions and steps that we're taking. So we're on an ongoing basis, we'll just keep think, you know, revisiting the project plan and, and adapting as we need to, adding new steps as we need to. <clears throat> and so that's just a continuous activity through June. We did form a, a small steering committee, I'll say more about that in a moment, to help guide the process, and you'll see that we have some opportunities built in throughout 
uh, the next several months, just to have kind of check-in points and make sure are we, are we on track here, are we missing anything, what else do we need to be considering? The landscape analysis, both internal and external, is really the major focus up front right now. Rectangles are kind of off, <laughs> out of alignment there. But a lot of this work is really building up to and preparing for the next council retreat, which we're uh, at this point planning to have in April. So even though you see college boxes there starting in January, that's really starting to plan for the retreat so that we have uh, a good retreat in April. Because then soon after that, we'll have to move into, I'll have to move into actually writing the plan for you so that we have a chance to draft it, vet it, get feedback um, from different stakeholders, from the steering committee, so that by June you have a plan that is ready to go. So a little bit of breakdown, more specific breakdown of the actual steps here. So again, in the project planning step, um, there's a small planning team that's working with me to oversee this process, and so really, really it's me and staff from the city manager's office. And so they're really acting as my liaisons to help make sure that when we need to bring things to a council meeting and put, get it on the agenda, that we've thought ahead far enough in advance to make that happen, putting me in touch with the right people and department staff to uh, get information that's needed, all of that. Um, which has really been helpful in creating the process roadmap that I just walked through. And we did, so it's taken us a couple months to really draft this planning roadmap and make sure that we had the right types of activities and people involved. And so we reviewed it at different points in the fall of 2019 with then Mayor Watkins and Vice Mayor Cummings, and then again more recently in December with incoming Mayor Cummings and Vice Mayor Myers. So we've done a lot of checking in to make sure that we're on the right track. And again, the steering committee is a way to just then broaden the group of people a little bit in terms of who, who can help us think about, again, are we reaching the right people? Are we including the right information? Uh, is there anything else we should be considering? So again, it's staff from the city manager's office, the director of planning and community development, director of economic development, director of water. They all volunteer to be part of this uh, steering committee. And then the mayor and vice mayor, as your uh, schedule allows, we'd love to have you there. In terms of the landscape analysis, I often use uh, two tools in particular to help just figure out how to put some structure to the information that's being gathered. And these might sound familiar to you or look familiar to you. Uh, they're often used in strategic planning processes. One is the SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, or threats. The format we're using is actually called the SPOT analysis. Um, strengths, problems, or opportunities and threats, and a context map. And those tools are just a helpful way to, to guide and, and create a structure to answer these questions, who and what are you now, and what do you want to be and do in the future? And so the spot matrix, again, some of you might be familiar with this, but I'll just walk you through how we're um, breaking this down. So strengths, the S stands for strengths, and that's really an internal look within the city what are some of your capabilities and skills and resources and successes to build on? P stands for the problems or the challenges. What are those gaps or barriers or concerns that, again, it's really about looking within the city as an organization and the things that we want to take into consideration as part of this planning process, partly so that we can see are there, between the strengths and problems, are there opportunities to be keeping an eye on? and anticipating, so whether there are specific activities or projects or initi initiatives or policies or funding opportunities that might be coming down the road, how do we think about those and take those into consideration during this planning process so that as a city you're prepared to take advantage of those and pursue those. So again, that's really thinking about outside of the city what opportunities exist, as well as threats. What are those <coughs> potential concerns or bigger problems that might come down the road that um, could become significant barriers if you're not taking those into con consideration during this planning process. Again, things outside of the city itself as an entity. So we're doing a couple different exercises and, and um, methods of looking at you know, that spot analysis as well as the context map, which is just another way to look at trends and factors, like whether it's political, economic, social, technological, legal, or environmental. What are some of those, again, things or, or trends or issues happening outside the city as an entity that would influence uh, the kinds of priorities and goals in your strategic plan, as well as community needs and starting to think about, well, what are some of those uncertainties, some of those unknowns that again, um, you know, we hear a lot of talk about the next economic recession. We don't know <laughs> exactly when or how, you know, how significant that will be, but those are the kinds of things 
right, that we should be taking into consideration as part of this longer range planning. So those are just an overview of a couple of the tools that we'll use. And so the way we'll use those tools, the way we'll gather some of the information that will help us um, kind of uh, match it to those tools is through, again, the internal landscape analysis, which is currently in progress. And wherever possible with this landscape analysis, we're gonna start with looking at what do you already have? What have you already done? What have you already gathered that we can look at to, to then glean themes and results from so that we're not going back out and, and repeating a survey or repeating a task force or a, 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 an engagement process that you've already done and, uh, and then end up creating survey fatigue or community engagement fatigue where people are feeling like, you've already asked me this, aren't you listening, right? So I'm in the process of reviewing existing departmental data and reports related to the goals and results of your current work plans um, and seeing what, what does that tell us about future strategic issues and priorities, um, any existing staff surveys and other feedback that tell us again about the internal context I'm taking a look at. And then we'll see, well, what other staff input uh, or information is needed and, and what kinds of methods and strategies would best uh, would be the best way to gather that. So some options might include things like um, using existing department head meetings and management and staff meetings to gather some more input. And if it looks like it's needed, potentially administering a, a new or different survey to get additional input. And we'll follow a similar process for the external landscape analysis. Again, looking at what kinds of data do you already have available to you uh, you have a lot of uh, task forces and committees and listening sessions and polls that have been done in recent years, right? So we'll take a look at that and see what does that, again, tell us about uh, priorities and trends, and then see what kinds of additional community engagement strategies might be needed, and what, and what can we do with the resources and some time that we have available. So again, some options might include things like a bilingual online survey or key informant interviews or focus groups or a community forum. So we, we most likely won't be able to do all of those, but again, that's why we're taking a look at what you already have available so we can be really uh, strategic and targeted with additional community engagement. And so again, all of that will be summarized. That's part of my job is to then take all of that and summarize it and try to then present it and feed it back to you in a way that's, that really helps inform your thinking in the council retreat in April. So again, January through March is just our time to plan that and actually come together in April to build agreement then on, on the city's strategic framework, meaning your vision, mission, values, priorities and goals and strategies. And then it's go time. It's putting it into writing, <laughs> uh, putting it into a structure that will be both useful for you as, as policymakers and then understandable for anyone who picks it up and reads it, that they can see, ah, here's what the city is working on, here are what the priorities are, uh, and here are some things that uh, the community might wanna weigh in on as well. So our goal is to uh, write it in April and May, review it with the steering committee and other stakeholders in May and June, present it to you in June for review, feedback and approval. So. Let me pause and see, are there any questions about the planning process or any suggestions? So we'll go with Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Brown, and then whoever wants to ask questions. Looks like warp speed work through a lot of people in a short period of time. Yes. <laughs> um, and um, presumably you won't be reporting at every meeting, you'll be out doing your work, but I think it would be helpful for us to get even just written, here's what I'm doing now, here are the groups I've, I mean, just, just to keep us feeling in the loop. Yes. We've talked about that, and I think, you know, and so we can certainly look at things that I might provide. I think we've talked about through the city manager's updates that that's another way. And so we'll have probably multiple ways to make sure that you all feel like you're in the loop. Yeah. And then kind of the flip side of that, any, any point along the way where you want suggestions about who should I be reaching? I mean, you know the community well, but nonetheless. Yes, yes great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's my round. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. And I agree with Councilmember Matthews that it would be nice to kind of have some updates along the way so we have a sense of where things are at, where they're going. Uh, in terms of the community engagement piece, um, I am wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, kind of how you see, how you are thinking about uh, access
accessing d diverse members of our community because I think that that has been a challenge that we face. You know, I mean, it, not for lack of trying, but you know, certainly uh, something that we always need to be thinking about and be very deliberate about. So I'd just love to hear a little bit more on how you're thinking about that. Um, and I think that's my only. Yeah, my initial thought is that um, as I'm going through some of the existing you know, reports or summaries about community engagement processes that have already happened, I'm keeping an eye out for, okay, what types of people have participated? Can, what do we know about kind of the either demographics or areas of the city that you're hearing from often? And who are those missing voices mm -hmm. and people? And are there organizations in the community, whether they're community groups or nonprofits or you know, sometimes there's like neighborhood leader groups that might be those natural bridges where we can reach out and, and invite them to participate. So that might also mean looking at language access, right, and, and preparing for different surveys in different languages or focus groups in different languages. Councilmember Watkins. Thank you, Nicole. And I love strategic planning, so I get excited to hear about what's going to be, what's happening and what's forthcoming. Um, I want to thank Councilmember Brown for raising the issue around how do we get to the voices that haven't necessarily been um, accessed in the past and are difficult to access, but we really do want to hear from. So I thank you for bringing that uh, forward. My um, maybe question or concern or not, I, I guess or suggestion could be, I know that often the strategic plan or um, um, work plan has guided some of the budget uh, hearing kind of direction. So as you are learning uh, themes that are coming forward, I'm just wondering in terms of how it's going to be complementary to our, our budget hearing process and or informing um, that. And maybe that's a question more so, or sort of a suggestion for consideration moving forward for our city manager's team. Yes, I think we can certainly do that. And I think uh, really any opportunity that comes up during the year, there's various venues and initiatives that uh, we uh, undertake with, that we can take advantage to use also to provide uh, feedback. But we'll do that because it is, it is very compressed. And so I think we'll have to really get creative in terms of maximizing the input that we can in whichever opportunity comes up. I'd just like to say, Again, thank you for the presentation today. And one thing to keep in mind, I think, as well, when you're going out and doing the engagement with the community is also, um, so this comment is within the context of the fact that I think one common thread you're going to hear throughout the community is, you know, what are we going to do around homelessness or addiction? And given that some of the services that are, that are provided to address those issues are actually under the purview of the county, I think it would also be good to take into consideration, you know, what is their strategic plan and how can we find ways to partner with the county and align our strategic plans so that we can work together when we're trying to address some of the issues that I think are going to be the most pressing and come up um, as you're doing a community outreach. So. Yes, great, great suggestion. Are there any further questions, comments from council members? Council member Brown. What's the budget for the uh, strategic planning process? Gosh, I don't think I have it off the top of my head, but I think we did budget uh, a certain dollar amount. We can, get, we can get that for you. It's in a $15,000 range, but I can't remember. Yes, we, we, uh, we have a budget uh, projection or estimate for this aspect of the process. Uh, and we, we had, it was in two pieces. One was the six month retreat and this, and I think we we're in the neighborhood of uh, uh, under 40,000. 140,000. Under. Under, under 40,000. Under, under, below 40. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any further comments or questions at this time? Thank you for the really thorough um, presentation. It's very helpful to kind of really see the beginning um, and then how all the information carries forward. And uh, so just very helpful to see sort of the, that roadmap that, that you provided today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Okay. So next up on our agenda is item number 25, general business. Um, order will be a presentation of items by staff for the council members who brought the items forward, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment on these items and return to council for deliberation and action. 
The first item up on our agenda is introduction for publication and ordinance related to electronic filing of Fair Political Practice Commission campaign finance disclosure statements and statements of economic interest. And I'll turn it over to Bonnie Bush. So this ordinance, it's pretty straightforward. It would allow us to move forward with adding a component to NetFile, which is our system for um, statement of economic interest filing, which is electronic currently. This will allow us to do campaign statement filing electronically, which is something beneficial for both filers as well as the city. It saves a lot of paper. It saves time. It organizes it for the filer. Um, it carries over each reporting, so it's not a new entry every time. Um, and an ordinance is just required to add that component to NetFile. Are there any council members who have any questions at this time? I, I actually do. <laughs> um, occasionally there have been candidates who honestly aren't comfortable on computers or electronic filing. Um, and usually they're running kind of a budget campaign, but I'm, I'm wondering how, what's the provision for that? Um, it could be a, a non-mandatory um, electronic filing. Some cities require it to be electronic. Um, we could provide the option for it to not be mandatory. Not ideal record keeping from my point of view, just because then we have to retain paper copies as well as and net file retains it per the retention schedule. I understand the advantages. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm, it is, does not need to be required. It was my preference, which is why I brought it. I understand that. Um, I think it would be helpful, and I'm, I'm actually happy to go ahead with the introduction, but I would like to um, give direction for finding some option for, for those candidates for whom it is truly not in their wheelhouse. And it's really an equity you thing, specifically honestly. Specifically, council candidates or anyone who has a campaign committee? I think anyone who's filing with you. Um, so, I'm, again, I say I'm, I'm comfortable with moving ahead because I understand this direction. It's virtually everyone's doing it now, but this occurred to me and it's just kind of based on recollection of history. Well, this, are there any other questions by council members on this item? No? That will open up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to speak on item number 25 on our agenda today? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Uh, let me, if I could sure. ask, Tony, do you see a way in this language to accommodate that? Or I think more as a practical matter, if somebody came to the city clerk and said, I'm having trouble figuring this out, you could Direct the provide city clerk that assistance without necessarily having, having a paper copy. Yeah. yeah. Does that sound agreeable? What was the, what, that I would assist them? Yeah. Yeah. I, I do that with the electronic, the statement I of like, you do. I help you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just a matter, they can come into my office and I can walk them through it. It's okay. I would prefer that over having to maintain paper yeah. records. Yeah. Okay. As I say, I only wanted to raise the issue. Clarifying hmm. question, Bonnie. Um, does the state provide um, these forms in, in Spanish or other languages? I'm sure it would be. <laughs> available upon request, yeah. Thank you. Laura Watkins. Maybe in that spirit of sort of equity and access, if it, uh, is it possible or how, I don't know how it would be done, but to advertise that if you have questions or if this filing system isn't working for you or you have other needs in terms of accommodations, that they could just reach out to to you for support or if, if, I don't know if that would fit on the, where that could go, website or whatnot, but. I mean, potential if, transparency. if I may, it would make sense to do it upon yeah. the initial sure. you need to do this filing as okay. well as my reminder email that I send them. But it's coming up and due. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Is there any further comment? Is there anyone willing to make a motion on this item? Yeah. I'll move the item. I'll second it. Uh, let me read it real quick. Um, 
So I'll move um, the recommendation to introduce for publication an ordinance relating to electronic and paperless filing of Fair Political Practices Commission campaign finance disclosure statements and statements of economic interest. Second. Yes. This is moved by Vice Mayor Myers and seconded by Councilmember Matthews. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Moving on to the next item, um, we have item number 26, amending the City of Santa Cruz Environmentally Acceptable Food Packaging and Products Ordinance. And the presenters on this item will be Leslie O'Malley, Waste Reduction Manager, and Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. Bob Nelson. Oh, okay. Bob Nelson. <laughs> Good afternoon, Council. Mayor Cummings, again, my name is Leslie O'Malley, Waste Reduction Program Manager, Public Works Department. Um, we are here to present on, uh, to recommend changes to the City of Santa Cruz Environmentally Acceptable Food Packaging Ordinance. As you may be aware, the City of Santa Cruz has long been a leader in reducing harmful single-use disposable food and beverage packaging that is consumed and discarded within the City of Santa Cruz. Going back to 1992, we passed a voluntary ordinance to address the use of polystyrene to-go food containers, and in 2008, we found the need to formalize a ban on polystyrene food service items. We added to that a requirement that all to-go foodware items must be biodegradable, compostable, or recyclable. In 2013, we passed an ordinance to ban the distribution of plastic carryout bags and to place a bag charge on paper carryout bags. In 2017, you may, be re you may recall that we required providers to give straws, lids, cutlery, and other condiment packages upon request only for to-go items. We encourage food service providers to provide a 25 cent credit to customers who bring in their own reusable cups and containers. We also encourage food and beverage service providers to charge a 25 cent takeout fee for disposable cups. We come to you today with recommendation for changes to our ordinance. We'd like to align with the county on their recently approved 25 cent cup fee in this case, the vendors would keep the 25 cents as they do the bag fee. This fee would apply to all ordering platforms, including but not limited to telephone, web, smartphone, and other digital platforms. Berkeley, San Anselmo, and Watsonville have all recently passed ordinances requiring a fee on disposable cups in addition to the County of Santa Cruz, as I mentioned. Other changes we propose to make to this is some of our definitions, mainly in the definition of biodegradable and compostable. We'd like these to, re to read items that decompose into elements found in nature within a reasonably short amount of time. They must be fiber-based where applicable, and they must be BPI, that stands for Biodegradable Products Institute certified or another third-party uh, testing laboratory to certify that these fiber-based um, components are free of intentionally added polyfluorinated alkyl substance. You may have heard of those recently in the news or in a popular movie as PFAS or PFAS. Um, making this change would also expand future opportunity for a compostable material to find end markets. Other changes we'd like to make to definition is to add recreational area to city facility and to add uh, takeout delivery services not currently under, covered under our current ordinance to the definition of food establishment. As far as implementation, as traditional, this would go into effect 30 days after adoption. Historically, however, we've, all, we've given six months for the education, outreach, and support of various businesses to help come to compliance. We work with food service facilities to use up their existing stock and to make sure that they have access and information to vendors that sell the accepted items. And then ideally, the business community would have up until after um, Labor Day to be in fully compliance. And that's it. Thank 
of the presentation. Are there any members of the council that have questions at this time? Councilmember Clarence. I thank you for being here. Um, we had a couple letters that I saw from folks who, who work in this. I don't know, did you see Jackie Nunez's um, email? And uh, who's the other woman that sent us something to? Um, Miriam Gordon from Upstream. Yeah, so what about incorporating those changes that they suggest? Um, I think that uh, there's so there's a Bay Area working group of more than 18 jurisdictions looking at changes to these kind of ordinances. And Upstream um, and the last Plastic Straw Plastic Pollution Coalition is very much in favor of um, pushing the requirement as Berkeley has done to in uh, dining locations to require durable, reusable, washable dishware. Um, Berkeley is sort of braving the front on that and see how it is going. I'm not sure um, that our community is ready for that, but we would follow your recommendation. Um, as far as the uh, polyfluorinated alkyl substance that Miriam pointed out, um, we could certainly clarify. You'll notice in the um, markup we have parentheses <coughs> around polyfluorinated alkyl substance. But as Miriam pointed out, the popular PFAS and PFAS, there's a whole broad range of other chemicals that manufacturers could sidestep around these requirements. Um, so if we did a blanket statement of intentionally added polyfluorinated alkyl substance, no matter what their um, abbreviation breakdown is, that would help remedy that. So you're suggesting we do that, right? I would recommend that. Are there any other questions at this time? Seeing none. Well, actually, I'll, I'll ask my questions right now. Um, we did get communication from um, Seaside Company, which I'm, I'm sure you've seen. And so um, they raised a few points. Maybe I'll ask if you could um, um, respond to them now. Um, I'll start by saying um, they expressed um, frustration. They're not opposing the action, but they did express frustration that uh, they were not more fully engaged in the discussion leading up to this. And uh, I think that, in all honesty, was a legitimate um, uh, complaint. Um, and not just they as an, uh, um, a unique business, but other, other um, major providers of these um, um, disposable foodware. Um, they did ask that it, um, language in the proposed changes um, um, be postponed till after Labor Day. And in your slides, you say that's when full compliance would be expected, but they mentioned just, you know, issues with supply and volume and so forth. So can you talk to me a little bit about timeline for implementation? Sure. Or the ex expectation for kind of reasonable Sure. Um, we did meet with um, about 10 members um, from Seaside Company uh, recently to um, listen to their concerns and frustrations, answer their questions to the best that we could. Um, it was their recommendation that they sought to after Labor Day so that they could get through their summer stocks, their busy season um, to get into compliance. Um, we're not changing in the ordinance the manner to become exempt. The public works director mm -hmm. still has the ability mm -hmm. to issue a one-year exemption. Um, so our original intention was six months from um, a or final adoption, and that would more closely align with Santa Cruz County's um, projected date of July 1st. That would put us off a little bit. Um, so we have moved compliance target deadline to after Labor Day. Um, our staff has currently been working on updating the um, vendor list to make sure that these materials are acceptable. Some people have asked to be taken off the list because they can't keep up with these changes or they are small that they can't compete. Um, but we're confident that we'll have um, a viable list that vendors can um, draw from to make sure they get compliance. And as has been the goals in the past, these our team, our education and outreach team approaches these ordinances and um, seeking compliance first through um, support and education. We look to um, uh, fines and, you know, coming down on them as a last resort. So we really have had success since, uh, as I showed in the earlier slide, the city has enacted quite a few um, ordinances over quite a number of years and have met with great success. I appreciate that. And that was also conveyed, but um, also the fact that the industry went through a whole lot of changes recently, and now this is another whole mm -hmm. um, 
So that's what do I say? generation of changes based on, on e evolving understanding of what exactly. the packaging is like. Yeah. Understand that. Um, and um, um, and the other issue that they mentioned, which uh, is just practical, um, getting, uh, in this case, the supplies they need in the volume, the vendors may not be there. So I understand you're working on that. And, and if it's a logistical problem, allowances will be made. That's my understanding. So I just, that was a kind of a legitimate issue brought to us. So I thought I'd just put it out there. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions by council members? Seeing none, I'd like to invite the public up for public comment. Um, you're welcome to come to the stand and you have two minutes. Other members of the public, if you'd like to comment, please line up to the left and uh, we'll call you up one by one. Thank you. Good afternoon, council. My name is Emily Pomeroy and I'm the program manager at Save Our Shores. I'm here today to advocate in favor of the proposed 25 cent disposable cup charge and to encourage further action for waste reduction. First, I'd like to thank you on your work thus far in reducing the use of harmful disposable products in Santa Cruz. Imposing a fee for disposable to-go cups is a necessary step in reducing the amount of debris that's entering our landfills and our oceans. According to the city of Berkeley, it's estimated that we use approximately 120 billion disposable cups in the US each year, generating 2.2 billion pounds of waste and using 35 billion gallons of our precious and fleeting water supply. Imposing this fee is a way to encourage city residents and visiting tourists to integrate environmentally responsible habits into their routine, habits which will spill over into the lives of their social networks, both within and beyond the city of Santa Cruz. <clears throat> I encourage the city to pursue a strong outreach campaign for this ordinance to ensure that local businesses understand the value of this fee and that they're able to enforce it. In addition to the charge, I would also like to voice my support for the redefinition of the terms compostable and biodegradable in the context of this ordinance to refer only to BPI certified fiber-based foodware. Biodegradable and compostable plastic to-go items have become a popular solution to our plastic problem. While they're not derived from petroleum, they act the same when they end up in the marine environment. These items can only biodegrade under very specific conditions, which can only occur in large industrial facilities, of which there are still very few in California. I'm gonna pause you for one sec. Excuse me, Mr. McHenry. Mr. McHenry. I didn't want him speaking over you, so. Mr. McHenry, if you can please take your phone call outside. Thank you. In addition, these compostable plastics often contaminate recycle streams, causing generally recyclable items to go to the landfill. Ultimately, we need to stop identifying ways to continue feeding our addiction to single-use disposable products and relearn how to live without them. I believe the proposed cup charge is a step in that direction. I thank you again for your time and continuing to lead the way in waste reduction, both statewide and across the US. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Cummings and council members. My name is Ashley Blake Drager, and I'm the Pacific Policy and Communications Manager with Oceana. On behalf of our members in Santa Cruz and across California, uh, I'm here to speak in support of the amended ordinance before you today. We're in support of the 25 cent fee on disposable to-go cups for the purposes of encouraging customers to bring their own reusable cups. And we also appreciate the thoughtful nature behind um, amending the definitions to, to um, reflect the fact that there are materials out there such as bioplastics, as, as was mentioned, actually act very similarly to fossil fuel derived products like single use plastic and still pollute the environment and harm wildlife and result in very similar risks to human health. So again, appreciate um, the thoughtful nature behind um, considering more appropriate alternatives that are out there. As you're aware, we're on an unsustainable path when it comes to the production and use of single-use plastic. All of the plastic that has been produced to date is already polluting our environment and posing health uh, risks. Um, yet there are project projections that show that single-use 
uh, plastic um, production is set to quadruple between 2014 and 2050. So all that to say that actions taken at the local, local level are hugely important um, and also encourage consistency across the counties and play a huge role in developing a groundswell of support for legislative action at the state and national level. So again, appreciate your leadership on the actions today um, as well as uh, actions the council has taken previously. So thank you very much. Thank you. Speaker. Hello, Mayor and Council. I'm Allison, and I'm here on behalf of the California Restaurant Association. Um, I first wanted to thank you for um, you know, offering a, a list of acceptable products, like on the website in the future. That really helps um, restaurants that you know aren't packaging experts know what to order. Um, I know that's something that. Um, the ASTM standard definition was taken out of the um, the ordinance um, or the amendments to the ordinance, and that's something that I want to request to put in. I know that seems like a small detail, um, but it really does help restaurants, you know, figure out how to order things. The ASTM code is usually on the packaging when they're ordering it, so um, I know that seems like a small detail, but I know that really does help everybody. Um, <clears throat> another detail that I wanted to bring up was um, the upon request definition isn't clear about self-selecting um, utensils from a receptacle, like if it's a fast casual setting and you can go pick up a, a straw or something like that. Um, I know that really helps the flow of restaurants, um, you know, so that they don't have to go and interrupt the line to get, grab a straw or something like that. Um, so I was asking if the, the self-selection could be an acceptable um, process for upon request. Um, and then um, lastly, I know that the 25 cent charge of disposable cups, um, it's a concerning precedent on, in the restaurant industry, especially in Santa Cruz, just for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, that charge can add up really quickly, um, and it has some larger implications for the lower income residents of, um, of the city. I know that they're less able to absorb those costs and less likely to be carrying reusables or um, washable, reusable, washable um, cups and things like that around. Um, and that just further drives up the price of everything. I know people um, you know, enjoying food have noticed in the past few years how, how much prices have gone up recently, so that will be a factor. Um, so yeah, that, thank you for listening. Thank you. Michael Spadafora from Java Junction. So I'd like to point out a couple of things. So two years ago, we met and you guys decided that we had to go to compostable cups. That's not up, that wasn't up on your chart. So the compostable cups, the majority of them are made with corn, put on a truck, sent to a port, put on a boat, sent to China, made into a compostable cup, shipped back here. And I get them and if they're in a truck or a container, it's over 105 degrees, they'll melt, right? So those costs already, um, I've passed, had to pass on to my customers. So anybody that used to get a $2 cup of coffee or a $2 soda is now spending $2.50 for it, $2.75. State Board of Equalization, if I pay 15 cents for something, they need to see 45 cents in sales for it. That's how it works. The FDA says, and the State, Board, State Health Department, if I get somebody's cup, which I already give them a 25 cent discount for, if they bring it in, I've done it for 25 years. If I get a cup from somebody and it touches a surface, it has to be sanitized. The way my, custom, my employees take a cup right now <laughs> is they take it at the cash register, it sits on a counter there. It goes to a staging area, it goes to a making area, it goes to a pickup area. That's four areas of the counter that have to be sanitized if I accept a cup from somebody. People bring in all different size cups, right? They try bringing in this little cup, big cup. My staff has to figure out what size to charge them for. I have a 12, 16, 20 ounce cup of coffee, right? Um, so it, it, these are just all costs that are passed on to the customers. The lowest denomination people here in town usually don't have a, have a recyclable cup. You're passing these charges on to people, which I don't mind doing again, just like I said last time, everything just keeps going up. But right now, a smoothie has about 80 cents in packaging built into the cost of the, uh, of the product right now. A coffee, uh, my smoothie cups just went up 30% the other day. Uh, paper products just went up another 20%. These are all costs that are gonna keep going on to the customers. Um, <laughs> And we don't have any way to recycle any of this stuff. We don't have a way to recycle the compostable stuff you guys made us use before. And now nobody's buying our recyclable stuff. So you guys need to find out an equitable solution how everything's done. And nobody's contacted me, and I have three stores here, so no, nobody's asked for me for my input. Hello, uh, my name is Ali Webster. I'm chair of Surfrider Foundation Santa Cruz chapter. I'm here today to speak on behalf of Surfrider's hundreds of members, volunteers, and supporters in Santa Cruz. Um, since 1991, we've been an all-volunteer group um, working to protect the coastline. 
Uh, we're so proud to live in a community uh, that respects the ocean and is always open to new ideas and groundbreaking changes, especially when it comes to waste reduction. It's no longer news to anyone that the plastic we use doesn't go away, not in our lifetime or that of our children or grandchildren, etc. Um, and it's not news to you that the bioplastics um, that we've accepted um, that don't actually decompose any differently than regular plastic in a landfill are costing businesses more money for little purpose and providing customers with a misleading sense of moral satisfaction. Once upon a time, the idea of biodegradable packaging was enough, but now it must be redefined and more regulated. As the leaders of our community, it is your responsibility to continue to guide our well-meaning business owners and consumers into the reality of single use and the best solutions that are there, um, but perhaps not so easy to implement um, without that extra little push and a guarantee of consistency across competition. To keep up, we have to evolve our ordinances to fit the facts and make them as influential as possible. This means moving towards reusable and natural fiber based to go where. As a community with, a heavy tour with heavy tourism, we are also in a very unique position to influence people from all over the world visiting our beautiful city. Changing our packaging and implementing takeout fees will make every single visitor to Santa Cruz stop, think, and perhaps learn something. It will show the country that these changes, which might seem extreme to many, are feasible and have a very strong impact. Thank you for your time, and as always, your open mind. Thank you. That was the two minutes. Hi, um, I'm sorry, Justin. Uh, the charging stations are all full over at the other place, and I forgot to turn the ringer off, so I didn't mean to uh, interfere with the meeting. Um, the uh, Food Not Bombs uses all compostables from uh, World Centric, which is a fantastic company that um, provides a lot of support for all kinds of uh, really great uh, causes all over the world. So when you buy something from them, the uh, about 25%, I believe, it goes to helping other people. And we've been co using all compostables for year, like maybe three years now. And um, the one thing that would be helpful is to have better uh, composting in the community because we use uh, um, the composting at uh, Homeless Garden Project and we fill up the, it has to be distributed, uh, um, you know, like in, in layers so that the, particularly the forks, which are potatoes, take a while to compost, and the plates take a longer than the food does to compost. So it would be great if the city also, as part of this, um, helped uh, reduce some of the stress on the composting community that is already, um, you know, desperate. But we, and we compost, I think, about uh, maybe 10 to 15 five-gallon buckets of compost a uh, uh, weekend, sometimes as many as 20. And, um, th and so that would be a big help if there was like more community support to uh, accept all the compost. And imagine if we're already having trouble with just 150 to 200 meals uh, twice a week, imagine how it will be for an entire city full of people trying to compost their things. So I think that's gonna figure into what's going on. Thank you very much, you guys. Hi, Gail McNulty, Save Our Shores. Um, congratulations, you all are lucky enough to be holding elected office at a time when humanity needs to pretty much reinvent everything that we're doing. So um, plastic pollution is emerging as a top threat to ocean ecosystems and human health. A March 2018 report from the Earth Law Center said that by 2025, there could be a ton of plastic for every three tons of fish in our ocean. Plastic debris harms nearly 700 species worldwide through entanglement and ingestion, alters natural biological and chemical processes, provides a means for introduction of toxins into our food web, and costs the U.S. economy millions of dollars annually. According to a 2019 World Wildlife Study, plastic pollution is so widespread that human beings may be ingesting five grams of plastic per week, the equivalent of a credit card. In 2019 alone, the production and incineration of plastic added more, to more than 850 million metric tons of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, equal to the pollution from 189 new 500 megawatt coal-fired power plants, according to a May, 19, May 2019 report issued by the Center for International Environmental Law. The rapid global growth of the plastic industry fueled by cheap natural gas from hydraulic fracturing, is not only destroying the environment and endangering human health, but also undermining efforts to reduce carbon pollution and prevent climate catastrophe. 
If plastic pollution and use continues to grow as currently planned, by 2030 emissions could reach 1.34 gigatons per year, equivalent to the emissions released by more than 295 500 megawatt coal power plants. A 25 cent charge on cups is a small symbolic step in the right direction. We hope you will pass this charge and commit to even more meaningful plastic reform in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is there anyone else who would like to speak after this gentleman on this item? If not, then you'll be our last speaker. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, I hope this uh, plastic ban goes also to restaurants using plastic bags. I know the plastic bag ordinance that was passed before excluded restaurants and it was voluntary for restaurants not to use plastic bags and very few restaurants in town stopped using them. Or there are a handful that don't use plastic bags anymore, but the majority still use plastic bags. So I think it would be a great idea if you ban plastic bags at restaurants also, because there are alternatives. And um, <clears throat> as far as the cups go, are the lids gonna be recyclable or compostable? And I hope the cups are compostable uh, so that we're not adding to the uh, garbage stream. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sure. And I would like to go ahead. So I just have a I have a quick question, if I may, because um, it reminded me. When I when I had my little one with a like a sippy cup, having been denied, not letting them put the uh, it was a hot chocolate at the time, um, and would prefer not to do it in the reusable cup, and that was a little while ago. But is there any kind of education or sort of social norming or work to be done with some of our um, uh, producers, particularly those who may um, have a pattern of not wanting to take the liability of putting something in a reusable cup? Um, <clears throat> that will definitely be part of our education and outreach campaign. Um, as we heard from some of our speakers, there's been a big push and trend and awareness um, about this. There's recent California legislation, AB 619, that sought to broaden and also clarify uh, the health code so restaurants can safely and meet requirements to accept that cross counter. And um, we'll be working on uh, policies with businesses that are interested in expanding their um, taking of um, reusable cups to make that, a you'll always find probably businesses that aren't going to do that. Um, but that's definitely part of our outreach efforts. Thank you. I had a question uh, with regard to one of the um speakers and also a letter we, we receive. Could you talk a little bit about the removal of the ASTM code? Is that is that really just about ordering or maybe you could speak a little bit to that? In sure. Terms of so um, in our research, it appeared that um, ASTM standard was not strong enough to leave out fiber um, compostables that are free from intentionally added polyfluorinated uh, alkyl substances. And so that's why the stronger um, BPI or other third party. BPI, Biodegradable Products Institute, as an organization has voted unanimously starting January 1st, 2020 to only certify uh, fiber-based compostables that are free of intentionally added polychemicals. So that's the replacement for that's the replacement to restaurants the ASTM. to be able to look at that standard. So, got it. Okay, I just wanna make sure. Thank you. Councilmember Glover, Councilmember Cron. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the presentation, for all the great work, um, as well as to the speakers and their, those perspectives. I know that there's mixed feelings about uh, added fees on cups. I know personally, when they added fees on bags, I found myself using a lot less bags. Personally, just in general, I'm sure that wasn't the same with a lot of people. But I do want to acknowledge and appreciate the Restaurant Association actually for bringing up the issue of regressive taxation that came in a letter, uh, as well as it was something that I was already aware of, but to say it again in their, their public uh, comment or, or statement. So I know this isn't the time for that conversation of finding alternative options to move away from regressive taxes, but while this is a great starting point, I'd love to see us continue the conversation on some point on how we can 
as the presenter from the expedition said, to figure out ways so that we can stop the um, use of plastics in our community in general and make it so that we're ideally stopping it at the production point uh, before it even gets here for us to be taxing, which does disproportionately impact low-income people. So really appreciate the work, and I look forward to where we can go from here. Councilman McCrum. Thanks. Um, both Ms. Uh, Gordon and Ms. Nunez both talked about the Berkeley Ordinance, and um, I don't know where my colleagues are on this, but uh, both of them have suggested that um, uh, have inside dining, you uh, shall, shall use reusable cups, plates, and utensils. Um, is there any kind of direction that we could give to Leslie in uh, sort of surveying restaurants, coming back to the council as far as where that might, how, how people might feel about that, um, in looking at other organizations and how, how the Berkeley one is, is, is playing out. I mean, we have to be headed in that direction. I mean, that's, that's I mean, the, the, the problem is, very, is grave. And I think the more cities that get on board early, the more other cities that will be able to, to um, take it up as well. But there has to be a few in the beginning. Um, I would appreciate if anybody up here has any thoughts on that. Um, it would, you know, it's a dramatic step, but could we play it out over two years, over three years even, where we eliminate you know, restaurants where you know, would not serve, like Nick the Greek, for example, to choose one, just opened up. Mm -hmm. They have only <laughs> disposable stuff, you know, no, no plates, and they have facilities to have uh, reusable uh, plates. I can just comment on that quickly or briefly. I think that, you know, I agree with your sentiments. I think that everyone up here does. And I think one thing that we might want to do if there's desire to is begin working with staff and um, one to see how it's how the ordinance is playing out in Berkeley, but then also um, provide some time for outreach to the restaurant community because I wouldn't want to take an action tonight yeah, no, that yeah, could then, yeah. you know, uh, have negative impacts with the restaurant community. But I totally share that, you know, we do need to be moving away from um, just single use it, when it's sit down dining. So, is there a way to get to give direction to Leslie to go survey? I mean, you're probably overloaded with work already. Uh, get a couple interns. I don't know. I mean, to help with that in, in getting the information from restaurants. Um, I think as we'll be doing the outreach to work on um, the changes to this ordinance, it would certainly be easy to add in uh, feedback or question about that. Um, I just want to share anecdotally the city of Alameda, who has been a leader in this, while they don't have um, a cup charge, they also made a similar change that only fiber-based BPI certified compostable serviceware is allowed, no plastics, no PLA, period. Um, what they have seen is that a lot of their in-dining restaurants have voluntarily switched to durable, washable, reusable dishes for the cost-saving analysis. Um, Upstream, who works very closely, closely with Rethink Disposables, has sent us some really uh, enlightening case studies of actual restaurants and their cost savings, and so that can certainly be part of our um, outreach and education. Well, I was just, it's, uh, I agree, you go into a sit-down place and they give you disposables, it makes no sense, but uh, I think you're going to be busy implementing this for the time being, um, but I think that's, it's certainly the a next, a next project to tackle. When it does, you, I think, especially conscientious about reaching out to the industry, because it is interesting when we hear just the kind of logistical things that never occurred to us sitting here with best intentions. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion if there's no. If I could just add one more yeah, thing. Yeah. It's come to light after we um, uh, entered the staff report and the ordinance. Um, <clears throat> there are some restaurants, as you mentioned, Nick the Greeks, that's what's brought it to mind, um, serves only in disposable. And the ordinance as they've been written so far, these requirements fall to, to go where? And so the logic is that restaurants are unlikely to have two separate stocks mm -hmm. of, um, you know, plastic and then compostable ware. Um, so there is opportunity in the language to require um, all dine-in restaurants have at least this level of required um, 
compostable wear to match to go wear. So then that would be consistent across uh, to go and dine in for at least the compostables. Is that, is that in the ordinance right now? Or it's you're not saying currently. We need to add it? Where would we add it? Um, You want to address that? Um, so we currently, um, in the exemption, um, I don't know that this, we have, uh, if a business has served uh, fish or raw meat, um, they are exempt. And I just let you address it. So we'd have to examine where um, that would go, that would add um, a requirement, because we haven't currently uh, required that. The state of California passed legislation as far as straws that said um, uh, they can, all straws must be upon request, dine in or take out, and they can still be plastic. <clears throat> I did find it. <clears throat> like we did last time where we encouraged people to charge mm -hmm. the 25 cent uh, charge for disposable cups. We did actually in uh, section 6.48.025 E, it's the very last one. It does say food service providers that have inside dining are encouraged to make reusable food service ware rather than providing disposable ware. Intention with that is as we start coming back the next iteration that then we'll be able to make that a mandatory requirement. I think for now, I could personally, I'd, I'd put the, throw that in the next iteration <laughs> um, version of things. Um, and Leslie, I, I do have a, one question. Where in this ordinance does I, I know it's here? I think it's here. Talk about uh, when the uh, when the ordinance goes into effect. Uh, you talked about after Labor Day. Seven. I keep looking for it and not seeing it. Um, section seven. That's the only, the section oh, seven. Okay, I only, see. Uh, 30 days after final adoption, warnings will take place up to six months. So can warnings can be. We can change that to, because that would push past the, to the Labor Day currently. Um, is, is that something we can do on this first reading here? Yeah, okay. I think I'd like to do that then. Um, uh, or, uh, ordinance shall take effect um, following Labor Day and uh, education will take place um, up until the implementation. Does that sound good? Just a, a minor thing that Ms. Gordon pointed out, uh, and I don't un understand in B in uh, 6.48.025, under B, all food providers may only give straws, and then she crossed out lids. Why is that? Is that a comment? Yeah, I, I, it's a comment letter. She crossed oh. out lids. Why, why would she cross out lids? Um, I'm not sure I'd have to. And, and also she crossed out be able to. Can we, can we just change it to customers must affirmatively request these items separate from food and beverage orders? And then take out be able to is what she crossed out. I think that wouldn't change the spirit of the. The formally requested. She crossed out be able to. Safety concern evaluation. I think that her reference to the lids, which has been ongoing for these ordinances, um, is the lids is we need to make sure paramount for safety for hot mm -hmm. beverages that. Um, the, if there's exemptions or workarounds until more materials and um, more guaranteed safe materials are available, that we look at that. So I think that, if I recall from our conversation, is what she was leading to. I believe that. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to be okay to cross out to be able to? I, I don't see how that really changes the... I don't think it changes the intention the of intention the intention or language. the meaning of the language. 
So we'll just leave is it. Is that a friendly amendment? Because why, why not just take it out then and change it? Show me where it is. What, give me a number in a... 618. Number B. Item B. If you look at 2618, page 2618, if you look at B, the red lines, you would strike customers. Right. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? Oh, oh it's, it seems... Yeah, that seems to I'm make no difference. It'd be just a semantic issue. Yeah. It's on our page 26 18. And it says all food providers may only give straws, lids, cutlery upon request of the customer. And then basically it says customers must be able to request them. But that's kind of repetitive, it seems to me. Okay, so we just strike it. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't have a second yet. <coughs> we, we now have a friendly amendment. Well, is it so the motion's been made? Yeah. Okay. You second it? Yeah. Council Member okay. Crone. Okay. So a motion made by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Council Member Crone. And I'll just say anyone who knows me knows I pick up these damn cups and lids and straws all the time. They are a scourge upon the earth. So. I'm in favor of this. <laughs> right. Is there any further discussion, concerns? Thank you for the presentation. Good. Um, we can take. If, if take I could just say, I, I just want to say thank you to yeah. staff for, for really picking up the ball on this when we came to you and um, making this happen um, in a relatively short period of time. And I look forward to continued discussion about additional changes we could make. And if I could also, the, the <coughs> committee that worked on this with Leslie was myself, Sandy and Donna. And um, uh, I think it is remarkable that the local businesses um, aren't opposing it. They're, they're making some kind of uh, practical application comments, but uh, to me, public sentiment and the world is there. <laughs> so it's a matter of doing it. I guess before we take the vote, <coughs> I just also, yeah, during the outreach, it's great if you could just let these businesses know that there are other changes that will be coming um, so that they're not caught off guard as well. So, uh, I just want to express my thank yeah, to thank you. staff, um, both uh, Tiffany and Leslie. Uh, been meeting with us for a long time, for probably almost a year now. So I'm very pleased that we, we're here today. So thank you for you all your work. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. So next item of business is the introduction for publication and ordinance amending section 16.13.020 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code pertaining to penalties for non-payment of city utilities with the presenters Kyle Peterson and Rosemary Menard. I'm going to um, say a couple words and then I'm going to give you Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, for the record, Rosemary Menard, Water Director. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Kyle Peterson, the exemplary customer service manager who manages the um, customer interactions for 25,000 accounts for those folks in our service area who receive multiple <laughs> utility billings from their water, or their water, wastewater, um, and uh, solid waste bill, and then also for our outside city customers who receive water only bills. So, turn this over to Kyle. Good afternoon, Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor, Mayors, Council Members. Um, Kyle Peterson, customer service manager for Santa Cruz Municipal Utilities. We're the clearinghouse for utility services. Um, we provide water, sewer, and garbage utilities to our inside city customers and water only to the outside city customers. As Rosemary said, we manage about 25,000 accounts serving about 100,000 people. Uh, the item before you today is an amendment to Muni Code 1613020. This pertains to the process for shutting off water for non-payment of utilities. Um, this is mostly a housekeeping item, but there are some significant impacts we want you to know about. So um, we're going to dive in here. 
So to, to begin with, I'd like to go over what I call the billing to shut off life cycle. Um, when our customers sign up for utility service, they uh, agree to pay for that service. We bill in arrears, so the service has, has been used. We bill on a monthly basis. Um, and fortunately, 91% uh, of our customers pay that utility bill um, by the time it's, it's issued and before the, before the due date. Um, our due date is at about 28 days. Um, if they don't pay at that point, they'll, they'll get a first notice or a late notice. Um, another 6% of our customers pay after receiving that notice. If they don't pay at that point, um, customers will receive a final notice or a 48-hour notice. Um, you might have seen these around town. They're a pink notice that's left uh, at the door of the service location. Um, and then after that, if we don't receive payment, we, we have about a little less than 1% of our customers who end up on the shutoff list every month. It's about 150 customers a month. Um, about equal thirds at that point pay the bill at the last minute, set up a payment arrangement with us, or are shut off. So today we're really talking about these three phases of this life cycle with this change to the state law. Um, it affects the first notice, final notice, and shutoff process. So our Muni code is currently referencing the California Public Utilities Code for the shutoff process. The PUC has been superseded by the Health and Safety Code, and so we need to amend the Muni code to point to the Health and Safety Code to align, to align with state law. So a little bit about the state law. Uh, Senate Bill SB 998 was introduced in February and passed into law on September 28th. 2018, it amends this, the health and safety code and becomes effective February 1st. And it was introduced by Senator Bill Dodd with the intent to standardize the water shutoff process and protect low income customers. So mostly what I wanna tell you about today is, is how this is gonna affect our, our process uh, from our current practice to what we'll be doing according to state, state law. And the three main areas we wanna focus on are the, the payment arrangements, noticing itself, and then the shutoff process. So with the payment arrangements, the state law is going to offer up an additional five months to um, pay to avoid shutoff. So our current practice is to um, provide up to an extra month to pay before uh, we shut off and the health and safety code pushes that out to an, an additional five months. The other, the other big change is the noticing requirement. So in our current practice, when someone is late and they get that first late notice, that notice only goes to the account holder. That account holder could be a landlord who gets the bill in Fresno but it's for a service address here in town. So the law requires us now to send a late notice to both the account holder and the occupants at the service address. That final notice, the pink notice I was talking about, that always goes to the service address to the affected parties. <coughs> the other big change here is the extension of the shutoff date. So our current practice is to shut off around day 55. So if bill generation is day zero, and it's due on 30, it's shut off at 55. The health and safety code is pushing that out to day 90. <coughs> so the big question that I'm wondering about and pretty much all utilities throughout California are wondering about is, is what's, what's gonna be the impact here? The big question is does more time result in fewer shutoffs? We, we really don't know yet and, and we'll have to see what happens. If it does, Fewer shutoffs is gonna mean less noticing, lower costs for printing and postage, and additional operational capacity. Uh, if more time doesn't result in fewer shutoffs, then 
the delinquency at that point of shutoff, because it's pushed out now, is gonna be higher. There's been more bills that have been produced over that time. Uh, there'll be n potentially more noticing, higher costs with that, and more time spent um, tracking these balances over time. So we're watching this closely, as I'm sure all utilities will be. So this is just to summarize, um, the Muni code is currently pointing at the PUC. It needs to reference the health and safety code and the three big changes there are the extension of payment arrangements, the noticing to occupants and extended shutoff date. If you have any questions, happy to hear them. Thank you. Are there any questions by council members? Council member Matthews. Yeah, I'm curious, um, my assumption would be that most of the seriously delayed and actual shutoffs are due either to vacant properties or um, extreme economic circumstances. Is that a correct understanding? May, it, it probably doesn't matter even, but um, I'm just wondering in cases where there is economic hardship, and maybe that's a couple steps up also, is there uh, <coughs> any practice in the department to refer to community resources for assistance. That's the simplest way to put it. Yeah, we do. We, we maintain a list of those resources and we do refer our customers uh, to them. We don't know the status of, um, say, the Catholic Charities at the time or the other forms of assistance, but we, we keep a list of those phone numbers and uh, refer those out. We don't really, we don't collect any economic information on the customer. So we, we, there's no way to kind of correlate why, yeah, it would you know, shutoffs are happening. Anecdotal impressions, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Council Member Crone. Yeah, um, have you done the, the math? Like you said that 150 every billing cycle, a third of those actually pay before they get shut off. <clears throat> so it's 100 shutoffs? Um, it's it's about 50 a month. 50 a month. Yeah. And so, and then, yeah. how many of those 50 have come back to you and paid their delinquent fees and gotten, you know, clean bill of health, or versus sure. who never came back? Sure. Most shutoffs um, are restored probably within less than a day. So. Um, most people get shut off and we usually hear, hear from them before we close um, and they pay a restoral fee and are back on and, and, and brought current. Um, some of, you know, a smaller portion are um, vacancies where we've shut off and then we, we never hear from the customer again and that becomes a write-off that goes to collections. So if the house it's, say it's a house and they take advantage of the five months and don't pay anything and then they leave, do the people who occupy the house afterwards, do they have to pay to, to get no. it up to, they don't. If there's no. a new, per, new um, tenant, then it's. That's right. So that's, that's where I could see people taking advantage of us on that kind of thing. Right. But. And we actually um, presented this at the Water Commission about a week ago and that, that sort of scam came up as you know, people would stop paying their utility bill. If they knew they were moving out in six months, they'd stop paying now and just let it accumulate. And that apparently that has been going on in some other places with different kinds of um, collection programs, what have you. Any other questions? Okay. I'd like to open it up to the public for public comment. If there's any member of the public who'd like to speak on this item, <sighs> I'd like to ask you, please line up to the left and you'll have two minutes on this item. So please come forward. Hi, I'm Nate Alex Kennedy at Gmail, uh, three four six nine eight eight eight. Uh, what I got to say about this water shutoff, I th personally they they were saying it was getting extended to ninety days. I even support one hundred and twenty days because water is the essence of life. Everybody needs water. We could cut off the electricity. We could cut off the cable or whatever, uh, the, the, all these other utilities, and people will be sitting fine. I, I mean, in the dark, but still. But as far as the water goes, you know, everybody needs to drink. Everybody, <clears throat> most, just about all food has a lot of water in it as part of its composition. And it's one of those things where it's kind of a life and death matter where people need their water. 
But at the same time, the water companies need their money too. I won't argue that. And uh, I just think more, the, if anything, we need to make the extensions of how long before a actual shutoff happens to be extended. And then, um, your name? Kyle. 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 Um, <laughs> one of the things though with the, with the water being shut off is that uh, it, I, he was, there was the first stage and, and final stage of the collections. I think they should add another stage to it, one in between. And uh, you know, while I think the water shouldn't be shut off, if somebody drags it out and drags it out and drags it out, uh, fines and interest and stuff like that should be applied because we need uh, financial motivation to keep the water running, but still, I I think that uh, we need to have these extensions as long as reasonably possible because everybody needs water, everybody, regardless of whether they paid the bill. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this item? Or oh, you have two minutes. Happy New Year and congratulations and stuff. Um, just, uh, I know it's difficult on data, but the <coughs> correlation with the, the low income and not having that data, but that data set um, with just knowing whether those are people who, um, whether section eight for that household more often get their water shut off or something like that, like how that correlation does work seems really important on, um, whether it is solvable, whether it's something that a different sort, uh, something extra, some little extra step in there uh, might be able to help. Just wanted to throw that out. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to speak on this item? Have two minutes. Uh, just real quick, if uh, if there happen to be changes in someone's economic situation, maybe they lose their job and they're they. Uh, can't afford their water bill. I would hope that there might be, um, I'm as assuming that there's some sort of uh, amnesty programs or, or, or low income discount <coughs> kind of programs and things like that. Maybe there's a way that that uh, those people could be educated when <laughs> they get their, uh, with their first notice of late payment that there are, are programs available. Maybe that's already happening. Just would wanna make sure that, that people have every opportunity to uh, enroll in a program that, that, that meets their needs. Thank you. Any other member of the public? Seeing none, we'll return for action deliberation. Councilmember Matthews. Okay, um, obviously we have to comply with state law, but uh, you've given this a lot of thought. And um, I do notice that um, in the staff report, it says that currently the unpaid charges represent less than 0.2% of the billings. So even a little bump will not break us. Um, so uh, given that, and th this, this makes sense, and, and uh, um, obviously the department has some resources for various circumstances, <coughs> I'm gonna go ahead and um, move the recommendation before us for introduction, the introduction of the ordinance. Okay, second. Okay. Motion was made by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Crone to adopt the staff recommendation. Is there any further discussion on this item? Councilmember Brown. I just wanna make a brief comment. Uh, I'm gonna support the motion. We obviously need to comply with state law. And um, I too, I, you know, I share the concerns that uh, members of the public have brought regarding the burden on uh, low income residents, rate payers. Um, unfortunately, we are not in a position to provide subsidy or reduced uh, rates for uh, low income rate payers, um, something that uh, I lament every time we have this conversation about rates. Um, so um, that's not something we can do, but extending the deadline, you know, the timeline for shutoff, I think um, will provide some, well, we'll see, as, as uh, our staff has mentioned, that you know, we don't, we're not sure what the outcome will be, but it could provide some relief to uh, low-income people who are struggling. So um, I'm gonna support the motion. And I just wanted to, to respond and say, if we could, I think I'd be making that, including that in the motion right now. So uh, thank you. So before we move on, is there something that specific to include in the motion or? Do we just no, 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 I was saying if okay. we could, if we could oh, it, would we could. Okay, yeah. okay. Any further questions? Yeah, did, um, what's a reasonable amount of time to for you guys to give us some sense of the effect of this, if any. 
I mean, obviously six months plus. <laughs> um, earlier this uh, today on your agenda, you um, approved a contract for us to do financial and mm -hmm. rate um, services. We will be bringing information back to you quite a bit of it over the next, probably starting about eight or 10 months out. And I think that would be a good time to bring this back because uh, affordability and the what you know the challenges we're going to be dealing with um, in terms of needing to support our capital program versus the um, community's ability to you know support those rates is going to be a good opportunity to be able to tell that story. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, we'll move back for taking action on the staff recommendation motion to consider funding the wall. Oh, <laughs> What's the next item? <laughs> Introduce for publication an ordinance amending section 16.13.020 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code pertaining to penalties for non-payment of city utilities. The motion was made by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Crone. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to our next item. <clears throat> Uh, it's warming. This is item number 28 on the City Council agenda. Warming Center program funding. Uh, presenters Ron Prince, and this was brought. This was recommended by Council Member Sandy Brown. And so um, I'll ask if Ron Prince would like to come up, and then if followed by Council Member um, comments. Thank you, Mayor, uh, members of the Council, Ron Prince, S Special Projects Advisor. Uh, this item uh, came before you, and uh, I actually don't have a, a presentation as much as just to be here to uh, answer any questions you might have, but this is a request for a grant uh, for the warming center. And uh, it's, um, you know, I, I think it's clear that the warming center does good work for the community. And uh, it's just a decision uh, by the council to either make the grant <coughs> or to, you know, filter it through uh, another, uh, a representative like AFC uh, that's worked with the warming center in the past in terms of distribution of funds. But <clears throat> it's strictly up to the council. And if there's no questions, <clears throat> that's fine. But I actually didn't have a presentation planned <clears throat> for this evening. I'd be happy to answer questions. Councilmember Brown. I do have a question. Thank you. Uh, so you <clears throat> mentioned the um, consideration of uh, granting the funds through an intermediary agent, and it looks like in our agenda report, uh, the AFC is not um, at this time um, willing to, to provide that um, intermediary service. So I'm just wondering if you um, if you could say anything more about that. If if there if you have thoughts on other potential um, uh, fiscal sponsors. Actually, I don't have any uh, other thoughts. I just. Uh, talking to uh, board members of uh, AFC, they said that in the past they had, had helped with uh, funding and uh, being sort of a pass through for, to support the warming center. Um, so yeah, that was our only our thought. We don't have any other uh, nonprofits in mind that would uh, have done this in the past on behalf of the warming center, uh, to, to my knowledge. Okay, so I'm just I'm just double checking it. This says that the AFC decided not to act as the intermediary fiscal agent. Right. So you talked, you spoke with them, and they said they've done in the past, but they're not willing to do it now. That's correct. Yeah, they had a uh, all all nine board members decided not to to assume that role, but they all uh, felt that the warming center was was doing good work for the unsheltered community. Are there any other council members? Council member uh, Watkins. Um, I th thank you. I just have a question, and um, I don't know if it's a question that Martine may want to answer or yourself, but we received an email um, in mid-December um, that was forwarded on from Martine in regards to some concerns. I don't know if either of you want to sort of speak to, to that email and or past concerns that I know having been on council have been raised about the warming center. Yeah, I, I can speak to that. No, it was just uh, it was an advisory to uh, to the city manager that uh, right immediately after a, a catch meeting, I had some concerns um, that you know, we had that, you know, acknowledging the good work that the warming center does. <clears throat> I had a concern that about the, the reliability of and the reasonable expectation of having their grant recipient uh, act respectfully to people that, that we do business with. <clears throat> so there was an incident that concerned me 
<laughs> again, I wasn't sure the relevance of that, but I, I did want to share that with us, the city manager. <clears throat> Excuse me. I guess I have a follow-up question because I don't know if you want to elaborate on that because this isn't the first time, Martine, that you've brought forward uh, incidents that have occurred in the past with this organization. I guess the, the um my staff, we have had, you know, we've worked with Brent in, in the past on a variety of issues and the, the uh, I mean, to be completely honest and, and direct, I think if uh, uh, you were to ask us what our recommendation would be, our recommendation would be to, to not, not pursue or, uh, working with Mr. Brent, uh, Mr. Adams at, at this time, uh, given um, our experience uh, with him. And uh, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's not the, Normally, when we work with vendors, you know, it, it, we, we have a, a more professional working relationship with them, um, and it's not, you know, the kind of vendor who we would work with uh, normally. So, just again, to be completely direct and honest, and uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Prince forwarded was uh, an example of, of, of the kind of behavior that we've experienced in the past. Um, but obviously, that's a, a up, completely up to the council. I also acknowledge that uh, the work that he does is, is very good. And I think that's, I hear that across the board. But I think normally, you know, as a city entity, um, we would uh, take into consideration professionalism uh, as well as uh, fiscal accountability and other factors in terms of deciding uh, and uh, awarding a contract to a vendor. Um, and uh, from the staff's perspective, we wouldn't, we wouldn't recommend it, but it's completely up to you. Um, they're doing the work, and that's what we pursued. You know, can we have a fiscal sponsor? Can we do other things to protect the city? The concern really arises around liability and protecting the city from liability. So we looked at uh, providing an indemnification clause in the agreement. So we just came up with approaches to protect the city's interest, uh, but it's ultimately up to you as far as how you want to proceed. Yeah. Vice Mayor Myers. I'm just curious. Um, is, is was were the, were the previous issues related to perform? If you could related to performance, or I mean, the email we received actually talked about, um, uh, really pointed out sort of um, behaviors and some other. Um, uh, I mean, I I was impacted by by what you wrote um, to us, and so I'm just trying to understand: is it a is it a performance issue? Is it a um, standard of, of sort of um, how we would typically want, you know, one of our one of our vendors to be able to not only treat um, the, the individuals who may be using the service, but also um, volunteers, staff, um, other <coughs> city staff, including it, it, as well. I'm just I'm just trying to get a sense of. It, it, it related so how to, high is our to life professionalism. <laughs> it related to professionalism and uh, Mr. Brent's approach to working with, with staff, essentially. And um, is we that haven't staff contracted with, with him city previously. Staff, or is it yes. with staff of the warming center? Uh, city, or, staff. Oh, city staff. City staff. As far as our own, again, going on our own direct uh, experiences uh, with uh, Mr. Adams. Uh, and this was one example that uh, Mr. Prince highlighted, uh, but there have been other examples as well. I, I have one, I'm sorry, I have one sure. additional question, if I may, Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to process, um, given that there's sort of a, a process around um, safety net services uh, through CORE and the um, set-aside funding, would that be more um, aligned with general standard practice that if you're gonna fund a service, usually it kind of fits within the realm of safety net services already potentially funded, as opposed to just a contract without kind of any kind of grant. There's no real grant obligations, outcomes, or um, expectations of what will be done with the money. Uh, my understanding is generally that comes with those grant flows and processes. Does that sound accurate? Well, I think normally, yes, when the council considers you know funding for any, um, uh, particularly social service provider, it's typically done in the context of the community programs process uh, and the funding that's set aside for that. I think in this particular case, this was motivating the, the need, was it just had to do with the, the homeless crisis and, and the need to be responsive. So that was, was motivating, I believe, the council to provide <coughs> services. Um, and uh, But generally, yes, I mean, when, when, when considering funding various nonprofits, it, there's a process that we go through. Uh, but there have been examples of when a need arises as well that the council considers and, and awards contracts depending on, on what the need is. So that's something that you, can, it's up to you. Um, 
I do have one last follow-up question. Also in the agenda packet, it states that the county no longer funds the program as well. Do you have any insight as to why they don't fund the program? Uh, my understanding from their interactions and, and Ron can add to this is they, they expressed uh, there was some uh, related to fiscal uh, management concerns. Yeah, frankly, yeah, I don't have any details about that. I just know that there was a, a, a contract in South County that they either didn't renew or, or uh, decided not to fund. But uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have any information about that actually. Um, but clearly, uh, to your point, uh, uh, Council Member Watkins, uh, you know, certainly w if we draw up a letter and an indemnification clause and requirement for insurance and all that, we could list, you know, some kind of performance measures uh, that are consistent with the services that uh, the warming center provides. Um, I think at the time this came up, we didn't actually have a shelter uh, solution for the winter. We didn't have the armory uh, available to us. So um, I'm not sure if that was one of the compelling reasons to get this on the agenda, but, um, you know, circumstances have changed, but uh, yeah, we, I think Martin said it best, yeah, but it has to do with just making sure that our partners and grant recipients, uh, you know, are, uh, can meet expectations in terms of uh, professionalism and, and cooperation with other people that we deal with. Councilmember Matthews. Well, uh, the staff is correct. This is our decision. And um, there is obviously a need um, for, um, shelter services across a range of um, individuals and uh, many people are served by the warming center, but personally I do not feel comfortable entering into a grant relationship um, with Mr. Adams. Um, we did get a very strongly worded um, statement from um, Mr. Prince uh, in December uh, about a pretty shocking interaction with a visiting professional who was here to advise the cash. Um, we have uh, very reliable information on troubling interactions of Mr. Adams with clients, with employees of the warming center, with other city staff and with community members. And this is not new. Um, he may offer a valuable service, but uh, for reasons of um, not just fiscal sponsorship, but oversight and quality, uh, I'm personally simply not able to uh, support entering into a, a contract. Um, so um, uh, depending on where others are going, I would just uh, move that we take no action on this item. Well, we're gonna, yep. We yeah, to, okay, yeah, sure. but. Okay, yep, yeah. noted. Uh, are there any other questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you, Ron Prince, for your presentation. I'll open up to the public for comment. Um, if there are members of the public who would like to comment, I'd like to ask that you please line up to my left and you'll have two minutes. Before, before the member of the public speaks, I'll just add that I received your email late yesterday. I'll give you I'll grant you four minutes this time, but in the future, we'll need to receive emails by by the end of Sunday, by before the workday on Monday. But I'll grant you that request to speak for four minutes and at the end of public comment. Hi, I'm Nate Kennedy, and what I gotta say about the Warming Center, this is a mission critical program that uh, every, every year we get really freezing nights, people out in the streets die because it's too cold all the time. And uh, we, we need something to help uh, mitigate this. And I think the warming center is one of the best solutions. And if funding wise, if anything, we need to give them more funding, a lot more funding than they have right now. And the, uh, the only other real criticism I have with the way the warming center is run is that they have to wait until it gets really, really cold. And I think the, the minimum before they open up uh, should be several degrees higher, like five degrees or whatever. Just so, because I've had talked to people who somebody needed to use a phone, so I let them use mine to, uh, to call up and find out when the warming center was. This was a really cold night too. I mean, I was shivering and the person, the operator at, I think it was two and one, basically said, oh, uh, it's not quite cold enough. We're not gonna have the warming centers open. Uh, too bad, bye. 
Um, and we can't have that. If, you know, I just, I think that uh, this is a great program run by great people and it saves lives. Remember that. Thank you. Next speaker. Hey again. Um, I definitely hear what you're saying about <clears throat> the challenges of dealing with Brent and Brent and I have some history there and that's okay. And I definitely get the outcomes. Um, I was, it, it's hard to talk about that letter of December that you guys got because it wasn't public record. I heard about it so I can respond to it, but public should be able to read that if that's something we're talking about. Um, I was at that event and absolutely was obnoxious, was not threatening anybody. And the obnox there was significant instigation from one of our co-chairs, which really made it a whole bunch worse. Not to say that his behavior is okay, I'm not saying that. Louder than his, didn't slam anything, but oh yeah, absolutely obnoxious. Um, that service, though, is something that's really valuable and we don't have that much of, and adding 20 beds at the armory really isn't that much on our bigger scale, though I'm appreciative that we have an extra 20 beds. Um, if you uh, do agree with the, the amount of money, I think you would probably agree to not being the present person at any staff meetings or something and sending a representative, he'd probably agree to that. Um, and to have some agreed use of funds and agreed outcomes, I think is completely legitimate rather than $10,000 and then it actually doesn't get cold enough this winter to actually do anything else. So actually getting something from that 10,000. Um, and a lot of, some of our programs in Santa Cruz don't actually have a grievance policy, which is something I'm trying to get from some of the other shelters too. So putting into the contract that there should be some grievance policy and maybe some sort of report on filed grievances over a year and stuff like that. Sort of a standard operating thing for nonprofits running shelters. That's it. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, oh, my name's Maureen Davidson. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. And uh, I've been a volunteer and a supporter of the Warming Center since its inception. Um, and over, I'm quite, dumbfounded, frankly, coming to this meeting and hearing people speak to uh, a body that's sitting in judgment um, about kind of unspecified, uh, you know, we, well, we, you know, we all know kind of what we're talking about, but we don't know what you're talking about. And um, I really don't like that star <coughs> chamber kind of feeling, but nevertheless, here we are. And uh, I do want to say that the, um, what I have been present for is um, Brent uh, facing some really challenging um, situations and uh, pulling it off with what I consider prof professionalism uh, in that he didn't lose his cool and things were resolved. Um, I've been there while he's feeding quarters into a, um, washing machine slot, which he does every Wednesday uh, with volunteers and um, significant amount of money spent. Um, I've been there when he has um, been serving soup and all of that sort of stuff. Anyway, um, I just wanna say I, um, as an elder now, um, I get to say that because I just got a new hip for Christmas. Um, as an elder now, I have noticed, very very moved, moved to notice that uh, many of the people on the streets are elder, elder than me even, and uh, it's a crime, and we have to do something. Thank you. Next speaker. There. Uh, I was also at this catch meeting with the supposed, well, I guess there, there was uh, 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 a lot of uh, arguing and things like that. Um, I didn't think it ar arose to the level of, of um, anything that, that would prevent me from wanting to support a good program. And I think, uh, I think someone expressing their First Amendment rights at a public meeting to talk about what they feel is really important to uh, the way that uh, our systems work and things like that. I think someone should have the right to do that and not uh, 
I worry that, that that's going to jeopardize the, the potential funding for a, a, a program that they run or that we need in our community. Um, I think there's a lot of um, ways that we could mitigate some of the, the concerns um, with insurance and uh, sending representatives if people don't feel comfortable doing business with, a, with uh, a particular individual. I think there's certainly ways around conflicts of personality. And I don't think we should let conflicts of personality get in the way of, of uh, providing a, a very needed service, that, uh, especially this winter when we're lacking um, so much in, in terms of, of shelter capacity compared to years in the past. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Hi, Candace Elliott, co-chair of The Catch. I'm just here as a normal person though right now. Um, so I was also at this meeting um, that we're all talking about. And uh, what I saw and what I see is that the public has outrage and frustration and anger and that presentations happen and it triggers them. And they speak out for what they believe. Um, I don't think that excuses the behavior, being on the receiving end of it. You know, it affected me deeply and personally and emotionally, and it took me a while to work through it. Um, but I went and met with Brent after this and saw the storage facility and learned more about the program. And I also believe that he's doing a lot of good in this community and that um, he is fulfilling emergency needs where there, there currently isn't enough funding. And I'm not gonna tell you, you know, whether or not you should fund the program, but I agree that it is meeting important needs for the community and also, you know, Brent can be a difficult person to deal with. <laughs> um, so thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there any other member? Good evening, Scott Graham. Um, I've watched Brett down through the years, uh, first as an advocate, and he would he actually spent time going up into the Pacific Northwest to investigate how other cities were handling homeless people's uh, needs. And he came back and tried to convince the city and the county to try some of these things, and. That was to no avail. And so he finally started his own program. And he's doing this on a shoestring budget, which proves a couple things. That you don't have to spend $1.2 million to help 100 people. And you don't have to run the, the program like a prison camp in order to help people. So I would advocate that you not only fund him to the 10,000, but maybe 15 or $20,000. Because he, what he's doing right now is preventing people from dying on the streets. We had 30 some people die last year on the streets. And then that number would have been higher without Brent. And this year it would also be higher if it wasn't for his program. So I think it's, it's, incumbent on you to fund this program. Thank you. All right. Seeing no other members of the public who'd like to speak on this item, I'd like to bring it back for action and deliberation. Oh, Brent, sorry, yeah. uh, Brent Adams. And um, I, I, I can make my presentation, but to speak about some of these accusations and what happened in the catch would eclipse my four minutes. Can I please have a few minutes just to answer some of these charges that have been been brought up. I've never actually been able to defend myself against some of the things that uh, Ms. Matthews has, has said ever. These are charges against my character and my ability to run programs, but I have never been able to defend myself. People can raise these issues uh, to this day. Even, Brent, so, may I? I'm going to give you, because of the fact that I didn't get your four minutes All right. in time, I'm going to have to hold you the four minutes today. Um, but I would encourage you to reach out to other council members, given that you've been able to hear their perspectives now and try to find the time to meet with them to discuss that further. Okay, I'm gonna talk fast. 
So we uh, obviously, as a nonprofit, uh, working with the county and uh, all of, we have, we've worked with five churches. We have a million dollars of nonprofit insurance, so that's fine. So I appreciate that. Um, also, we do have a grievance pro process. I appreciate Serge for saying that. Um, uh, we have, uh, this is our sixth year, and the reason we're doing this is because people die on the street. There is no uh, program to, to bring people in. There's no priority within the city or the county to bring people with mobility challenges or mental health challenges off the street. When we open, we have lines of wheelchairs and walkers. If you were to be the warming center director, you would be very angry many different times also. I yelled at Martin Bernal in a street intersection two winters ago because you, remo you didn't have any winter shelter at all to speak of, not anything. And, and, and Chris Crone and uh, Sandy Brown didn't say anything either. I was very frustrated. So very many times I'm frustrated. Also in this catch, finally it was a member of the, I can't remember the, uh, it's a federal government uh, agency touting housing first uh, and permanent supported housing. And so they wanted to hear from the public. So I said, I've been to 40 cities, housing first as a model isn't working anywhere. And I was very terse and frustrated. There's no funding for housing first. So these are issues that I've been calling out. And I, am, I do run a nonprofit that uh, undergirds basic needs, storage. We, didn't, we seem not to care about storage, laundry, showers, a whole bunch of things that you say you care about, but we actually run a nonprofit that is bottom lining these things. Not one person needs to walk around with storage anymore. You know how much money we've saved the city and how we've increased, increased the benefit of the tourist and business district in the, our, all of our lives because of the storage program or because of the warming center on the freezing nights there aren't wheelchairs like there are tonight in doorways. We have to massively transformed the experience of the city. You've not once acknowledged it and any time you have to say something negative about you, me, we, you will. These allegations that you may have heard about, they're, they're hearsay and we don't have one complaint from one of our clients and one authentic complaint from, a, from a, 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 an employee that have been able to actually uh, answer. I've never seen the report myself and you wanna talk about it, I will sue for defamation, it's getting close. Okay, let's ch change gears now. Warming Center, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have to, we opened uh, on a rainy night for 90 people. When we do get a cold slap, the reason we came into existence as a warming center is because we had 10 nights of freezing or colder temperature. What are you gonna do? The city, the county does not have a plan. So we started the warming center as an extreme, not a cold, not a very cold, but an extreme weather situation. We raised our temperature from, from four years ago at 32 degrees, now we're up at 38 degrees with community support. Last year, you gave us $5,000 and a gate in our fence. You were totally willing to work with us last year. There's no no problem with working with a nonprofit that's that's well vetted. Um, so what we're trying to say is this year because there's so few shelter beds and we're going to be in real trouble if we get real frost that I have to open in two locations. That's the only reason I'm standing here. I need help because I have to hire another another uh, management type person. I can't I can't trust a volunteer uh, uh, to 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 o open another another location. Last last year we had county funding, so I did hire this person. So we're actually understaffed this year and doing way more. Uh, we didn't reduce our temperature threshold with a lack of funding, we held it. Um, again, the storage program, laundry program, and now showers and all the donation materials. I have a hotline that, that, that 246-1234 that people call nightly and we deliver blankets. The work that we're, we have thousands of dollars of tarps, hand warmers, ponchos. These are not things from our budget. They come directly from my salary, which is a pittance. So if you don't think, if you don't think it's appropriate to give the warming center $10,000, uh, we have a serious issue here. Thank you. I'd like to bring back this item for discussion and deliberation, Council Member Glover and then Brown. So I'll just start with the motion. I'd like to move, um, I'd like to move, Member Glover, before you start, there was a motion that was made before. What? The, it wasn't the, an actual motion. Yeah, oh, was okay. okay. Motion. Sorry about that. Then no, it's okay. I'm glad that was clarity. Um, I'd like to move uh, for the City Council to approve $15,000 of funding to the Warming Center program. Second. And then can I continue? So uh, there's a lot that's coming up for me with this. Um, so uh, Brent and I have had our own run-ins uh, here and there. Totally understand 
that. I think everyone has run-ins with people over time, especially in dealing with a topic that's as tense and severe as the human rights violations that we have going on in our city and in the dire situations that people are experiencing on the street. However, <clears throat> I don't think, and I think that someone said it very uh, eloquently in the public comment, is that conflicts of personality shouldn't, be, shouldn't get in the way of providing a very needed service. Uh, Mr. Adams supports laundry service, as was mentioned, so storage service, which is a very commendable program, and now uh, showers, so that can't be dismissed. Also, uh, the woman I spoke about a couple meetings ago who called me on Thanksgiving weekend uh, might have died if it hadn't been for Mr. Adams and his warming center program. Uh, I think that is something that needs to be taken into consideration, especially with the amount of people that he serves on such a small budget. Um, I've spoken with longtime volunteers of Mr. Adams, and they've expressed uh, nothing but their appreciation for the program, as well as his leadership. Uh, and especially with the way that he creates the space. Um, he's intentionally, and this was a report directly from multiple volunteers, is the intention that he takes in creating a space that's not only welcoming for people, but that is kind to them. You know, they talk about instead of having large overhead lights that are neon fluorescent, he intentionally strings uh, Christmas lights up so that there's lighting, but so that when they wake up, they're not shook awake at five o'clock in the morning with iridescent lights, or the way that he wakes people up in the morning by touching their fingers and speaking to them softly instead of shaking them and uh, ordering them to get up and get on a bus. Uh, I think all of that is something that we should be uh, focusing on, uh, as well as I just have to say, it's really disconcerting. Um, it was really disconcerting initially when I got that email that we keep referencing from the city manager forwarded from Mr. Prince, uh, but I think it's even more disconcerting to have that email not included in the staff report and then paraded out in public uh, without any context or without allowing the public to review it ahead of time and then using that as well as insinuations as a reason why we shouldn't fund a program that is actively saving lives. And it seems to be a pattern uh, with certain members of th this body specifically, where instead of dealing with problems or conflicts directly, like we heard from the co-chair, which I want to, of the catch, which I want to give uh, some com com commendation to, to process the conflict and then be willing to go and meet with Mr. Adams to learn more about the program and then come and advocate for the program. I think that shows a lot of strength and dedication to the issue of homelessness. Uh, I'd love to see that more here with members of the city council, where instead of us uh, holding on to reservations and then bringing them out in a public forum, borderlining, as Mr. Adams said, on defamation of character, uh, to contact the person that we have a problem with and try and work through the problems to get to reconciliation so that we can have a solution, as opposed to instead of barring funding, which we are not offering the services. We are not offering storage, we're not offering laundry, we're not offering showers, all services that Mr. Adams is doing, as well as a warming center. And if we're not gonna do it and we don't have a service provider to do it, why are we figuring out reasons why we can't support the program instead of working through the conflict to figure out ways that we can support the program? So I would highly encourage my colleagues on this body to put aside your preconceived notions or your hesitations, approve the funding, and then work towards reconciliation with Mr. Adams and anyone else that you have a problem with in the community or in this organization. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins, <coughs> Councilmember Brown, and then I'll also have a comment on this. Do you want to go first? Go ahead. Okay. Um, one of the things that just sort of comes to mind for me in terms of process is uh, the Community Programs Committee uh, most recently met to talk about the set-aside funding, which we have essentially 45,000 available for, looking at a number of other sort of social service safety net type programming in terms of needing funding. Um, and that will likely come back uh, in the next several meetings, if not the next meeting, the following meeting in terms of how we wanna allocate those dollars. I feel like in terms of process, that's where this would fit personally, that if we're willing to fund a certain amount for one safety net program, um, I think we wanna keep it in the context of all the applications around safety net services and current needs. So for me, I would feel more comfortable postponing any conversation around funding and process. I'd like to see outcomes. I'd like to see what the dollars are, done, are used for. I'd like to see, um, 
efforts around how we can work with behaviors and such like that, I think that needs to be worked out. I think that some of the expectations that are generally written into some of the, con the um, RFPs, right, in terms of wanting to receive funding. So I think for me, this sort of is a standalone, as a, a sort of outside what we already have in terms of an existing process for these set aside funding type needs. So that's personally where I stand at this time on this particular topic. Councilmember Brown. Uh, um, so there's a couple of things I want to respond to, and then just kind of make talk about where I'm at. So in turn, I, I appreciate uh, Council Member Watkins, your point about uh, thinking about how we do community programs funding in the, con the overall context. Um, and, you know, I, I'm very, uh, having been on that committee and talked with, you know, all of the nonprofits in this community that we try to support and there's never enough funding and um, it's really challenging to make those decisions. Part of the reason that I made this recommendation is because I feel like um, this program is, um, and the, the service that this program provides is really different than um, kind of the, the overall mix of community programs that we fund. This is, is really about, and, and my intention was about the service that we have not been able to find a way to provide elsewise um, that is actively saving lives. I mean, I think that that is something that for me is, um, is really critical, and so when it comes to the, the question of, you know, uh, prickly mm, uh, personalities and and the challenges that uh, arise in the in the public sphere, um, discussions that are had behind the scenes, I agree that um, you know we ought not to be uh, judging, you know, casting judgment from here um, without. Uh, being, you know, transparent about uh, the concern. So I think that um, I can say, you know, I've I've experienced it that um, Mr. Adams can be prickly, <laughs> and um, I, um, you know, it's not always comfortable for me. But I guess I'm I've been trying to weigh that against the um, the need for services that are, are so critical that no one else is providing. And I will say that um, when it, with respect to the public input that we received, we've received about the warming center, it has almost entirely been in support of this program. So this is, this is coming from volunteers who have showed up um, in tonight and on other occasions. Um, others who have tried to support the program, I mean, Paul Lee and Herb Schmidt, who have been um, at this for a very long time, <laughs> thanking us for um, recognizing that this is a critical need. Um, you know, it's, it's very hard for me to um, just put all of that aside because there are some challenges. Um, so, so I'd really like to find a way to um, move forward to address some of these concerns. And, you know, I'd like to um, consider, I, I do want to um, support the warming center. I do think that um, trying to address some of the concerns related to um, use of the funds, performance, I mean, I have no doubt that these, having gone to the, the program, having talked with people who um, volunteer and talked with people who have stayed um, at the you know warming center sites, uh, that th this is money well spent. I, I don't doubt that at all, um, but I do understand that we have, you know, some, uh, you know, fiduciary responsibilities, and we also have responsibilities for, you know, contracting with um, responsible contractors. So I would like to um, find a way to to provide this funding. I think that um, trying to find an intermediary. I mean, the AFC, the uh, Associated Faith Communities has is not willing to be an intermediary at this time, but they did send a letter of support for the program. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to think of a way that we might be able to find an intermediary, find um, somebody who could work um, with the, the city and with the warming center to bring us, uh, you know, a set of, um, you know, uh, goals, outcomes, you know, performance metric, you know, and then metrics that can be used to, um, determine how, you know, the, make sure that the funds are being used as they um, ought to be used. So I, I'm trying to think about how we might do that. It's good to hear you have a liability insurance, but, um, and so you may, you don't really need a fiscal sponsor, but some kind of intermediary who, who could kind of work, help us work through the challenge. And um, maybe that's, you know, the catch could take 
um, responsibility if, if they're, you know, if we could direct them to kind of work through that and um, provide, you know, um, recommend the funding with that caveat. So I'm just, you know, I'm just noodling around here trying to figure out a way to, to make this work and um, kind of address some of the concerns that have been raised, but also, um, you know, provide a critical service. So I'd just like to say that um, one of the things I'm uncomfortable with now having reviewed the agenda and then just the way that we're bringing this forward, one of the things that I'm concerned with is that there's no clear way to measure accountability with these funds, how they're gonna be used, what they're supposed to be allocated for, and being someone who has submitted numerous grant proposals, there's generally an explanation as to how the money's gonna be used. And what we have right here, and the value that's been increased to $15,000 is just to go to this program without any actual stipulations for how the funding should be used. And so that's something that I'm, that first and foremost, I'm concerned with. I do agree that the Warming Center provides critical services that the, um, the city isn't able to provide on a very uh, low budget. And, and, but I also understand the concerns that has been expressed around interactions that city staff um, has had with Mr. Adams and the way that um, other folks in the community have had interactions. So there's this positive and negative, and, and the trade-off is that we want to support um, good programs in our community that are providing a good service. But I think that at this moment, what I feel needs to be clearer before we move forward is, um, one, there is this expression of need for there to be an intermediary, um, and two, just the fact that um, there isn't a clear explanation as to how these funds are gonna be used. So if we were to move forward with either 10,000 or 15,000, I would only feel comfortable after receiving some kind of explanation as to and proposal for how the funding would be spent down and what would be the reporting, on, like timeline for reporting and um, what will we expect in a report out in with regards to the use of these funds. And I think that's something that we require of a lot of the nonprofits within our community and that we need to hold everyone to the same standard. Um, so if that's something that, you know, I can't make a motion, but if that's something that could go to the catch or if that is a friendly amendment um, that this could come back after we receive some kind of explanation and breakdown of, um, like how this money will be spent down, what would be a reporting process, I'd be much more comfortable with supporting this and, and finding an intermediary for these funds. Uh, and I have on deck Vice Mayor Myers and I'll put uh, Council Member Glover and then. No, I, and then, I have a comment too when the council's ready. Okay. So, well, a couple things. Um, Mr. Adams, I uh, received your email. Um, obviously, I think it came in yesterday, but um, I will, in all uh, uh, openness, say I have not visited your your um, services or your facilities or things, and I and I certainly will follow up with you. So um, thank you for the invitation, and I and I certainly will will set up a meeting with you. Um, I think um, similar to the mayor, um, and based on the feedback that we're getting from our staff. Um, I think um, making improvements um, with regards to how we're potentially going to put the, the uh, funding together um, and the contracting together um, is a really, um, is, a, is, a, is an appropriate step at this point in time. Um, and uh, so I would make a friendly amendment to the motion to add those um, those stipulations. So what I understood you were saying was um, there would be a contract with appropriate language, including indemnification and insurance, um, that the services to be provided along with uh, the budget for each service would be spelled out. Um, and um, that um, an intermediary uh, would be established um, as necessary um, to provide um, that oversight as needed. And I think those were the three things. So I would make that as a friendly amendment. And, um, you know, we, we need everyone we can in this community to help us solve this problem. Um, 
but we also need to work together and we need to be cordial and um, respectful of all the processes that we're trying to work through right now. We don't have a clear policy on homelessness coming from the county. We don't have a clear policy on homelessness here in our own community. So um, these are hard conversations and cooler heads prevail and uh, we need to be focused on service, but we have to make sure that um, all of that um, rolls up into um, professional professionalism and um, there's gonna be a lot of hard questions we have to answer moving ahead. And there may be some program services that you know we wanna refocus in the future, but the ultimate goal is we need to really get serious about helping people who are homeless in our community. So, um, so I will make those as friendly amendments and those are my comments. Accepted. Council member, Council member Hawkins and then, and then Matthews. Um, I think, I, I mean, I'll just say I appreciate the interest in having the accountability and transparency and expectations. I just wanna make sure I'm clear on the motion. I guess at this time it's to um, attend, uh, potentially move forward with $15,000 to the warming center given that they're able to meet these uh, criteria. Does that feel accurate? I would prefer to start at 10 yeah. as the original um, proposal was in the staff report personally. And with evaluation based on everything we're here, we've heard, I'd like to start with the original uh, proposal as presented by the staff. So is that a friendly amendment then that you'd like to I make to this? Everything yeah. except for the, the, the uh, quantity change. And we can talk about the quantity as a group right now, but as for right now, not that aspect of the friendly amendment because that wasn't included in the original friendly amendment was the change of the quantity. I mean, just to, in the interest of moving the item, I definitely agree with the requirements. I think that the set aside funding application probably would be a really helpful guide because it's really about current at immediate need and how we can support um, the city. I'll just sort of state it again. We had uh, a lot of requests and a very little amount of money. So it's in the big picture that we wanna kind of keep these things in mind, recognizing that this is a critical need as well. Um, I do feel comfortable with the 10,000 uh, at this time, given that we're gonna have to make cuts for all the others as well. Um, and definitely the regulation or the adopted amendments uh, proposed by the uh, vice mayor. We could split the motion potentially. So yeah, if, if, yeah. if we want, we could split them. Uh, or before that, I'd like to hear Council yeah. Member Crone. I think this is just a drop in the bucket and I, I have been out and visited um, Brent's operation three times. And you know, this is so, it, what he's doing is so true. It takes us $15,000 just to clean up a lot of stuff that's left around this town. And the fact that he's storing so much, so much stuff, just that's one aspect of the program. That in itself is worth, you know, fifteen thousand um, dollars, and I don't know. I just want to put that word out there. I hope we can fund them for fifteen thousand. Uh, I appreciate this discussion a lot. And um, I just wanted to ask for maybe a couple clarifying points um, with regard to the friendly amendment. My understanding was that the uh, attempt to explore the um, uh, the use of a fiscal intermediary was was more or less exhausted by um, city staff. Uh, and so I believe what the, the agreement that <clears throat> is being discussed would be with the warming center, which I heard Mr. Adams say is a registered 501c3 not-for-profit corporation, and that there is also a million dollar comprehensive general liability insurance policy that, that they're insured under and under which the city could be named as an additional insured. Just to be clear, we're talking about a contract with the warming center and then looking to identify um, uh, an entity like the catch that might provide some further oversight. Is that a fair statement? I, I think it's, I guess my amendment would not include the cash personally. I, I don't know how you ask citizen volunteers. volunteers to oversee something like I, this. I, so. I don't disagree with that at all. Yeah, so um, I guess the other part, the other piece was a, a budget and a, and a scope of work or a work plan that would be incorporated into the agreement. Yes, that was the friendly, uh, friendly amendment included those items. Um, and to clarify, um, if an intermediary is not, has not been identified, then um, we would be, uh, I would put, put the amendment uh, language to state that we would be entering into the contract with, with the warming center. Um, and I think um, 
So I'll leave it at that. Member Matthews and Councilmember Glover. Um, this is going from um, just a straight amount with no description um, to a higher amount and some thoughts. Um, I don't think anyone disagrees with with the need. Um, um, Council Member um, um, Watkins mentioned just the process and certainly when we go through <coughs> community programs and CDBG and all our grant programs, um, we do expect to have a scope of work you know, they're, they're registered 501c3, who's their board, et cetera. What's the outcome? So um, I would expect something approaching that format for this. You mentioned the same thing. Um, I don't know what is meant by um, uh, intermediary. I, I mean, we'll, I, you know, there have... Yeah, I think I'll I'm going to be honest. There have been some issues raised, and it's not a matter of a prickly personality because everyone's dealt with prickly personalities in their life. But there have been some, I think, substantive issues raised, and so I do want. I am concerned ab about that. Uh, I, I see a clear direction going here. Um, I think perhaps the motion is to, uh, and I think the burden of the. Um, um, proposal and the uh, oversight component doesn't rest with the city council to invent here. It, um, it is direction to the warming center and supporters to put together a package that answers the issues that have been raised. So um, uh, I would prefer uh, a 10,000, which was what was put on the table originally uh, with uh, expressing the uh, council's um, receptivity to a, um, a proposal in the short term that that meets these, um, that includes these components. That's just how I'm reading the tenor here. Mr. Glover, thank you. So I'm a little confused. Uh, maybe some people can provide me with some clarity as to how we started the conversation of the community programs budget. Because I know that was mentioned by Councilmember Watkins, but the fiscal impact listed in the agenda is that this would come from the general fund. So this has nothing to do with community programs and it has nothing to do with the uh, cutting of other services as was implied by a statement. It looks like there's some, someone wants to say something. Sure. I if, if, I can answer it. Sure, go ahead. The, the general, everything comes from the general fund, essentially. So the mm -hmm. community programs budget is the general fund. So the money that we fund any of the other safety net programs through the general fund of the community programs is the same funding source that we'd be funding Mr. McAdams program. But, but there's other money in the general fund outside of the community programs budget that's not immediately allocated for things why it's in the general fund, correct? Can I answer the question in terms of how our budget? Well, this would have to come from the fund balance. Is, is normally when we um, budget something that's not already been appropriated, it comes from fund balance. But I think the distinction here is really more process versus the funding source. The funding source is, is the same. Mm -hmm. It's just process would be different. Right, but uh, we weren't talking about submitting it to the community programs budget for a review and everything. Well, that's, that, that's what some of the language was insinuating through what she was saying about needing to go through the process and then splitting up the money and taking money from other places. Uh, you're shaking your head no, but. I'm happy to speak to that constituent committee that said it, but essentially we have a process in place that does community program funding. When the community program funding has, has generally gone in a way that's been annual, then we move to the core funding model and absent having that process ensue on a yearly basis, what the council has done in the past and is doing this year is having an annual set aside funding process for emerging and urgent needs. And that was the re those are the re applications that we saw recently in community programs and will be forthcoming in the coming if not in the next meeting, the meeting after. Right. And this is a urgent or emerging need that's a social safety net service that fits many of the other applications. So the alignment in terms of the process of how this need in fits with the other needs that were brought are brought to our attention through that process is essentially the point that I was making. Right, and what I'm saying is I don't understand why there even needs to be that dissertion uh, when we are just going to, could decide right now as a body to fund the program without going through the community programs process and in general. But um, regardless of all of that, um, there was one more point that I was going to make, which is, 
escaping me at the moment, so we can just move. Maybe I'll just respond. The assertion is essentially to have transparency and expectation for dollars, and we could fund anything we want at any moment, um, but ultimately we are stewards of the taxpayer dollar, and we want to have outcomes and those identifiers as accepted by the Friendly Amendment. Which is why I accepted the Friendly Amendment. Exactly. Just so we're on the same page. All right. Council Member Brown. Uh, so what I'm understanding is that the, the I think the, the point that you were ultimately making was that the application that is used for the community program set aside could be a guide. I think you mm -hmm. said the word guide for, so it, it's not putting it back into competition with that pot of money, but using a sim, th the same or similar process to get us to a contract. It was just the, the language that was used was saying, saying that we would have to split it more. And that's when it, that's what caught my ear was like, well, no, we're not having to split the community programs budget for the other emerging needs, but we can move forward. It's clear, thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Myers. Okay, so um, currently my understanding is that there's a motion on the floor uh, by Council Member Glover, seconded by Council Member Crone, to allocate 15,000 to, to the warming center. There's a friendly amendment to add stipulations which would um, have a scope of work, indemnification insurance, um, a budget for service, uh, an intermediary that was stricken. Um, so on um, those two pieces. That's my understanding of the motion that's on the floor. Um, so, Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Glover. Sorry, I just wanted one additional point. I think I heard something about uh, re a reporting, a mm -hmm. uh, some kind of system for reporting on. Yeah. Um, so not just the budget. Our standard, but standard contract. Out outcomes, be, right? Yeah, it would be tasks, mm -hmm. budget, and then some wrap up report based on you know number of people served, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to make that clear for the record. Thank you. Right. Oh, Matthews. Does this come back to us for action? <laughs> I, mean, I, I would assume. Personally, personally, I would assume so, but I would yeah. like to defer to the maker of the motion. Yes, so we can review the application and make sure it's up to our guidelines, I guess, and then move forward on it. I'm not sure we can talk about it right now as to whether or not that's the direction that we want to go. It's the first time we've brought it up. I think that the idea is that if you want this to come back to us for I review uh, and approval, then that is something that can be included in the motion. I, I want for us to be able to fund the program so that we can have uh, the services that are in place. Now, whether or not the process of the warming center creates the outline and then submits it to the city manager's office and they approve it if it hits the benchmarks that are set off by us tonight and removes the need for it to come back to another agenda and through another one of these processes, then I'm totally down for that because I wanna streamline the process so that we can get the money to the people that are in need right now. Um, but if we, uh, in a discussion right now, say like, you know, maybe we should have it come back again, then sure, we can add that to the thing, but I wanna discuss it before I go like, yeah, absolutely, let's do it. And uh, I, my previous thought had come back to me because I want to acknowledge the statements of some of the colleagues uh, about the change in the amount, feeling more comfortable with the 10,000 instead of the 15,000. Uh, I moved to the 15,000 because uh, one, this is sorely overdue. Two, we're almost through some of the harshest months and we want, we want to make sure that we're getting them the funding they need. And also, when we need to find money for projects, we find money for projects. I mean, last year we allocated way too much money, in my opinion, to the redevelopment of a, a lodge up at the golf course. Uh, this is something that's far more deserving of the money, and I think we should be prioritizing that, in, in my opinion. Councilmember Matthews, and then Vice Mayor Myers. <laughs> Those are apples and oranges, but to this point, uh, we always approve contracts for services. We always approve the, uh, the core funding, the CDBG, the community program. So that's standard procedure. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm trying, just trying to offer a, a it's, it's a budget kind of, amendment. I'm yeah. kind of trying to offer a little bit of a wrap up here. So um, if we brought this back for action, um, is there a way that we could um, Am I hearing, um, Council Member Glover, that you, are you, you want to get this done tonight, that's what I'm hearing. No, I want to get it done as soon as possible. It can't be done tonight because we need to have the response from the warming center with some of the stipulations that we're putting in place, but if we can streamline it and have it go through the city manager's office for approval as opposed to having it come back in front of us again, unless we want to prioritize it for the next city council agenda, in which case if the mayor is feeling 
open to making sure it's on the next city council agenda and the warming center is able to provide that documentation within the next two weeks or week and a half, uh, three days or something, I guess, for the, for the agenda, then. I'm not, a, I'm not, um, not because this isn't an urgent issue, totally. but I'm not comfortable with the fact that we need to have an agenda report done by Thursday for this. Mm -hmm. And there's a very little uncertainty around, you know, we need to get the contract um, we need to actually have the contract written out. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that it's okay. Then we need to send it out to the provider. The provider needs to bring us the feedback. I don't think that that's an appropriate timeline. However, I do understand the urgency that you'd like to see this. I mean, because otherwise we're going to we're looking at maybe first meeting in February, but that's another month away, and then that's going to impact the ability of the warming center to provide the services that we're all up here saying are <laughs> crucial and needed for the city. So I think that's partial reason why, for example, I would rather see the funding be less so that. Um, by the time that funding gets kicked in and gets allocated, that it actually is gonna reflect the amount of services that the warming center will still be providing during that point in time, rather than allocating um, more than what might be needed, because then we'll be giving money to a program and it won't be getting used towards this, the services that we need. I'll push back a little bit on you there, just because we're not just talking about offering a warming center for people to warm themselves, we're talking about laundry, storage, and showers, which are gonna be needed throughout the year, regardless of the season. Is that, is that the, I think the problem is this, the, the report is, is, is difficult, because we, we don't know what the services are gonna be for. Um, and I don't know if, um, in conversations with Mr. Adams, I don't know if it was staff or council members or who, but we basically got no information. And so, um, I mean, we, we got a, a price tag, but we didn't get anything else. And so, in the interest of um, trying to move this forward, um, I think I'm hearing that there's interest in making sure that this is done right. And I think that the interest in doing that is reflective to both um, our uh, immediate, you know, our uh, responsibility, but also to um, have our vendor have that piece uh, of information for him to manage this budget towards. So I, I, I think somehow we've got to um, basically bring it back. Um, I don't see getting, getting, um, yes. Concurrence mm -hmm. on it tonight, the earliest so. possible meeting. Yeah. Sure. Let's put it that yeah. way. Yep. Yeah, that works. Okay, I can add that to the agenda. Uh, earliest possible meeting or first meeting in February? Say earliest possible meeting. So if it couldn't, if it can't, well, that's going to be the first one. But yeah. hopefully, yeah. yes, and that'll all de be dependent on saving the application and among. Okay. Along with a number of other factors. I'll, I'll okay. accept that. Okay. Um, is there any further discussion on this item? So. The motion made by Council Member Glover, seconded by Council Member Crone, is to potentially allocate 15,000 for warming center with the added stipulation that there's indemnification insurance um, reporting on the process, scope of work, there's a budget for services, and that it come back to the city council at the earliest possible meeting. Is that correct? In the form of a contract in, for the city council's approval. In the form of a contract for the city council's approval. Well played, yes. And we'll start by soliciting the, the, the proposal from Mr. Adams as well. Mm -hmm. And if I could say, um, following the community programs application for general items to be included. I mean, verifying the 501c3 status it's i mean it's there's just some standard items that are included as long as it doesn't put the 45,000 that we have for the other emergency programs no, no, in competition no. with it's the 15,000 it's just using that as a format mm -hmm. just following that sure. following that process mm -hmm. fine did you catch that okay okay all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed that passes unanimously all right. we will take a break until 7 p.m. at which time we will have um, oral communications Good job, everyone. Good job. By that time, I would say. And welcome to our 7 p.m. session, the January 14th, 2020 meeting of the City Council. Happy New Year. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Watkins? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Lover? Here. Crone? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. 
Thank you. And we're about to begin oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. Are there any members of the public who would like to wish, who would wish to address the city council? Okay, you can all line up to my left. You will each have two minutes to speak, and we request that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required. Out of respect to other members of the public, many of whom are not accustomed to speaking in public, I'm going to ask members of the public to please refrain from clapping, cheering, booing, hissing, or other similar types of behavior that might discourage all members of the public from stepping to the microphone to have their views heard. <coughs> Additionally, I would like to remind the public that they should also be guided around the following principles when making comments. We may disagree, but we will be respectful of one another. The all, mens, all comments should be directed to the issue at hand. Avoid personal attacks against staff and other council members, and please do not hold up signs in a manner that obstruct the view of people behind them. And I would like to invite uh, our first speaker to please approach the podium. You'll have two minutes. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold, I'm afraid you've got your uh, two-minute Ryan Coonerty rule here who's uh, really anti-public. Uh, here's a group of your city council people right here meeting with civonomics. You're cutting a, win uh, uh, a ribbon, uh, creating a lobby. Uh, I th believe this is against the Brown Act. We've got uh, Don Lane right here who gave the city, uh, the key of the city to communist Angela Davis, uh, who ran along with Gus Hall calling for the uh, killing of Christian children in one of his quotes. You'll find that on the um, circular you're receiving right now. Um, in addition, uh, you're setting up a parallel government. The real action isn't happening here in, fr in front of the people. The city manager really runs everything here, and AMBAG is where the parallel government is being set up. And I don't believe that the person that attends AMBAG meetings is telling the public all of the policies and the powerful people that sit there as stakeholders, like Driscoll and Packard and Panetta. They don't know where this authority or where this money is coming from. Again, it's a foundation like California Forward, the most powerful lobby in the West, co-founded you know, co by Leon Panetta, who gave military information to Red Chinese. We've got two plaques on the courthouse steps dedicated to Hugh DeLacy, a communist uh, Chinese spy. We also have Bruce McPherson here, who received tens of thousands of dollars from a triple Chinese communist agent on the front page of U.S. News and World Report. Uh, communism is not the people trying to overthrow the banking establishment. Communism is a tool of the banking establishment used to control, centralize the people. There's 15 seconds left. This is Bruce McPherson's uh, communications director. He used to work, he says right here, for ICLEI. It's a front for the United Nations and World Bank, which runs ICLEI, the parallel government, and they're pushing statewide through an outfit called CalCaw and using that lobby California forward. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, council members. Um, this, this is a very interesting uh, follow-up. Um, for those of you who in the viewing audience are unaware, and we've had a number of sampling of the population, there's a recall going on. But the recall is of the wrong people. Um, Mr. Crone is being recalled for a supposed laugh or snort, uh, which could not be find, found on forensic evidence, uh, examination of the audio or video examination of the council meeting. But he's being recalled, but in fact, on the September 24th YouTube of the city council meeting, at seven hours and five minutes, we have council member Myers going ballistic, screaming about not being a racist because she's an out lesbian. I have checked with a number of my gay friends and that is a non sequitur. Um, on the other hand, we have Mr. Glover, 
who's being recalled for ill behavior, if I can generalize, and yet we have our former mayor who is in direct violation of the respectful workplace policy, where she vented her own personal perceptions, so she didn't have to own up to anything, um, when there is a specific procedure for her to follow. So the people that should be recalled are Donna Myers and Martine Watkins. And for those of you in the voting public, please vote no on the recall and vote no a second time. Speaker. Okay, Garrett Phillip, this is kind of a boomer perspective, a little different. I believe any acceptance of the historically proven defective politic of the collectivists, including communism, socialism, nihilism, anarchy, and leftism, will destroy this country with its more prosperous and stable Western made of principles. Their stale grievances are misplaced, their solutions misguided, but their sense of something is wrong is not unfounded. At the core politic, the apple is rotten. We have a powerful plutocracy at work with a corrupted special interest serving government, co-conspirator engaged in profligate money spending that we don't have on a lot of things we don't need. In their self-interest, they have both corrupted a great many free markets and indebted us all, even the unborn, with unrepayable amounts of ever-increasing asset-inflating debt, turning us all into debt slaves, increasingly unable to afford much. The resulting debt-driven asset inflation in housing and the stock market has fueled an obscene immoral generational wealth inequality favoring but a few sociopathic percent at the top. It's simple math. An increase in overall debt that is never repaid stokes inflation. If one owns one million in assets at 10% inflation, that's $100,000. If you're lucky enough to get a 10% raise, that's a tiny fraction of that, which is probably not saved as an asset. One study indicated that what remains of the silent generation owns 25 trillion in assets, boomers 61 trillion, Gen X 17 trillion, and millennials just 3 trillion. Adjusting for when each was 35 years old, boomers have two and a half times their share of wealth than Gen X did, and 6.8 times more than millennials. You get the idea where this is going for Gen Z, which has many years to go. It's no wonder that 50% of millennials and Gen Z think the system is broken, it is, and mistakenly think socialism or communism is the answer, it isn't. No system is invulnerable to the forces of evil, and capitalism is the best system at generating stability and wealth such as it is. Instead of carbon, zero carbon emissions, you should be demanding zero increases in debt creation. Throw the corrupt Washington bums out and demand your country spend on essentials. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Hello, I'm Nate Kennedy, and I got this to say, Drew is and Chris are two of the most qualified members of the city council that have ever been. And also, what's this whole recall about? Drew, he's too black. Chris, he's too much of a hippie. Is that what we're recalling these guys for? Sure seems like it. They'll come be coming for Justin next. Um, with all that said, we need to get these meetings broadcast on radio, on FM, and uh, the guy to do it, <clears throat> the guy you need to talk to is Mike Olson, who is M-O at K-S-E-O dot com. So for anybody else here that wants to get these meetings on the radio, please contact Mike. I haven't done so myself, but I'm not a council member either. Um, also, what we need is not only radio broadcast, but we need to have a low bandwidth mono audio stream coming off the city's live audio stream coming off the city's website. And when they're saved for in the uh, archive forever, they should be, the ones that are already there should be crushed down so that they're much lower bandwidth than their mono and that will get the file size way down. Um, Another thing that I think is a good idea is we should take the uh, non-emergency number, 911 basically, but the non-emergency number 4711131 and get them to support Google Duo video calls. Possibly even use Skype or Uvu or there's a bunch of them, but the the best one I found is Google Duo. And then somebody calls them up, calls up uh, the emergency number or non-emergency number, I should say, to report something. They could actually show live video of the house that's burning down, live video of the car wreck that just happened. You name it. But we should be able to give them video as well. Thank you. 
Okay, next speaker. Happy New Year, City Council. My name is James Ewing Whitman. <clears throat> I do a lot of research. You can look up James Ewing Whitman on Facebook and probably learn about some stuff you're not aware of. You know, I reached out to, a, I said hello to a city council member. He said, you know, I know you, you talk about poetry. Okay, that was pretty succinct. What hurts the victim most is not the cruelty of the oppressor, but the silence of the bystander. Fiduciary trust, a person, artificial intelligence or corporate personhood, who has the power and obligation to act for another, often called the beneficiary, under circumstances which require total trust, good faith, and honesty. Those who have traditionary trust make them the channel of peace, where what that where there was hatred, they may bring love. That where there was wrong, they may bring spirit of forgiveness. That where there was discord, may they bring harmony. That where there is error, may they bring truth. That where there is doubt, they bring faith. Where there is despair, they bring hope. Where there, is, where there are shadows, they bring light. That where there is sadness, they may bring joy. Those who have judiciary trust, grant that they may seek to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that they find. It is by forgiving that they are forgiven. It is by dying that they awaken to eternal life. All those who have been given fiduciary trust have obligations to many future generations. Yeah. Next speaker. Hi. My name is Darian Mosnin, and I'd like to call attention to the dimly lit crosswalks at the corner of Washington Laurel and also at the Ocean Street, uh, right where the Jack in the Box is. Now, I find when it gets dark, it gets extremely dangerous for pedestrians and drivers alike. Um, I propose adding flashing lights to alert drivers of pedestrians, and I believe this can greatly cut down on like the dangerous situations that, like me, a driver, I also find myself, when I was driving over here, I was driving down Washington, and at Laurel, uh, there's a darkly, uh, there's someone I couldn't see wearing all black, and I almost hit them because I couldn't see at all because there were no flashing lights to alert me. So I think that adding these flashing lights can greatly increase the safety of everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker. Who are you humans? You're not my mayor. I didn't vote for you. Any citizen in, in Santa Cruz, vote for you. I'll say you humans. Any city in worldwide, everybody votes for who they want to be in office as their mayors. Why was that not here in Santa Cruz? That right been taken away? <clears throat> I'm sure if we would vote for our mayor, which we have the right, that guy right there, Glover, would be a mayor in our city. He's the one true leader that is here in this city. Um, you are still there, and it, to me, shows your character. You got people lying on you pertaining to trying to get you to recall, and you still here fighting for the citizens and fighting for Santa Cruz. That's the true nature of a leader and your character. Earlier today, citizens of Santa Cruz, look at these humans work. Earlier today in this meeting, we got a person talking about, well, I need to see some evidence of this and of that. I've seen you vote $400,000 for Harvey West, and you didn't ask for no kind of, well, what are they going to do with the money? But here this guy is working, already doing work you had nothing to do with, out of his own pocket, doing great work saving lives, and you're trying to not give him $15,000. We got another human over here talking about, yeah, thanks for inviting me to your center. I'm going to come. Well, a real leader would have went already. What's, what's the delay? A real leader would have went and got information they said they need. Citizens, citizens of Santa Cruz, look at these humans. They're not no leaders, and Santa Cruz has been acting a certain way for years. It will continue to be that way with the look at the work of these humans that are here. 
we need to really get rid of them. Keep, keep Glover. Is that it? That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Speaker. Good evening, council members. Um, I'm Dan Spells. Choosing the vice mayor on the basis of an appeal to honor a strong and important tradition of mayorships and vice mayorships being passed to council members receiving the most votes in city council elections calls to mind several other strong and important traditions. At the last city council meeting, I mentioned the strong and important tradition of using recalls only to remove crooks from office, not to suppress expression of political views. Another strong and important tradition vests in public hearings. I appeal to each of you, members of the Santa Cruz City Council, to conduct public hearings for the future of Lot 4, the large municipally owned parking lot where the Wednesday Farmers Market gathers. Number of other uses have been contemplated for uh, Lot 4, but there's never been a public hearing for the integrity of Lot 4 and the desire of the community for its future. The large municipal, uh, owing to its size and location in the heart of Santa Cruz, the lot is an exceptionally important common good whose future deserves a welcome consideration from the fullest breadth of the community. In the 1970s, public hearings played an essential role in sparing Lighthouse Field from squandering real estate developers. Architect Ken Wormhout met with residents of the Beach Flats area in the 1980s, I believe it was, on behalf of the city to plan a neighborhood park with the neighbors. And County Supervisor John Leopold frequently gathers with constituents to listen to pre preferences about prospective development of county-owned parcels in his district. Please then conduct public hearings to learn the broad community sentiment for the future of Lot 4. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, I'm Jane Doyle. I've been watching much of today's council meeting on channel 25. Because I've been recently sick, I chose to stay home instead of coming to the meeting. It was cold out and I was warm and dry. And I could heat water for tea or do whatever I wanted, even sleep if I felt the need. But I'm here now because I wanna offer some public thank yous. By the end of the day meeting, I was full of all sorts of emotions. And I realized that I need to say thank you to people because first of all, to the members of CASH who spoke, to Rafe, to Serge, and especially to Candace, um, for their clear, cogent comments um, on things that are really difficult for all of us to be facing. I wanna thank Scott Graham for his, as usual, thoughtful words. I wanna thank Brent Adams for what he does for the community on a shoestring even when he sometimes pisses people off. I'm a little better than he is at keeping my anger and frustration in check, but he balances it with so much concern and compassion that I honor him. Uh, I wanna thank Drew Glover for his clear cogent statement leading up to the motion given to give the warming center $15,000 because he trusts that it will be used in a good way to meet needs no matter what you know, without details. But I also wanna thank Donna for laying out some ways for it to, to meet the concerns of people who feel the need for those details. I really appreciated that. I'm having a little hard time with it, sorry. Um, I wanna thank all the members of the city council because I watched every one of you today in different ways. Think about what you believe in, look at this issue and other issues go, I don't really agree, but I'm gonna make it work. Okay. Um, and okay, I'm gonna say one more sentence. Tonight it's gonna be 40 degrees. We're all going home to warm places, but not everybody is. So thank you for what you were working on today. Thank you. Next speaker. Yeah, 
Yeah, as she um, pointed out, it's very cold out there, and and every evening people come to me very upset that the, their blankets and sleeping bags and tents have been taken, and we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year confiscating people's survival gear. And then uh, I spent a couple hundred dollars today to replace the gear taken by the city. And so we're proposing that um, an emergency temporary um, camp be reestablished as we had shown a perfect model of such a thing at Camp Phoenix. And it's an emergency as the governor has said, so it's about time to act. And it's frightening that people are suffering so that that they need to um, come to us. To, the citizens are actually replacing the items that the city is taking and throwing away at a huge expense to the taxpayers who then have to discard it at the dump. And yet we have to buy the belongings to replace them. So we're in solidarity, uh, both uh, the Santa Cruz Homeless Union, Food Not Bombs, the uh, students that are striking up at campus, Ask Me. All of us are united in ending the uh, inaffordability of living here and the low wages and the really but brutality that is occurring against our low income people in this community, whether they be students, whether they be teaching assistants, whether it be the hard workers that live in tents on the streets here in our community. We need to have some solutions and we really hope you get behind our proposal to reopen Camp Phoenix as soon as possible so that more lives are not lost. Thank you very much. Yep. Four minutes, right? Are you speaking on behalf of Puff? Yeah. Um, if we can give uh, Robert Norris four minutes, he... Okay, thank you. <coughs> uh, there is a shameful sabotaging of Brent Adams' proposal which means, of course, more death, more cold, maybe cold tonight, but it's predicted to be colder tomorrow night and raining the next night. That's what I've been told by uh, someone watching the weather. Uh, this is by a right-wing anti-homeless city manager-led cabal. Nothing personal meant, uh, Martine, but it seems to be what you do. Um, you can check out the city manager's speech, which the public was not allowed to comment on, even though it was an extensive presentation and an official agenda item, hence a violation of the Brown Act earlier today. The winter shelter hoax continues. There is no armory opening for the general homeless population, but rather it is simply the means of moving this group from 1220 prematurely to this one spot for a month and a half. Uh, while Justin Cummings, our mayor, has agreed to arrange a meeting long delayed for the last two or three months at least, it's felt longer to me, um, I, I'm concerned that uh, the, uh, Mr. Cummings is the key vote here, at least until a recall succeeds in driving away and destroying the progressive majority, which I hope doesn't happen, but given the recall process, it's hard to predict. Um, I had heard that uh, the mayor was sympathetic to actually maintaining 1220 River. That was the impression he gave to myself and two catch members on Friday evening, but that apparently is not the case. Instead, we get false reassurances from Susie O'Hara, who has reappeared here as the, the, the old tale teller and reassurer over the year after year that there's homeless shelter that does not exist. This is a disgrace, and particularly so because the homeless death rate this last year has been 84. 84 names are at the end of the homeless memorial. It says, 45 or 48 in the, in the text, but when you look at the count, the names, there are 84 of them. There's a lack of commitments. We have the governor, as has been said, offering to open vacant properties and buildings, including the Ross Camp area, specified. And this is something that we discussed with Mayor Cummings eight months ago and tried to get him to agree to. He said, oh no, just trust Susie O'Hara, trust the cities and its staff. What have we got? We have got no significant winter shelter this year, and we have freezing temperatures and a higher death rate 
We don't need this. And we have people camping all over town. Plus we have a right wing, a vicious right wing minority using the homeless issue as a wedge issue to destroy what is really a rent control majority or should be on this city council. We have misleading media, thank you uh, Jessica York who's in our audience, uh, it, who does not really describe what the winter shelter crisis is. And in other cities, we have things like people standing up for these issues, Moms for Housing in Oakland, where do we go in Berkeley? These are people, and why is this done? It's not done by bureaucrats sitting behind podiums with placards on their, uh, right in front of them with their names on it, getting salaries indoors, warm and comfortable when they leave these chambers. It's done by people in the community who are willing to come out Perhaps sleep outside tonight, outside city council. I understand there may be a protest happening after this meeting, or maybe in this very chamber here. There are empty buildings and there is a need. And what they have, we have an indifferent city council that thinks it's not indifferent. That's the irony. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Speaker. You'll have two minutes. Thank you. Um, Happy New Year, first of all. Uh, congratulations again on your position. I think the uh, recall is, um, it's, it's um, they, they wanna get rid of you two because you two have the, um, the, the, the cojones to stick up for poor people and the homeless. And I think that's what that really is. And it's, maybe I could be wrong, I don't know. Um, Justin, um, you, um, as a new mayor, I'm just, I just came up here to say, I hope that hopefully you can do something um, to change things around here, to hopefully get, get us into housing. There's a lot of us that need housing, um, uh, you know, pr pretty seriously out here. It is very cold out there. Um, I really don't have much more to say. I guess that's it, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, appreciate the comments. Next speaker. Hello everyone, Alicia Cool, president of the Santa Cruz chapter of the California Homeless Union. I'd like to start by saying that I think that the recall is basically a side effect of the war on the homeless. Um, it has a lot to do with Drew and Chris speaking up for the homeless population. Um, I'd also like to say that I would really like to urge you not to rewrite any camping ordinance while we have a severe lack of shelter. Um, I would also like to say that we're severely concerned about the shelter deficit that we're facing when we come to March, um, because that's when the armory will be slated to close. And so we're kind of concerned at, you know, at that point, then what do we have? With all that being said, um, welcome to 2020. We are in a new year and this is an opportunity. We have a new mayor, you know, welcome Mayor Cummings. I recognize you as our mayor. I'm putting a lot of faith in you to do the right thing and make the right decisions. Um, I don't agree with everything that happened last year, but like I said, this is a new opportunity. And so I'm really hoping that you will take this opportunity, especially in light of the executive order from our governor, to really look at solutions and not criminalization and enforcement. And so we provided you with an encampment proposal that we were really hoping, um, granted it's not in the best format, but all of the basis and substance is there. Um, all the services that would be offered, um, the whole plan is there. So really, really please pay attention to this proposal. We're ready to act as soon as possible. And meanwhile, while we don't have anything, I just wanna let you know it is really cold outside. We are working full-time. Basically, I have two full-time jobs. I work in San Jose now as a case manager serving the homeless population there. And here I collect donations for people. So it's a big job. Thank you. Yeah. Speaker. How's it going, everybody? I'm uh, Travis Wheeler. I've been uh, a citizen of C Santa Cruz County for almost two decades now. And uh, I only have a few complaints. I've noticed in the past uh, five years, there's been uh, a great decrease of benches downtown. 
And uh, every time I catch someone removing a bench, they tell me that they're refurbishing the bench for later, but the bench never returns. And I've been waiting six months for the last two benches that have been removed to be returned because they were supposed to be refurbished. And I guess they're never becoming refurbished again. And uh, another, another thing that is uh, becoming kind of an issue is these solar big belly trash cans. We can see that they're falling apart and we can see that they're solar powered, but what are they solar powered for? Just to uh, <coughs> set off a light sensor to tell you that the garbage can is full. They're uh, a waste of money and you could probably put in a few more trash cans in an extra 25 feet to a 25 meter range from how much those trash cans cost. And there would be uh, a little less trash around the jump bikes probably. So that's all I have to say. Uh, more benches and uh, more trash cans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before the next speaker comes up, I just wanna say that we usually hold public comment to uh, 30 minutes. We started a little late, which is why we're at 7.35. So if I could see the hands of people who would like to respond in public comment, I'm actually gonna stop with Surge because um, public comment would be over at least and you just walked in the door. But if anybody in this line, if, oh, okay. Well then, for the rest of the folks who are left, we're gonna end with Elise, and I'm gonna reduce the time to one minute so that we can get on with our evening items, but I will allow you to speak. So please step forward. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brianna Bird. I'm a graduate student at UCSC, um, which is currently withholding grades in protest of a cost of living adjustment because Santa Cruz County is unlivable. Um, right now, and you can introduce yourself real quick. Uh, my name is Arturo. I am an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz as well. I am part of an org called the Worker Student Solidarity Coalition. Um, and we're here today to stand in solidarity with Food Not Bombs, with the Homeless Union, with Moms for Housing, with anyone really fighting for housing justice. We really see the importance of graduate student positions, our positions as students, as a way to connect the dots. And we're telling you that as workers, as community members, this whole town is unlivable for students and workers alike. And it's ridiculous that folks are houseless when buildings are not occupied. Um, we have the ability in 2020 to do what we need to do with these resources. And these folks are coming to you and asking for this to happen. Very very calmly, so please, please, please make this happen. Once again, we're with the graduate students who are striking on campus in protest of how unlivable this city is, and we stand in solidarity with all of the folks fighting for housing justice. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Greg Bankson, uh, Santa Cruz resident and uh, registered voter. Um, I'll make it quick, I'm tired and cold. Um, I'm street level homeless and uh, gonna plan on trying to get out of that, but um, I, if I just adore my homeless brothers and sisters and, and the, the amazing things I see uh, just blossoming from different people. And uh, I think there's things that this year we can tap into that more and more. Um, no, no division, just let's work on stuff. I love this city. Um, uh, four weeks sober because I want to improve myself but also be able to perform for um, to be of service like everybody I see here. And it's, it's that important. And, but it sucks to sit through a four hour cash meeting um, sober. No offense. No, I actually, it's, it's important. It's important too. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker. <laughs> All right. I'm BC the Black Clown. I'm going to say this really quickly. There are solutions that we can all come together and figure out. The biggest problem is we don't know each other. No matter what anybody says about anybody that's here, you're all here for a reason. So let's all actually stop being so political and be community. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker. Nice job sitting all day. Um, I uh, we didn't get to talk at the city manager's report. I just wanted to talk to that. Um, I, I think that everybody is trying to solve homeless issues in different ways, and uh, it's not some people are trying to solve it and some people aren't. I think 
people are just looking at it in different ways. Um, I talk to the county and I work and I have some meetings with the city manager, the CAO's office talking about different ideas and stuff like that and go to some of the county meetings. Um, but I, I have to say I get more um, back and forth and more brainstorming with county staff than I do with some of the city manager, the city manager's department, even though I'm on a committee with city manager staff. Um, I really appreciate um, that people are definitely trying to get the job done and trying to do it their own way, um, but more voices in there. I understand that you're a policy decision, you're policy makers, but they make policy decisions like the armory and stuff. We weren't told about that or invited to that public engagement. Thanks. Yeah. All right, at least you'll be our last speaker for public okay. comment. You'll have Thank minute. you for letting me speak, Justin. Um, I wanted to talk about the um, DevCon development that's going in, uh, or hopefully, they're hoping they'll, they'll go in. They've gotten a number of their permits where the Taco Bell was at the end of Pacific Avenue in Laurel. The problem with this is that, um, well, first of all, we have somebody like Robert Singleton, who, by the way, is currently trying to start another smear campaign against uh, the two candidates that they're attempting to recall. And it's it's really egregious because it's completely false and uh, it's, it's just slanderous. And so he was appointed to the planning commission, even though the guy has a, a pretty serious history in domestic violence and other things that I need to uh, reveal that. But to get back, the Planning Commission is uh, has approved this 205 unit development with zero affordable or low income units going in. That's egregious, we need to change this policy. Okay. Thank you very much. That'll close public comment. Um, next up on our agenda, item number one, general business. I just had a comment for uh, the one gentleman about the crosswalks. I was wondering if that's on our crosswalk thing. Uh, he talked mm -hmm. about two crosswalks, one at Washington and Laurel and the other one at Ocean Street. Is that, because that crosswalk issue came to us previously, no? Yeah, there's a list of uh, projects. I don't have the specific list in front of me. We'll, we'll look into it. Oh, yeah, um, could you just get back to council, but thanks. Sure. <laughs> Great. All right, next up, uh, general business. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff or the council members who brought forward the item, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. First item on our evening agenda is protecting renters' free speech rights. This was brought forward by council members Crone, uh, Sandy Brown, and myself. And I'll uh, turn this over to council member Crone to introduce this item. Thank you, Mayor. This is just um, bringing us in line with state law and actually putting some teeth into the state law. Uh, it has to do with s several occasions I've heard from uh, renters uh, whose really free speech was being affected. They were being um, told to take down uh, yard signs during uh, elections for whatever measure, for whatever candidate. And uh, state law since 2012 says uh, landlords cannot do that, that there's protection for political free speech uh, for tenants. And so now this would uh, come in line br or bring us in line with state law, but actually have some teeth in it and be a $50 penalty and um, go up from there. Uh, and I just, you know, just putting people on, on I don't expect there to be uh, many of these instances, but uh, after we pass this, because um, I think the word will get out uh, that tenants do have rights of political free speech. So thank you, Mayor. Someone pointed out in a letter to us, I don't know, City Attorney, um, we, did we include the 90 days and 15, 90 days before and 15 days after, which uh, also was part of the, the state law, like for political yard signs. Is that part of this ordinance? Uh, I don't remember, I don't think it was, but they, they pointed out that it wasn't and, and should, maybe we could include that, I don't know. Yep, take them down after 15 days. Um, Hold on a second, I'll get back to you on that question. Sure, thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Matthews. Uh, just to that point, your opening uh, sentence about the purpose does say that it's in compliance with California Civil Code, et cetera, which would then <laughs> include. <coughs> that was the number of days. That was the language that I was looking yeah. for. Okay. So, um, yeah. so uh, the land, a landlord may not order the removal or remove a sign that's posted in compliance with 
the municipal code and civil code section 1940.4, and that's the provision that um, contains the 90 days before and the, and the 15 days after. So I think it's covered. Okay. Are there any other questions from council members at this time? Seeing none, I'll open it up for public comment. If anyone would like to comment on this item, I'd like to ask that you please line up to the left and you will have up to two minutes to uh, speak on this item. Hi, uh, Garrett Phillip. Um, this is a somewhat poorly written ordinance. Clearly, Senate Bill 337 intended local authorities to either regulate reasonable time limits for the posting of political signs by some tenants, or specifies as a backup for the absence of specified local time limits to protect property rights of property owners by reaffirming their property rights to set reasonable time limits for putting up and taking down political signs. They defined reasonable as 90 days before and 15 days after the election. Uh, if without a copy of SB 337 in front of someone, a reading of this ordinance implies there are no time limits and no authority of a landlord to request signs be removed ever or on when they can be put up whatsoever and penalties apply after a warning. Lacking a clear, I assume, written policy by the landlord, removal would become a crime in perpetuity. Um, now the city infraction writing officer must potentially get into the business of understanding what policies the landlord has in place regarding sign posting time limits if they are outside the state's suggested 90 days or, or 15 days after. Uh, it's also likely landlords all over town will have to modify rental agreements to install such limits into their agreements. I would suggest this will actually increase divisiveness in the community and, you know, oh well, huh? Um, this is a matter of property rights versus free speech rights, but stale political signs are really just blight. Uh, I would prefer and suggest, if you must enforce this divisive ordinance, to put the onus on the tenant to adhere to a specified time interval, such as this 90 days before or 15 days after, or lacking that, make the ordinance crystal clear the landlord has the right and obligation to set their own rules, including or outside those time limits, or to affirm their right with or without specifying rules to demand or remove signs posted outside those suggested time limits, as well as allowing them for longer if they wish their tenants to do so. So it's a little confusing. Thank you very much. Is there any other member of the public who would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, I'll return for action and deliberation. Councilmember Brown. Um, well, having experienced this myself as a tenant, being told by a landlord that I needed to take my signs down, I have a particular personal connection to this, but I have also heard from others and believe that um, taking this very small action tonight to affirm that the that the city uh, believes that um, this is a free speech right, um, I'd like to move that we introduce for publication an ordinance acknowledging state law, civil code relating to tenancy, section 940.4, concerning the rights and abilities of tenants to freely post political signs and setting the bail schedule for those violating this law. Second. Okay. We have a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Glover to um, adopt the recommendation that's before us today. Is there any other um, comments by city council members or discussion? I don't, I don't know if it just um, should be said, Mr. Mr. Phillips, what his comments were addressed right before he spoke, but I don't know if he was, there is time limits, 90 days and 15 days. Okay. I'll just say that um, I've also heard while I was campaigning of these similar um, actions occurring, which is why I'm supporting this today. And um, if there is no further comment, we can take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. <laughs> Moving on to item number two, um, remodels of the Brant Seforti and Garfield Park Branch Libraries. This is being brought forward by Susan Nemitz, our library director, and I will give her an opportunity to speak on this item. Hi, my name is Susan Nemitz. Very grateful to be here this evening and really looking forward to this presentation. Um, as you know, in 2013, the Santa Cruz Public Libraries did a master plan study and looked at the deficiencies of all 10 of our buildings. As a result, Measure S was created and passed by our public, providing $67 million across the 10 libraries to improve their facilities. 
As a result, the city of Santa Cruz was allocated $31,250,000 to upgrade Bransaforti, Garfield, and the downtown branch libraries. In the spring of last year, we hired Bogard Construction. We've got Kimmy Owens from Bogard Construction as a project manager and Abe Jason Architects. We have Abe Jason and um, K Katie Stewart from the architectural firm uh, to do a pre-design process with the community. We held community meetings in the spring and summer of 2019, and they put together a, a basic design um, for your approval. Like all of the projects that we're working on, and right now we're working on 11 projects, um, we are having some cost problems. And so I'd like to show you uh, what the dream for the projects are, what the consequences if we stay within budget, and then have an opportunity to talk to you about financing. Abe, Katie, would you like to begin? You guys able to see this? I, I don't yes. know what yeah, yeah. this building looks like. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Cummings, uh, Vice Mayor Myers, members of the council, thank you for your time tonight. Um, as uh, Susan said, we're here to present our design options for the Bransaforti branch and the Garfield Park branch libraries. And uh, we're thrilled to be here. Uh, we're, we're really excited about these two projects. We think they are both uh, inherently lovely buildings and uh, we're presenting designs that we really think, uh, you know, bring them back to their former glory. And I think you'll be uh, excited to see what we've prepared. Let's see here. So uh, just uh, briefly, I wanna introduce myself. Uh, my name's Abe Jason. I'm principal of Jason Architecture. And um, we are a firm located in uh, San Francisco and we work on community and public buildings throughout the Bay Area and libraries are one of our specialties. Uh, Katie Stewart, the project manager for these projects, will also be speaking tonight, and she'll come up and uh, speak to uh, some of the presentation. These uh, projects would not be possible without the community, uh, so I uh, first want to just uh, let the community know that uh, they deserve, uh, you know, great credit for uh, Measure S, and it is what funds these projects. So first, we're going to start with Branza Forty, and Katie's going to uh, walk you through. Uh, Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you all for coming tonight as well. All right, so just I'm going to jump right into Branson 40 Library. Um, so this is a floor plan of your existing library. Um, just to orient you, I know that um, the, it's a very popular library within the community, so just to get a sense of what it, how it's laid out currently. Um, so number one indicated with this red arrow is the current main entry to the building. Um, the dark green area is the current staff area. Uh, the sort of middle blue color to the north of that is the current children's library. Number seven, the dark blue color is the teen area. Um, and numbers five and two are the adult collections. So this library, although a very beautiful building, um, has fantastic bones, it has a number of both maintenance and accessibility issues. Uh, the lighting and the electrical systems are badly out of date and in need of repair. Uh, the plumbing <laughs> fixtures are not accessible as well as out of date and not in compliance with current California water co codes. You have an excellent outdoor patio, but it's overgrown and hasn't been maintained properly. And then you have finish issues throughout the building, uh, furniture that's beyond its usable life, and uh, circulation dusts that are not working properly for your staff. So jumping into the proposed design. Before I get too much into the details of the proposed design, I wanna take a step back and talk a little bit about our inspiration for the look and feel of this building. Uh, we're really inspired by the uh, context of this building within Santa Cruz, its proximity to the harbor, to Arana Gulch, 
and sort of the natural environment that's around it. Um, the beautiful stone and the beautiful colors of the uh, ocean, the kind of branching of the, of the tree branches and the roots in the local area, and sort of these elements such as the, uh, the lighthouse and the trestle bridge that have kind of a quintessential uh, Santa Cruz feel. So we wanna try and incorporate all these different elements into our design as much as possible. So what you're looking at here is the material board for the proposed design. Uh, so you can see right away, we've got some of those blue colors that we're seeing in the water. Um, you've got the wood that kind of ties back to the forest and also to the existing structure, which has these very beautiful wood trusses. Um, you've got a board form concrete, which is also part of the existing structure. And then you can see kind of that natural branching um, shown in the etched glass patterns that we're proposing as well. So here's the floor plan for the proposed building. And you can see right off the bat that this is basically essentially the same exact uh, footprint as the current building. So all of our um, proposed renovations take place within the existing building envelope. We're not changing how the building is sited or how much square footage is inside of it. Um, but I will draw your attention to um, Number one, which is the current entrance, is also going to be the new entrance. So we're not really changing the front face of the building. However, when you first go in the door, instead of to your left, instead of having that space given entirely over to the staff, we're converting that into a new community meeting room. Um, and this community meeting room is really excellent because it can serve as an independently operated out, uh, outside of normal operating hours space. So it has its own, um, the code mandated required number of exits and entrances. It also has uh, controlled access to the restroom. So if you close the building off kind of at the, the wall that's between numbers one and three, that space can operate without the rest of the building being supervised, which is really important for a community room space. Oftentimes the most popular events take place late at night when you don't wanna have library staff um, operating the building as well. So moving to the north of that, you'll see the new children's area with a connection to a revitalized patio, so really bringing some new life back into that outdoor patio. Number seven is an enlarged teen space. However, we're thinking about this kind of differently. We've decided to show the teen spaces two separate rooms, which could be used outside of kind of normal teen operating hours as group study spaces, something we've really heard from the public that this building lacks. And then numbers five and two, those continue to be the adult collections. However, we've really centralized the, or we've really consolidated the collection into number five, and we've provided a new lounge and computer space number, uh, at number two. So really giving this area over to quiet reading, to, to sort of group talking, um, public access computers, and having the collections centralized up at the north. All right, so jumping into visualizations. This is the approach to the building. Um, and as many of you know, this is very similar to how the building currently looks. However, we've made a key intervention right at the entry here, um, showing a new picture window, which is really gonna draw the focus to the, um, to the entry of the building. This, this building has kind of a secretive entry. There's a board form concrete wall that is right on um, between the sight line from the street to the entry. So this new window really um, allows people as they walk down the street to kind of see where they're supposed to go in and make that access path a lot clearer. We're also proposing a really beautiful picture window just to the right of it. Um, this could be kind of a new focal point, something that um, people kind of gravitate towards at the new library, and also uh, makes that streetscape very vibrant. You can see the activity within the building. It makes what's currently kind of a dead corner feel a lot more activated and a lot more a part of the, the library um, space. So right when you walk in the front door, you can see to your left, this is the new kind of community room suite. So there's actually public restrooms to the left, and then there's the, the larger community uh, meeting room. There's the staff desk, uh, right, right when you walk in, really easily um, supervise, really easily supervises the entire uh, library footprint. And then you can see further back beyond, there's the children's and teen areas. We're proposing a new glass wall between the main library space and the children's area. And this is really gonna provide some much needed acoustic separation. Um, the children's area can get quite loud um, when compared to the rest of the library. The kiddos get excited and kind of shriek. Um, and so this is gonna make that space more closed off and kind of make the overall library more usable because of it. This is that main beautiful large reading room space. Um, and as you can see, we're 
of being very faithful to the original design. All of this wood ceiling, those wood trusses, the board form concrete columns, all of that's existing. And as architects, we're really thrilled with this building. We like to say it has good bones. Um, actually, both of these projects do. So it's really exciting to be able to work on it. Um, and what this, uh, what this view is really showing you is that we're just kind of providing some new furniture and the new public computers within this space, bringing it back to its former glory rather than proposing something new. Here's the inside of that bay window, that beautiful picture window. Um, I could see this really being kind of a uh, like a touchstone for the building, say something like, oh, let's meet at the bay window. It could be something that's really nice and vibrant and kind of a little new insert for the building, something that's representative of the, uh, the 21st century. Here's that teen area, um, some room for teen collections, but also some uh, very um, multi-use furniture. So something that could be used for a group study as well as for the teens. Here's the children's area. Um, again, we're proposing kind of separating, consolidating the collections on the right here. Uh, younger kids' books in the front, older kids' books in the back where the shelves are taller, and also providing lots of nice soft seating in this area for kind of more casual uh, reading and play. Another view of this soft seating area showing how these new seating nooks kind of have a reference back to that bay window up at the front, a uh, continuous motif throughout the design of the building. And here's the children's area. I'm looking from the entry to the patio back to the area. Uh, something to point out in this slide is there's a screen in the back, and this is this uh, kind of a visual separation between the teen space and the children's space. So while a single librarian in the children's library can actually also supervise the teen space, there's kind of a subtle separation between the two so the teens don't feel like they're in the children's library, which I think is very important psychologically. And then here's the new outdoor patio, um, revitalized, pulling up all of the sort of dead, uh, dead plants that are there currently, thinking about a new way to do the trellis, making this really a programmable space. So while we're not adding any new square footage to the renovation, this new programmable patio actually gives the library some, a new space for them to use. And then an uh, inside view of this new community, community room. Um, really great space. I could see this being used for a wide variety. Um, you know, presentations during tax season would sort of be on one end of the spectrum. I could see maybe a wedding reception taking place here. So it's really a usable space, really lovely. Um, and again, this after hours uh, functionality makes it a great asset to the library. All right, and I'm gonna pass it back to Abe to talk about Garfield Park. Thank you, Katie. So uh, as, as Katie said uh, uh, about Branson 40, uh, we really love both of these buildings and I, I'm totally enamored with Garfield Park. Uh, it's a beautiful Carnegie Library. It's one of those classic one room libraries. Uh, it had a small addition done to it uh, about 20 years ago, uh, but it really sort of maintains much of its original historic character uh, on the exterior in partic particular, excuse me. Here's the existing floor plan, and so I'm just going to quickly orient you to the building. I, uh, many of you have probably spent some time in it. Uh, once again, the, the main entrance is uh, shown by the red arrow, number one. Uh, the light blue on the left is the adult area. You have a uh, circulation path through the center in the light green in number four, and then number five and six is the in the darker blue is the children's area on the right. You have a very large, uh, frankly, kind of oversized for the scale of the building circulation desk shown at number seven, and a well-used but undersized meeting room, number eight. And then on the left, uh, you up, upper left, you have an existing uh, access ramp for the secondary entrance, and then staff area in the back in number seven. Like Branson 40, although it is a beautiful building, there are some serious deficiencies, deferred maintenance, and uh, you know infrastructure issues throughout the building. Uh, you have older, uh, uh, inefficient lighting. You have furniture that is, uh, you know, fraying, and uh, you know shows the abuse of and the use and abuse that occurs in a public facility and really has started to deteriorate. You have a fireplace that is currently unsafe for public use, uh, given its proximity to the floor and its uh, sort of lack of closure. Uh, and you know, one of the sort of more egregious uh, elements of the building uh, it, uh, that I see as an architect is you have bookshelves in front of these beautiful historic wood windows. Um, in my opinion, you should never put a bookshelf directly in front of a window. That feels like a travesty. Um, so we'd like to bring some daylight back into the building. So. What is this gonna look like? 
similar to Brand Sephardi, we, we don't just jump right into designing the building. We think about where do we take inspiration from? How do we connect this building to your community? We uh, care very much about unique buildings that are designed for individual communities. And so uh, we looked at, again, some of the features of the ocean uh, adjacent uh, natural bridges in the afternoon. It has this warm glow. And that sort of made us think of uh, California poppies. And then, of course, the monarch butterflies uh, nearby natural bridges. And then uh, sort of also looking at you know, sort of the rough, rough ocean, because the, uh, the ocean is not always calm and uh, quiet here in Santa Cruz. Transferring that to a material palette, uh, we have a, a palette that is really uh, thoughtful to the historic precedent of the building. Uh, we've got a uh, carpet that reflects the blue of the ocean and then some color accents that are in that line. And then we're using uh, dark walnut to really give a nod to the uh, sort of era of historic Carnegie libraries where built-in uh, wood shelving was prevalent uh, around the perimeter of the buildings. And then a uh, light colored oak wood floor you can see there's uh, two fabrics, one that is uh, a blue fabric, that's for the adult areas, and then we have the pops of vibrant color uh, in the orange echoing the monarch butterflies and the California poppies uh, as well to really give it some vibrancy. And then we have a, a couple fun little nods. Uh, we have some brass accents which will be used in signage and uh, cabinetry poles, and that's really a nod to the historical character of the building. So the proposed floor plan really doesn't modify the overall layout dramatically, but there are dramatic impacts from the small interventions that we're doing. Uh, we are not expanding the footprint of the building, so it will remain the same size, but we are really reclaiming programmatic space for functionality. Uh, you'll see right off the bat that there were some awkward walls in the center of the space that have been removed, and it allows for a really clear corridor upon the main entry through to the circulation desk in the back and then a really well-defined adult area in number two, and then children's area at number three. We've reduced the size of the circulation desk to a more appropriate scale for a, a, a building that is very much the size of a small house. It's about 2,000 square feet. And we've done some very uh, sort of modest but important uh, improvements to the staff area. And then importantly, we've expanded the size of the meeting room, which is a real amenity for the community. Uh, lastly, you'll see that the ramp uh, on the exterior has been uh, replaced. Uh, this is unfortunate. It's not something uh, we would really uh, love to dedicate the budget to. However, it uh, unfortunately no longer complies with current ADA code. And so for access compliance issues, it does need to be replaced. So walking into the building, uh, again, those of you who have been in this building, you know that you walk in and there's just a wall of, of sort of obstruction ahead of you. And you can see immediately same size space, much clearer sort of entry and understanding. Uh, clear aisle through the center with new books immediately available, things to entice you to come on in and you know, sort of get to know the library. The circulation de desk is directly ahead of you, so staff is immediately available and obvious. On the left is the adult area, and on the right is the children area. Once again, it's a one-room library, so there isn't uh, too much to it. Sort of moving back to the uh, circulation desk area, you can see uh, there'd be an area for new books or holds uh, on the left. And you can see the relationship of the addition that was done around the year 2000 uh, with the, the older historic Carnegie Library. This is really the definition and the transition. And we're complying with uh, historic guidelines where we do make it clear what was the original historic building versus the addition that was done and that there's a transition there in character, but that they do mesh together and speak to each other. And you can see these sort of bronze accents in the uh, signage there and the, how the wood sort of relates between the two spaces. The adult area, uh, you know, very clear symmetry, as is typical with a historic Carnegie Library. We brought in the uh, walnut shelving around the perimeter, which really speaks to that era of building. We've kept the uh, curved crown molding uh, at the soffit, which is, uh, again, something very respectful of the original building. And then we've got a carpet laid in the center with a wood perimeter. So it appears uh, to, to look like an, like an area rug, but it's actually a modular carpet appropriate for public use. 
And then another important improvement is we are putting in a modern gas fireplace that will be safe for public use. And uh, we are using a um, engineered stone, so it's not a real marble, but it looks like marble, uh, which again is a really a nod to the sort of historic character. Many of these older Carnegie libraries had this beautiful wood shelving matched with uh, some, some marble by the fireplace or at the floor. Moving over to the children's area, you can see a very, very similar approach, but uh, we've brought in the pops of the orange color a little bit more lively, and then we've uh, created a pinup area for kids' art around the uh, top of the bookshelves. On the left-hand side is uh, computers and technology, and on the right-hand side would be a homework area. And then, uh, you know, looking out towards uh, the street, uh, I can't remember if that's Woodrow or Delaware out there, but uh, you, we've cleared out all those uh, stacks that really obstruct the view. We've brought daylight in, we've brought greenery in, and you can see those historic windows really start to shine in the space. A little vignette here zooming in. We've created these bench seats at each of the windows, and this is the kind of space that I know will be occupied at every minute of every day that there's children in the space. K kids are gonna gravitate right towards these little seats, sit down and not wanna leave. They're gonna grab a book and just be at, be at home. So we are coming to you with two scenarios. The, uh, what we've just presented for Garfield Park and, and Baranza 40 are the primary scenarios. They uh, sort of meet the, the full aspirations of the community, of the library. Um, and these uh, are what we presented in two separate community presentations. Uh, they are, however, uh, over the budget. So we are coming with a secondary option, what we're calling scenario B. And you can see the distinction between scenario A and scenario B and uh, sort of we'll talk about the cost at the end of this presentation. So Katie's gonna walk you through scenario B for Brands of 40. Um, so I think for the Brands of 40, the simplest way to talk about the differences between the two scenarios is just to give you the same visuals you saw again and take things away. Uh, so this is the children's reading room. And what we're gonna be losing in the scenario B is these beautiful new windows that we're proposing um, above the uh, entry to the patio and at sort of at the right here above the collections. Um, these really serve an important purpose. They bring light and daylight into this building. They provide some connection to that indoor outdoor space, make that program space really useful. Um, so I think the loss of them in this, in this area is, uh, is not insignificant. Um, another thing that we would lose in scenario B is the entire children's patio. We would not have the funds to do the new renovation for it. Um, that patio that I showed at the beginning with the sort of overgrown bushes and the decaying, uh, decaying trellis would have to remain. Um, at the exterior of the building, uh, currently there is a gate that separates the parking lot um, at the rear of the building from sort of the main right of way. However, that gate is located past the main entrance of the library. Um, so part of the new design is proposing moving that gate uh, out to the property line, which would allow the library to secure their entire property after hours. Um, the scenario B does not have the funds to move that gate. So the gate would exist at this location, meaning that the building entry would not be secured after hours. And then at the community room, um, something that we felt was really important was that this community space feel multifunctional, that it doesn't just feel like kind of another conference room. We wanted it to be something that could be um, really usable by the community. Um, and this beautiful wood vaulted ceiling and the wood wall here sort of brings it up to feel like something that's appropriate for a more special event. Um, but the scenario B funding does not include money for that wood ceiling or for the wood wall. So similarly for Garfield Park, we're gonna kind of walk you through the same sequence of images and then we're gonna show you the elements that uh, have been uh, removed from the budget to uh, adjust the, uh, the budget down. So once again, I wanna show you the proposed floor plan. Uh, take a close look at areas number two, four, three, and seven, kind of at the center of the building. And then take a look at the scenario B floor plan. What you can see is that at number six, there are these walls that really occupy the sort of center of the one room original Carnegie Library and are really directly impact programmatic function functionality. Essentially, they take away from the space available to the public. So in scenario B, those walls would remain. 
we've lost that really clear definition through the center of the building, that clear sort of aisle between the children's area and the adult area. And then you can see uh, number seven, we're, we wouldn't be doing any renovations to the staff area and we would not be expanding the size of the meeting room. Unfortunately, we do still need to replace the ramp. So uh, that is a quite expensive feature. It's a lot of concrete work and it is a code compliance issue. So we, we it is a non-negotiable and that will eat up a bunch of the budget in scenario B. So here is the adult reading area in the proposed design. In scenario B, we remove all of the walnut shelving. It becomes uh, just sort of paint grade white shelving. Uh, we remove all of the paneling up above. We remove the window seats. And um, importantly, you can see this uh, corner of these walls poking out and they'll become clear in the other images. That's the walls in the center of the space that really restrict pro programmatic functionality. And you can immediately see a lot of the charm and the character that we were working really hard to bring to this building is lost with these reductions. Once again, walking immediately into the front door, you can see the sort of clarity of the space, the respectfulness to the original Carnegie Library. And you can see if we leave those walls in the center of the space, essentially there's an object that is obstructing, obstructing functionality. And to, to sort of put a fine point on this, this has a direct impact on the ability of the library to provide programming for the community. It, it really reduces the usability of the spaces. So I wanna just quickly summarize the reduced scope takeaways. So under Brands of 40, you're losing the children's patio. You're losing the windows at the children's area. So that, the, that would bring a lot of extra light into that space. There is no wood paneling at the community room and we cannot re relocate the gate to secure the perimeter. Garfield Park sees more significant reductions. There is actually a reduction in collections because we need to uh, bring the facility into ADA compliance. It means that all those cramped spaces, they're not navigable by someone in a wheelchair. We actually need to remove shelving and we are not able to put it back. So there's a reduction in collections. Uh, the staff area remains oversized proportional to this building, which is about a uh, 2000 square foot building. The accessible ramp, uh, is still is still required to be replaced so that that portion of the budget has to remain in. There's a loss of historical character, which I think was obvious from the images. The drop ceiling, that acoustic ceiling tile remains. All the existing walls remain. The existing fireplace remains, which is uh, a safety hazard if it's used by, public, uh, by the public and staff currently. And there's no expanded meeting room and there's less seating. So, this is what this means from a budgetary standpoint. Under scenario A, the target budget for these two branches combined was 4.25 million. The total project cost of scenario A is 6.26 million. So it's approximately $2 million over budget. Under scenario B, even after we stripped out all of these uh, programmatic, aesthetic, and functional issues out of the project scope, uh, we were able to get closer to the budget, but they are still combined over budget <coughs> by about $581,000. Um, and happy to sort of answer any questions you might have about budget. So uh, again, in summary, the total budget for scenario A is 6.26 million. The total budget for scenario B is 4.83. Brief uh, sort of note on timeline here. You guys have been working hard as a community on this. Uh, the master plan was com uh, completed back in uh, 2012. And you know, coming out of the master plan, you had to organize for a bond measure. You passed measure S. You had to then evaluate options about how you're gonna approach your entire system. There was a conceptual design phase uh, and then a schematic design prepared. And then as the library is experiencing on many other projects, there was the dilemma about funding. So many of these projects are coming in, if not all of them are coming in uh, over budget, which is representative of the current construction market we're seeing in the Bay Area. So that brings <coughs> us to where we are now. Next phases would be design development, construction documents and permitting, construction, and then uh, that puts Garfield Park completing a little bit ahead of Brant Supporty. Garfield Park would complete approximately third quarter of 2021, and then Brant Supporty would uh, uh, complete approximately uh, first quarter of 2022. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Susan. I, she's gonna speak a little bit to these projects and then we can uh, transition over to Q&A. Thank you for bearing with us. 
Um, as you can see, there's some really exciting ideas that could really transform these two libraries into 21st century modern buildings. Um, I'm recommending that uh, you spend more money. Um, uh, our original uh, uh, planning assumption was that these two projects would uh, get about 4.25 of the Measure S funds. I'm asking for a million and a half additional of those Measure S funds. I've talked to the Friends of the Library, uh, Martin Gomez, who's the current president of the Friends of the Library, about having them make a commitment to raise the additional $500,000 by December of this year so that we could move forward with the full scope. I know he's willing to come up and talk. The board hasn't voted on it. They will talk about it on Friday. But looking at what they have already raised, and that they have two committees, one for Brand Safordi and Garfield Park already started. I really believe that this is within their power to achieve. With that, I'll stand for questions. Thank you. I'd like to return to council for questions regarding this item. Mr. Crown. I'm just wondering where the uh is the money coming from the bond itself, or is there another source besides the 500000 that friends will um, raise? Um, my recommendation is that $1.5 million come from the bond itself, the Measure S bond for the City of Santa Cruz projects, and a 500000 be raised by the Friends of the Library. So just to be clear, like, th so that's coming from what's available for the downtown library? That is correct. So, so, so somewhere we're gonna have to um, make that up, I guess. It is my belief that um, the downtown library project is underfunded and will need more resources with this or without this. Uh, I had a question for the um, city attorney. On two separate occasions, you had said that money from the parking fund could be used to supplement the cost of the library. Is that still the case? It's, it, as I understood it, it was general fund money, or is that not the case? I believe what I said is that money that was determined by the city council not to be needed for the parking fund could be uh, put in the general fund. And then how the city council allocates general fund revenue is really a discretionary determination for the city council. Thanks. And my last question was for the, the architect, uh, Mr. Jason. Um, could you show the um, Brands 40 Library the entrance one more time? Yeah, if you don't mind me taking the moment to flip back. Yeah. <coughs> this guy right here. Or the interior, sorry. No, wh where's the where's the doorway? Where do you go into the library? Right where it says library. Mm -hmm. This is this is this is immediate immediately upon entrance. I don't know if we uh, have a view from the exterior looking directly at that door. Was there anything um, going on with? Because uh, I know somebody coined it as um, homeless defense architecture, and I'm just wondering, it, was there any? thought going in when you were going through all this with how to um, uh, confront the, the, the problem we have with homelessness and that homeless people use the library a lot. Um, Council Member Crone, if, if you'll let me, I think when we had the community meeting, we also had a strategic planning meeting at the Brands of Forty Library and that the patrons who showed up that day's single biggest issue was security and safety. Um, if we look at our incident reports, um, the Brands of Forty Library has um, less incidents than the downtown library, but more than any of the other libraries in the library system. In particular, uh, the, the areas that seem to aggravate the community the most is the entrance to the library. Um, it is 
a spot for camping, but I also think because it has sort of this covered cement component to it, people come upon people camping and both are surprised, which has created some interactions that haven't been very positive. I would say though that another issue, and we've worked with the city on it, is the bike path on the side of the library has been a continuous issue for the neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Also, or before. I just wanted to just provide additional clarification on the question regarding the uh, parking funds, uh, just because the library subcommittee has been working on that and they've been working with John Barasoni. And I wanted to see if uh, Amanda could come up and just provide a little bit more clarity on that uh, question. Um, Amanda Rotel, I'm a principal management analyst in economic development and I've been working with our downtown library subcommittee. Um, and the question of the parking funds have, has come up a couple of times. So I'm just gonna read the language that I got um, when, uh, with John, that I worked on with John Barrasoni. So um, the parking district was created for a particular purpose to address the needs of, the, um, of parking in the downtown. And it's important to distinguish between um, parking district funds in general and park, parking district funds surplus. So so really only the parking um, district fund surplus could be expended for non-parking uses, but that would be only once all of the needs of the parking district had been fulfilled. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. um, in the past, the district has operated at cost and has not um, run a surplus and any future surpluses related um, uh, that would come to the parking district um, would first need to look at the needs of the parking district, which would be deferred ma maintenance, um, some of the long-term planning, um, and any of the surplus funds that have been raised from uh, the increased rates that we've seen, um, we'd need to look at sort of the terms under which those rates were increased and then look at whether it was appropriate to um, expend them for other uses since they were um, by council created for a surplus project. So those are some of the intricacies to kind of consider in the future. Um, and I think that's it. Any, any, uh, uh, thanks. Um, before, well, for follow up. <coughs> but, but ultimately um, the council created it and the council can make a decision to use the parking funds. Um, I'll defer to the city attorney on that, but. Um... I, I think Amanda accurately stated what the purpose of the parking fund is. Um, I, I think there's also a concern about the, the, the decision to increase parking rates was, was made by the city council in the anticipation that 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 was going to be used to alleviate parking issues in the downtown area. So I guess that's a policy decision that the council would have to grapple with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's, um, it's just really wonderful to see the possibilities here. And I really appreciate your, your enthusiasm, your commitment to um, reflecting the historical character and kind of, and the landscape of Santa Cruz and uh, what makes uh, our community unique. So thank you for that. Uh, I have a question which is somewhat, it's, so Ms. Nevitz, since you mentioned the bike path, I have a question that uh, came from uh, our chair of the Transportation and Public Works Commission did send us correspondence about uh, the potential to use this, uh, this process to do uh, improvements to the bike ped path there between Galt and Hanover. And so I'm wondering if that's been discussed at all and if there is a possibility. Uh, what, what Council Member Brown, it did not come up at any of the community meetings that I just received that letter today from the city. Um, we'd be happy to go and talk to the group. I would say that uh, take a five feet path to 10 feet. I'm sure it's not without cost, and as you can see, we're already struggling with the budget, but I'd be happy to work with the community on that because uh, you know, we share in the advantages of that bike path as well. And I think, just a really quick follow-up, um, I think that the request did say ideally 10 feet because that is kind of the, stand, the federal standard, um, but that it had been six feet, and so if there's a possibility to even get that extra foot back, that that was something they'd be interested in. Be happy to so, work with them. Thank you. That's great. Councilman Matthews. I just want to make a few comments. This is the first time I've seen these all blown up and beautiful, <laughs> and they're they're gorgeous. Um, I do want to make a couple of, for lack of a better term, historic um, comments. Um, when the um, facilities master plan was first done, <coughs> um, 
looking at all the needs of the different branches, um, the uh, possibilities for improvements uh, were projected over a range from um, extremely basic to quite ambitious, and we kind of struck a, a middle path on the bond measure. Um, the bond measure amount was set uh, partly in response to uh, the, the needs that were identified, but also just what what the voters would accept, frankly. And so it was understood even at the time that additional fundraising would be anticipated, and that's proven true. I don't know if the um, other council members have gotten a report on the progress at all the other branches, but they're they're all moving ahead. Some of them are gonna open pretty soon. Um, and um, there has been significant fundraising being done at all of these. So, um, and construction costs, as we all know, have gone up dramatically, which is reflected in all the work. So um, I think this um, is uh, not a, uh, an issue that's unique to us. Um, it's, there's several years of getting to this point. Um, so we will hear from the public, um, but um, I am impressed to uh, uh, hear that um, the friends are committed to fundraising. And so we'll hear from the public, take it from there. I had a few questions actually regarding um, just some observations that uh, it's some of which have come up as we've been considering the downtown library, but then I saw a couple issues that came up for me with this. With regards to the Branch of 40 library, one question I had was I, there was um, in one of the slides it showed that the staff, the staff area became reduced in size and it seemed like to a pretty big extent. And I just wanted to, I know that with regards to the downtown library, there's been a concern about the reduction in the staff space having an impact on staff and their, you know, the space that they have to work. And so I was just wondering if you could comment on that and as how it relates to, you know, whether this is gonna have an impact on staff in the branch 40 branch. Um, Mayor? I think it's a very good question and it sort of depends upon who you ask. But I would say that overall, I think um, sp staff spaces nationally are getting smaller in part because we are not processing as many physical objects as we have in the past. I actually um, believe that this uh, is a very functional workspace for a, a smaller library, um, and uh, I don't know, J Jessica, who's our regional manager, do you have anything you want to add to that? Do you think? Um, so, well, I would add that number eight, hey, come on. adding the community room. <laughs> Jessica's, Jessica's our operations manager. Um, so number eight, which is where we want to put in the community room, right now it is a staff space, but it is primarily a storage space. Um, so we do have like our toddlers go in there to have the toddler time because it keeps them corralled. Um, but it's it's not a space that's very well used right now for the staff either. Then the other question I had um, was just whether or not, it, it sounded like in the presentation that there's anticipated reduction in collections at the branch of 40 branch in particular, maybe not at both, but could you speak to whether or not the renovations would then also lead to a reduction in collections, whether or not we should expect that? So in, in both options, there is a modest reduction in collections. However, this is typical of what uh, we are seeing in modern library trends and it really speaks to a desire to bring the height of shelving down. Technically, actually, the older, taller stacks that you see in older libraries are not ADA compliant, and they require an exception to the code. That <coughs> requires someone, a staff member, to be present at all times to be able to reach the top shelves. So the modern trend in libraries is keeping shelves generally under five feet, and that alone often, even if you keep the same stack layout, uh, you know, sort of imparts a, a small reduction in collection sizes. Um, in the option B for Garfield Park, there is a more substantial reduction in collections because there's a twofold impact. One, we are not able to reclaim the space from the sort of awkward walls in the center of the space. And then two, 
for access compliance, uh, we are forced to remove all of the cluttered shelves in the center of the space. And really, we have only one spot to put it, <coughs> which is around the perimeter in between the windows. And so the option B under Garfield Park does see a more dramatic reduction in collections. Uh, scenario A for both branches is more in line with uh, what we would see typical, which is a modest reduction due to uh, sort of reduced heights. And is there any number in terms of by, you know, what magnitude the collections will be reduced? I, I didn't bring those tonight, but I can get them to you. I think it was not our intent in either of these branch remodels to greatly reduce the size of the collection. Um, we are trying to get uh, rid of the very tall shelves. I would say for another reason, uh, seismic requirements, that if it goes over 60 inches, you have to um, affix it to the ground, which really creates less flexible space in the branch as well. And so we'll get you those numbers. Thank you. And then I'd Vice Mayor Myers and then Councilmember Matthews. Um, I just have one question. Um, Abe, you mentioned um, a couple of times that the um, the ADA compliance that needed at Garfield is, can you give me the, <coughs> what you said that's one of the most expensive elements. I'm just curious. Yeah, how expensive particularly is the that ramp. ramp. Um, so it's actually, un it's unfortunate that the ramp was constructed uh, around uh, uh, 2000, give or take a couple years. and. Mm -hmm technically should have been compliant. Uh, it's, it's, it's not uncommon that there's some, you know, construction deficiencies or settlement, especially when there's outdoor ramps, but unfortunately it is, it is no longer in compliance. And uh, when applying for a building permit under the California Building Code, you are mandated to bring several things up to code. The first is the primary entrance to the building, so it's a path of travel from accessible parking spaces to uh, the, the door of the building. In the case of uh, Garfield Park, because it's a historic building, they actually give an exception that it doesn't need to be the front door. Typically, it would need to be the front door, but it's because it's a historic building, there is a special carve out in the California Building, building Code for Historic Structures. Um, and the ramp is, uh, it's, it's not insignificant in proportion to the scale of the job. If this was a much bigger project, proportional to the budget, it actually would have a much smaller impact, but it actually, takes up alone the ramp about 10% of the project budget at the full size and at the smaller smaller scope scenario B it takes up almost a third of the budget and that upgrade according to the code has to happen concurrent with any we will not remodel. be able to get a built building permit without doing that that's right thank you councilmember matthews i just wanted to um, point out i can put it in the form of a question maybe for you to confirm but although the collections might be reduced slightly the way libraries function has changed so much over time. It's no longer a place where the whole way of operating is go in, get book, check it out, and leave. But as, as shown here, lots more space to um, computers, to informal gatherings, to study space, et cetera. So it's, it's just a different animal than traditionally. So to, to trim the collections a little bit to achieve a really, in the end, much more active library by a lot more different populations is is a real net gain, I think. That's a question. Maybe I'll, I'll speak to that architecturally first and then uh, Susan can speak to that from a programmatic <coughs> standpoint. That is absolutely the trend that we're seeing in contemporary mm -hmm. libraries. Uh, to be really clear, we love books, we believe in books, we care about books greatly. Uh, and books are never leaving libraries. That being said, computers are coming into, I mean, computers are coming into libraries. Computers have been in libraries for 30 years. Uh, you know, sort of flexible meeting rooms become important. Uh, sort of program rooms that serve for story time space, that serve for after hours functions, that serve for community meetings are becoming important parts of libraries. So the library has really taken on a sort of whole variety of community services that it never once did. And that's kind of reflected in what you see in the sort of design and layout of a contemporary library. And I'm going to try to be brief, but I need to say this because it will come up again, um, except, uh, the way you design a library system can vary. Um, you could create, so in Santa Cruz, three 25,000 square foot libraries around the county. What this county has done is um, a wheel with small libraries 
and a central library that serves as a storage warehouse. And so I think we will have a different conversation as we talk about the downtown library because these buildings have been designed for holds where, um, where we get things from our master collection and bring them to these smaller branches. Um, if we were gonna start all over and not have that central area for holding books, these might look really different. And so that's my caveat in this discussion for the future. Well, thank you for the presentation. That's you know really amazing to see what potential there is for these two libraries moving forward. Could and be so, really cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So at this time, I'd like to uh, open the floor to public comment. And so, if you would like to um, make a comment on this for members of the public, please stand in line to my left. You will have two minutes, and we'll go ahead and start. Hello again. Uh, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the great job that, that the architects put together on those presentations. They're uh, really beautiful spaces, and um, uh, particularly for the uh, the Garfield Park Library. I hope that we're able to to uh, meet the full uh, vision of of that that space because I think that would be really wonderful. Um, uh, that said, I. I I had the privilege of, of seeing um, a similar presentation of this uh, back in the fall, um, and um, uh, the the tenor of that um, that presentation uh, around the uh, the Branza Forty Library uh, delved much more into the the problems of of the uh, current space and its uh, interaction with the uh, the homeless population that congregates around it and um, you know I, I feel like like we're trying to essentially do weaponized architecture um, and uh, if there are elements that we can cut from that to save money like for example the perimeter fence that was discussed I don't see what the security is for that space other than than a way to keep homeless people out and uh, I recognize that, that we're not doing a good job of, of uh, adequately housing people and people are having to make hard choices about where to be and, and um, when, uh, when a public library space is one of the only spaces that they can be and then we're, we're shoving them out from that space with our intentional architectural design, I think that's, that's troubling and I, I hope that we can do better. Thank you. Uh, next speaker. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. My name is Martin Gomez. I'm president of the Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Uh, the Friends, you know, uh, have been recognized by the library as the official fundraising body for the library. And I'm here to tell you that we're committed to raise uh, as much private funding as possible to supplement the funds for the renovation and expansion, expansion of each neighborhood library receiving measure as funds. We exist to advocate on behalf of the library and also to raise funds for the library. Uh, we've been working in partnership with our affiliated chapters and key volunteers throughout the county and we're well on our way now to raising significant dollars for each library in the system. The recent success of our fundraising efforts for the Capitola and Felton libraries, and by the way, Felton's gonna be opening very soon in just a few weeks, demonstrates that we are well prepared and capable of meeting the financial goal, goals outlined for the Garfield Park and Ranch Forty <coughs> Branch libraries. As a matter of fact, we already have some commitments going on and development of leadership uh, from citizens in those two communities. So we would like to commit ourselves to uh, being um, good stewards, but also to uh, raise the funds necessary to supplement the request. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Rena Dubin. I'm on the Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Library Board. And I, 
wanted to just say that uh, voters overwhelmingly support the library. They voted for Measure S, and unfortunately, the construction costs have gone up so dramatically in the last 18 months. But neighborhoods throughout the county are recognizing that this is a once in a generation opportunity. And I'm really hoping that you see that this is a once in a generation opportunity to create a modern library that the community wants and deserves. The, um, we have such a tight time frame to use the Measure S funds. And so I'm really hoping that y'all can really think about using these funds now as just taking the downtown piece off the table because I'm just a little concerned that we're not going to get the maximum benefits of the bonds because there's so many bond restrictions. Um, we really want to fully fund Brant Forty and Garfield Park. The proposed improvements, they're not aesthetic and they're not optional. The Measure S money will bring the libraries to a modern standard and will positively direct affect thousands of city residents. Um, the Brant Forty and Garfield Park, they really do serve an important function for our neighborhoods. An entire <coughs> cross section of our community depends on these small branches, families, kids, teens, the unsheltered, homeless, and seniors. Libraries exist to serve the public and the full proposal that the architects presented helped the staff maximize what the libraries can give our community. So this is the time to invest for the future of Santa Cruz, and we need to get it right. So thank you for your support for our library system. Thank you. Speaker. Hi, my name is Meredith Cook. I'm just a community member. I've been raising my three kids here, and we spent a lot of time in the libraries over the years, almost all the branches. And um, I specifically remember when Scotts Valley opened a new library and what a huge difference it made to spending time there. And um, I wanna shout out that I recognize my librarian who used to make a lot of book recommendations to the kids and just how important creating a welcoming and beautiful space it is. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Matt Farrell. I actually live in the Seabright neighborhood, so I use that pathway. And while it is narrow, it does actually encourage interaction between users in the pathway, and I haven't really had any conflicts there. So while it would be an amenity, there's some interesting interactions that happen under its current design. Um, secondly, I'd like to really encourage the council to fully commit the Measure S funds recommended by the library director. And uh, as Rena said, my concern is that we're running into situations where the longer it takes us to program those funds, we start to hit boundaries that limit how much debt, how much of the bonds we can access. So I think deferring that decision down the road and I think the members of the library subcommittee can confirm this, I think it, it, it could end up costing us. So I would encourage you to uh, um, follow Susan's recommendation, and I wanna really uh, congratulate you on what a great job you did in hiring her, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Next speaker. Uh, the presentation was absolutely beautiful, um, and uh, it's strange to me, maybe this is the way it's normally done, but writing a budget beyond the budget that you were given for something, I don't know how that works, but then when they started taking away the extra things, like it felt like someone took my shiny little toy out of my hand or something, like it was so pretty. Um, but all of that stuff, that's separate for me on just moving the fence, like that, <laughs> The safety of people walking up to the door, absolutely. People wouldn't be camping if they were walking in during business hours because everybody would be cleared. But there is a book drop off in that little doorway. You could make uh, like at the curb kind of thing, like a pull and the drop the book thing, be a whole lot cheaper than doing that fence thing. Um, I really hear that modern library thing, but let's not make modern also equal anti-homeless. Thanks. Speaker. 
Good evening, Mayor Cummings, um, City Council. My name is Gina Cole. I'm the director at Bike Santa Cruz County. Um, I use that pathway um, on my bike. Uh, occasionally when I'm going home, if I have to swing by Staff of Life um, to pick up something, and then I'll use that pathway as I'm riding to either meet my carpool or head home to Watsonville. It's narrow. The, today I rode it to check it out. Um, and as I was on my bike, uh, a runner was coming through and, and it was tight. It's not undoable, but I slowed my bike and put a foot down so that that runner could pass. Um, I see that as a really integral place for kids to get from Galt School to the library. And uh, when I was at the library today, it was after school hours. It was about four o'clock this afternoon. The parking lot was full. There were a ton of people inside the library. There were a lot of kids in the library. Um, and I think that it's really important to, one, have that pathway remain, to possibly light it if, if that's anywhere near um, a, a part of it. Um, according to the letter that, that Mr. Battelle wrote, um, he has been in contact with the folks that have purchased the, the property that's adjacent to that pathway. There's a really cool old house there and it's a giant lot, so I can imagine that there's gonna be multiple homes there. Um, and <coughs> in that case, most of that pathway falls on that um, property line. And so maybe that is something that they can work into, as, as Phil suggested, that is something that they could work into a negotiation with the homeowner as part of the development to increase the, the width of that, um, of that pathway. But as far as you know, kids it, walking possibly to Galt <laughs> or from Galt to that library, um, using those back ways, I, I feel like it's really important to maintain that. Thank you. Thank you. And at least before you come forward, is there any other member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, Elise, you'll be our last speaker and you can come to the mic and you'll have two minutes. I have a lot to say, so I'm gonna have to kind of talk fast. Um, so I am just gonna move really quickly. I would like to see more views. I would like to see the views of the actual entranceway on Brenta Forte. Um, it's beautiful and I appreciate the uh, uh, wonderful presentations. I do think that we have to ask ourselves, were cost comparisons made? How much um, uh, did we, how many architects did we really explore in the bidding for this, for these projects? And other things that I'm concerned about is, I've been to the presentations about the downtown library. The last one was so pessimistic. Just the whole thing was presented as, unfortunately, we don't have the money for this, and this is not gonna be like that. And if we go with the upgraded uh, design, well, we'll have to get more money. It was just really negative, and I think it's very political, and we really need to look at how political this really is through and through. So I'm sorry to always be this person that has to be the, like, the, the downer, <laughs> because I think it's a beautiful uh, design that we're seeing, really functional and wonderful, but we need to see more. I just had a construction go in next door to where we're living and our views are totally taken away. At the planning commission, they didn't show us neighbors next door. We need to see more views of certain things. Um, I think the council needs to know that there has been a grand jury investigation of surveillance of users at the downtown library that was brought forward by library staff. And I did not go back and read uh, Ms. Nimitz's response to that, which was uh, due on September 21st of last year. This huge push to get everything into computers and technology, of course, there's a, a modern need for that, but I have to th say that we have to consider 5G and the toxicity of the environment. We're also getting rid of thousands upon thousands of books. It's a big secret in Santa Cruz, except for at Friends of the Library, because they're dumpstering hundreds and hundreds of books. Most of this is cultural and intellectual history, and we should have a place for this storage of this wonderful cultural history. Remember Alexander the Great? They always burn the books. That's the first thing they do to get rid of the culture. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll return for action deliberation. Councilmember Myers and Councilmember Grom. Um, Vice Mayor, sorry. I just wanna, no worries. <laughs> um, I even just answered to Donna. That's probably the easiest. Um, I just wanna thank um, Susan um, and her staff um, for rebuilding our library system, not just our libraries in the city of Santa Cruz, but um, for working incredibly hard for an entire system of libraries to um, 
to upgrade these buildings. I've, um, I've really tracked the progress in, other, in a lot of the other cities. Um, and we're talking about um, you know, all of the communities raising anywhere from hundreds of thousands to, to millions of dollars to, um, to provide the best library that they can for their community. And so that's been very inspirational. I mean, Little Felton has raised over two and a half million dollars for their library. Um, and that's a town of you know 3,000 people. So um, I think it's very telling by the numbers that passed Measure S. Um, I think the number was an incredible thing, like 72% of the voters or something like that passed Measure S, which is a statement by our community, by our by our uh, users of our libraries that they want new um, 21st century libraries. And um, I think these two are a, a special gem that we are lucky to be the stewards of as, as the city council and as city residents. Um, and um, I think about um, the university when they did their fundraising uh, work for the science library and McHenry library. I happened to be working on the development team that was um, starting to do that work and they raised tens of millions of dollars and those two libraries are beautiful. <coughs> And so um, I grew up, my, my mom was a librarian, so I have a, a, a bit of a, of a personal investment in this, but I think this is one of the most important decisions we're gonna make for our community um, this year and into the future. And um, we're the stewards of the children and the youth of our community. And if they don't have um, a place to go and read and be quiet and discover the world uh, through a free library book, then we're not uh, really serving um, the people that I'm here to do my, my time for. So um, I'm excited about what I've seen. Um, I am not at all overwhelmed by the fact that we may need to raise a couple million dollars. It's gonna be a lot of hard work, um, but that's what leadership is and uh, we need to deliver for our community. And um, I also just wanna really express um, thanks to Susan that you know our system serves everyone. Um, no one is denied access to our libraries. Uh, in fact, they provide critical daytime um, facilities for people who are unhoused in our community, people who need to um, get in touch with their families, people who need to look for jobs, people who may be looking at housing listings. So um, our libraries actually serve um, as, as kind of uh, uh, na navigation centers in many ways. And in fact, the downtown library branch actually provides services for exactly that. So. Um, we're not talking about downtown tonight, but I just wanna really make sure that people are really aware that our libraries are all inclusive um, and that they just provide a critical, critical piece to um, what everyone in our community needs, which is access to information and the ability to um, utilize these spaces in a way that serves them. Um, so I'm excited about what I'm seeing and um, I will, uh, I, I'm excited about to make the motion tonight. Um, but I will defer to my uh, council uh, colleagues here for some more discussion, but um, I do intend to make the motion tonight. If, if I can, I'll do it right Let's now. People do it. Are doing it. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, well, go okay. ahead. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, make a motion to, um, to approve the recommendation for the remodels of Grant Supporty and Garfield Park Branch Libraries. Um, and that will be to approve, number one, the approve the schematic design and the budget of 6.25 million and the financing uh, to authorize the development of construction documents, to authorize city staff to advertise for construction bids, and lastly, to authorize the city manager to ex execute the contract in a form approved by the city attorney and execute change orders within the approved budget. Second. Second. Okay. Second. Oh, that was <laughs> Just kidding. So we, we have a motion made by. You guys want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have a, a motion made by <laughs> Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by Council Member Crone. Um, further discussion? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, I was gonna do the same thing and I agree with everything you said about <laughs> the existence of libraries and what they mean in this community and what they have meant. I think you have a very supportive council up here. I love the projects. They look really, really beautiful. I am concerned about that, but I said about the homeless issue and sort of the defense of architecture and I hope that um, there, there's an inclusiveness that goes along with this, but um, and I am worried about where the money's coming from, but uh, I guess we'll have to d dialogue and debate about that as uh, time moves on. But um, thank you very much for all your work. Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Watkins, and then I have a question. 
I am so excited to be at this point. <laughs> Finally, our ship is coming in. Um, uh, the whole issue of possibly expanding the bike path came up and uh, it occurs to me that, that if that were in the realm of possibility, perhaps some active transportation plan money or something could be allocated to that. I do know in Felton that um, Mark Stone was able to get some uh, state grant money to develop the, um, the garden adjacent to the library. So uh, if it's not the library remodel per se, then maybe there's other funding that we can look forward to make that part of it happen. Um, I am just so struck in, in all of these libraries how many different populations they serve and as the conversation went on, everything from the, the toddler reading groups, raise a reader, places for teens to hang out, for community groups to meet, for people to access computers, uh, housed, unhoused of any age. And you know, another um, exhibit that many of us saw recently was at uh, the Ma about senior isolation and, and what libraries mean to seniors. So they really serve the entire spectrum in age and demographics of our community. So this to me will be a wonderful generational investment and so wonderful that these two are uh, taking advantage of buildings that each has its own really distinctive and wonderful architecture that can be brought into our, our century. It's great. Watkins. I don't know if I can say it any better than my colleagues have already said it, but um, I'll go ahead and just add that my two cents are sort of just also appreciation, not only for um, the different versions that you presented, I think it's important for us to know what we could have, what we um, may not be able to have if we chose to not go in that direction. And I just really want to highlight that, you know, we really are in a unique time and it's a real privilege to be able to uh, make this decision to really ensure that we're thinking about the libraries for 50 years from now mm -hmm. and um, the next generation and, and, and also meeting the needs of those, our, our current residents. Um, and, 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 and access and thinking about access and just, you know, as somebody briefly who lives on the other side of the path, I, I really do relate because that's how you, I would get to the library in terms of going through that narrow path. So we want to be mindful of that in terms of access. Um, but this is, a, this is a real step in something that I think Santa Cruz can be really proud of. And, um, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to vote on this this evening as well. Just a quick comment, I'll say here, here uh, to everything that's been said. And uh, also just add that this is, uh, you know, the additional funds that we are, I believe, about to approve um, really are, it's not just about aesthetics. And, and mm -hmm. I think that the, you know, the programmatic functionality improvements are so important. And I really appreciate the, um, the seriousness with which you undertook that task to bring us something that would really uh, meet those needs. So, you know, I, it is the pretty shiny things that, um, that I, you know, seeing those go away is, you know, disconcerting, but it's really making this commitment is about program and, and how the space is used and not just observed. Um, thank you. That's Barbara Glover. Thanks. Yeah, big supporter of the libraries and thanks for the presentation. It was really nice to see. I had a chance to talk with Susan previously about it and kind of <coughs> knew what to expect with some of the takeaways. So it was like, oh, here we go. Um, one question, uh, since the, the motion's on the floor and it's seconded and it sounds like there's a lot of support for it, which is great, uh, is the gate though. So uh, we heard from a couple people, uh, especially people that are involved in the um, world of advocacy for people that are experiencing homelessness. And I want to acknowledge what you were saying about general safety and or people coming up. There was the recommendation of the book drop relocation instead of the moving of the fence. Um, I'm not sure exactly how much money the fence removal and replacement would cost, but what's the likelihood of being able to not do that and then reallocate that money into the other designs so, and then saving that much money of not moving the fence. I mean, that's not something we've talked about before the motion was made, but I'd love to get your feel on it. Is it like a deal breaker? Is it something that you'd be open to? Uh, one, to avoid the perception of uh, weaponizing architecture as well as limiting uh, potential shelter space for someone if they're in the middle of the rain and need some place to be in there. Like, oh, there's a library, but it's totally locked down like a fortress. So. You know, I'm just 
interested in exploring that with you? Uh, it's a very good question, Councilman Glover. Um, I think it's, what we're trying to do is reflect community interests. Mm -hmm. It's hard when our uh, target group that we serve is everyone. Mm -hmm. um, our, we have traditionally tried to say that the library is incredibly committed to serving people experiencing homelessness in our community, but we try to do it as a library and not as a camping space. Absolutely. And so um, we just have received so much feedback from the Brands of 40 community, and I just have to say there are people who want the bat path gone as well, especially people who live on it. Um, but uh, about the level of camping that's going on uh, in that space. And it was really an attempt to create a library that serves as a library, and we, we have no problems being a day shelter. I mean, we do that for everyone. Um, I think the difficulty was the after hours camping and some of the things that were occurring on site. Again, all of this is, is subject to community interest and need. And I'm willing to go and talk to groups about it. Um, I think the word that I keep hearing is defensive architecture. And I think um, I've seen it in cruel ways, but I've also seen architecture that um, so Madison Public Library is a great example of a library system committed to serving people experiencing homelessness, um, but it's through zoning and creating circulation and entrances um, so that everyone feels comfortable in the space. And, and I just wanna say I'm committed to working with the community to find the right answer for the Brands of 40 well, Library. I don't know if, it, I don't think it can be incorporated in a motion or anything right now, but I would just encourage if it's possible to go back and talk to the groups and see if you can find a workaround so that it doesn't be perceived that we're, or just, we're, so that we're not blocking off the library, but still able to address the safety concerns of the community, which are important as well. I appreciate it, but otherwise, I will do thank that. you. Thank you. Okay. I'd just like to say that um, it seems like a really great thing that we're about to do for our community. I'm very excited. It seems like, you know, there's a lot of support on all angles, and I'll, and I'll just also reiterate my concern with the fence too, because I think that, you know, given the fact that we're reallocating funds from um, that, that could go to other library projects, and given that we're going to have shortfalls on all of our library projects, if there's one area I feel like we could cut some costs, I think the fence would be one of the first things that we should consider, and then coming back at a later point in time and putting that fence in, if we could raise more funding, rather than spend funds that could go to another library right now. So I just wanna express my concern around that as well. Um, but I'm, I think that we're at a point where we can move forward with this item, and so um, I'll just restate that um, the motion on the floor is that we adopt the staff recommendations that were provided on the item uh, that is labeled the remodel of the Branch 40 and Garfield Park Branch Libraries. The motion was made by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by Council Member Crone. If there's no more discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope, that passed unanimously. Are directors allowed to squeal? Yep. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. All right. Better get that bake sale started, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <clears throat> have a GoFundMe. Yeah. Well, they have, I think they have chairs lined up for each branch. They do. Yeah. 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 That's not good. <laughs> You're so bad. I'm See where she was talking about. later. <laughs> Why don't we take a short break and come back in five minutes? Okay. I mean, everybody's clearing out. We'll give people time to clear out. More than five, right? Restoration. All right. Okay.
Okay, we are on our last item of the evening. Um, and this is item number three on our evening agenda. City Council request process with presenters Laura Schmidt, myself, and um, Councilmember Watkins. So I will turn it over to Laura Schmidt, Interim Assistant City Manager. Thank you, Mayor Cummings. Uh, as Justin said, I'm Laura Schmidt. I'm the Interim Assistant City Manager. And if you may recall, back in June, the council at the council six month work plan retreat, a work, an ad hoc work group was formed and that was uh, Mayor Cummings, Council Member Watkins and myself. So we met several times over the course of the last few months and have prepared for you a proposed update to the council policy 6.9 and this relates to uh, new council requests. So it was a pleasure to work with the work group and Martine helped out with uh, basically legacy knowledge of various agenda, um, council policy, the council handbook, and um, Justin and Martine all contributed this information and my job was to kind of organize, organize and amalgamate. So that's what I'm going to present to you tonight. I wanted to step back a little bit before we got into the actual lanes and criteria and the workflow of the council request and talk a bit, little bit about the context of the work holistically within the city. And this relates back to Nicole Young's earlier presentation regarding strategic planning. So overall, the community expresses needs and gives us feedback and that gets translated and inputted along with staff internal information into the council strategic plan. And then that council strategic plan drives staff, departmental strategies, priorities and projects. So we really on an ongoing basis ping back to the council strategic plan and vision for us to on a day-to-day -day basis as staff <coughs> implement strategies and priorities and projects. And then you also see that before you on an annual basis in our city budget and the work plan and the items that come before you during the budget hearings and the capital improvement project process. So generally, that's how we get our priorities and policies and essential marching orders from the council on a day in, day out, annual, multi-year basis. But what happens when we have new requests? either because of the legislature, the business environment, the larger political environment, something comes up and the council members want to initiate a new request. <clears throat> That's where the council policy 6.9 update comes into play. It could be a council member idea that <laughs> generates the new request. It could be something mentioned in oral communications. It could be something from the state or federal legislative level. It could be a council email, any email that comes into the city. And it also could be an, an urgent, emergent, emergency need that triggers a new council request. And then I just put another bucket because I'm an IT person and there's always the if and then else other part of the logic. So overall, what are these buckets of new requests? So the group came up with four of them. The first one is an emergency or urgent request. The second one is a quick information. The third is research resolution and reports. And the other one is project slash more complex research, uh, more complex resolution or a more complex report. So the Gray column outlines for each one of those request types, what are the hours of work, which is what we found is an easy way to delimit how you know which request type you're initiating, and then what is the workflow that happens. So an emergency or urgent request, the hours of work can be all over the map for that. It could be very quick, it could take a long time, and there's an entire council policy, I think 6.2 related to special meetings, should you guys need to initiate an emergency meeting around this. The first contact for this one is at the mayor with a CC to the city manager and the city attorney, and that's especially because if we need to call an emergency meeting. A quick information item from the council, it's usually less than one hour of work, 
The first contact is the department head and the assistant city manager acts as the department head for the city manager's office and the city clerk areas. The research resolution and report could be anywhere from one to eight hours and the first contact for that again is the department head. When it reaches more than eight hours of work, that is what is the fourth category, that it's more of a project, it's more complex research in this resolution and report. So the first contact for that is the city manager and that's the one where we've asked that it be documented and submitted to the council so that you as a council whole have the opportunity to, to discuss and understand the requests more and approve or not that item and that request to proceed to staff to work on it. We did a litmus test against these four categories and these are examples that we came up for each one of them. So the emergency or urgent request, an example would be the residential rent e increase, the moratorium when the Tenant Pro Protection Act came in. Main beach hours was another one. A quick information request could be a clarification to planning and community development about explain this building code to me. Summary of past council action on a particular topic. I recall that this happened around November. Help me figure out, you know, what was it? And then we go off and we find the specific meeting and the action summary and what the motions were. Research resolution and report, and this is the one to eight hour um, time frame. An example would be support for the California Circular Economy and Plastic Pollution Reduction Act. Research sponsorship of a new event or an organization could be another one. And then the police Dispar department dispatch summary reports was another example of this type of request. A bigger project that's more complex and involves more time, eight hours plus. A good example of this is the Parks and Recreation Harvey West Pool Operations. So you guys asked Tony Elliott to go back and research and bring back op options as far as how could we open up <coughs> that pool to serve the community longer and year round. The inclusionary housing changes are an example of this project bigger work item. The next few slides just go into the, the additional details around each one. So this is for emergency or urgent request. The prioritization filters for this one are life and safety, natural disaster, imminent danger, and urgent emergent need. And in this case, the group came up with two sponsoring council members in consultation with the mayor, city manager, and city attorney. The lead time and impact on the council agenda report deadlines, if it is a special meeting, obviously that procedure gets called into play. If it can be done at a regular council meeting, the content has to be submitted 12 days in advance of the city council meeting or whatever the then active administrative process is. The red line edit that was published as a change, I had accidentally left the word in business and it's not 12 business days, it's 12 days. The quick information request is less than one hour. You just contact the department head and they will get you in contact with the appropriate staff to assist you. Prioritization filters and requirements, this is not applicable, it's an inquiry, it's an educational information request that involves less than one hour of total staff time. The lead time impact on council, it doesn't impact our council agenda. A research, a resolution, or a report, the hours of work involved here are basically eight hours or less. The first contact is the department head and they will get the appropriate staff or it could be the department head, his or herself that works on it. The prioritization filters on this one are, um, it would be very much preferable if it has fidelity with the current council strategic focus areas. So if you have established a strategic plan for us, the work that we focus on at any given point should be able to ping back up to that strategic plan and there should be a line of sight there. This one is, has three sponsoring council members for the request and if it will end up at council. So the lead time, the content has to be submitted 12 days in advance if it's something that needs to go to council. It could be a report that just gets handled 
administratively over email where you're asking for information. It takes five hours for staff to compile. They'll get it put together and they'll send it out to the council. And in that case, you don't need to worry about the council agenda deadlines. The more complex project is more than eight hours. Your first car contact is the city manager. And this one needs to be documented and submitted to the council and it will proceed if approved by the majority at the council meeting at which it's discussed. Again, it should have fidelity with the current council strategic focus areas. And this is a list of the documentation that the group felt would be good to include in the agenda report. A definition of what is actually being requested, a line of sight documented of the fidelity with the council's strategic focus areas, the actual practical problem that's being solved, the goals of the request, if we were to do nothing, what happens? The departments needed, and then do we also need community partners to be involved in the process? The estimated timeline and the opportunity cost. If we pick up this and it's a two month project, then can the department that has the most resources involved absorb it or do they have to back burn or something else in order to make room for it? Fiscal impacts and costs associated with it. This one must also have three um, sponsoring council members. The content has to be submitted 12 business days in advance and note the agenda report submitted enables the city council to determine if the request will proceed or not. That is the summary of the updates to 6.9. And then Justin or Martine, Mayor, Council Member Watkins, if you have any additional information and comments you'd like to add. Um, well, thank you, Laura, You're for welcome. the um, for the thorough presentation, but also for the support. Because you know, in our meetings, often um, the mayor and I would be like, "Well, we want this, and we're thinking about that, or what about this circumstance, or how about that?" And trying to navigate the scenarios. Um, but at the end of the day, the the bigger picture is how do we have some consistency and expectation, transparency, um, and framework to work off of. As it's currently written, it's very broad and um, wanting to uh, kind of narrow in a little bit about what is sort of the processes that we should have in place. Um, and, and also recognizing, I guess one thing I will point out, um, that even though there are ideal standards for prioritization, that really those are the filters where we talked about sort of seeking, but knowing that those could be um, modified if needed and applicable, because sometimes there is that other category or that other situation that we just really hadn't thought of, but you wanna have some flexibility within that as well. But really being mindful of general kind of processes and turnaround and timelines, it's not, you know, it's not a fast, we're not that nimble in government. So um, recognizing that there's, um, some sta some sort of processes and standards that we need to adhere to. So um, I just want to I, I want to thank my colleagues and um, and I'm hopeful that this will lead to more transparency and um, and um, just a better expectation of how to move forward with items on the agenda. And I would just like to add um, first thank you to Laura and Martine for working on this with well being able to have the opportunity to work with you all on this and um, as we were directed by council. And additionally, um, I just want to add that, you know, I think the intent of this is that when council members are, are making requests and asking support from staff, that there are realistic, that, that we have a template, right? So that um, if for some of us, there's going to be an ordinance change that we want to work on, that's going to take a substantial amount of time that, you know, the first step in that process is that we bring that to council so that we can direct staff to work with council members on these types of requests. But if it's going to be something that's going to take a very short amount of time, that there's a uh, there's a template set out to say that if this isn't going to take that much time, then sure you can go work with this staff member to put something together, and we can bring it and put it on um, an agenda. So this is really uh, intended to provide a framework for how we can bring things forward, and is a template for. Um, how we are able to get items um, placed on the agenda in a way that's going to really maximize our, our efficient use of time. So, and um, yeah, let's leave it at that. Matthews. 
Um, assuming we adopt this, thank you for the work on it. It's it's been frustrating on both sides. I'm quite sure on the staff side and on council side. So if we adopt this, we're we own it, <laughs> and I assume also it gives staff the um, it empowers staff to say, wait a minute, <laughs> has to go down this path. I think as Justin mentioned, it also gives both staff and council members uh, expectation of the different types of requests mm -hmm. and how they should be handled and it handled and it takes the guesswork out of it. So there's accountability on the staff side and on the council side as far as this is the process and these are the steps that we'll take. So if it's category two, send it to Bonnie, she'll get it somebody to somebody in economic development and they'll get you a response. Any other comments, questions? Uh, questions, yeah, so uh, thank you for this, um, for the presentations, good stuff. So um, myself and some other council members had brought forward a uh, agenda item uh, maybe two or three months ago that had to do with the agenda setting process and then we were assured that there was the process that was in place and now we have the result here, which is good. Um, there are some things that were are from that document and from those recommendations and examples that were given that are not included in this. Um, some of it had to do with a community member's ability to get something on the agenda by submitting a request to a city council member and then they would be able to bring it forward to, uh, for the potential of getting on the agenda. Um, also, just a, something that comes up is the requirement for there to be three, just specifying there needs to be three sponsoring council members because if there are times when there are not three sponsoring council members or two where there's a mi minority of a certain perspective or persuasion on the council, um, that would limit their ability to get something on the agenda if they weren't able to get any of their colleagues from alternate ideological perspectives to, to uh, co-sign onto it. So there are, there's a couple concerns that I have um, just that there's nothing here about if like a community member wants to get something on the agenda. Like in other cities, there's forms they come in and fill out in the city manager's office. And as long as they have one sponsoring city council member, then that gets considered for um, agendizing. So I'm just curious why none of those things were incorporated in this report and where they went and stuff like that. Sure, I can speak to that briefly. I think that the idea was that if um, if a member of the community, as we mentioned earlier, if somebody mentioned something during um, oral communications and that um, city council members want to take that on, uh, the idea being that they could find, you know, there would be council members who could step up to sponsor that item on behalf of members of the public and they could bring that item forward. Um, I think that ultimately um, one thing that that I'd mention, and I'm not sure, like, and it can be for consideration, but I think ultimately, um, regardless of, you know, the number of sponsoring council members, it's still at the discretion of the mayor mm -hmm. at the time to put an item on the agenda. And so um, I think that, you know, if a community member is bringing an item, um, I think that our recommendation is that, depending on the type of item that you have, at least three council members who are willing to support it, um, or two, depending on the type of item. Because if you don't have that much support from council members to even bring the item forward, then there becomes this question of um, the validity of wanting to bring that item. So, so I, I totally hear what you're saying about that potential, except that if a council member that is trying to say extend an olive branch to other council members to try and bring them onto a project, but then those other two council members decide not to participate, then that council member is stuck in the Brown Act and can't uh, get two additional. I would actually, part of, part of, and you know what, that actually came up in our process and I'll let the city attorney speak to that because we brought that up where, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea was that if, for example, I ask a city council member whether or not they'd be interested in working on a particular item with me, if we don't go into the substance of that particular item, then there's not a violation of the Brown Act. I, I totally hear that, except that if I go, hey, do you want to work on this with me? And then they go, yeah, what do you got? And then I tell them, and they go, eh, actually, no. 
then that locks me into not being able to go to uh, to other people and say, hey, do you want to work on this? And they say, yeah, and then I can't show them what I got because it is substance and therefore shows the direction that I want to go with the policy, thus violating the Brown Act. I, I think where we discussed this before is that if a council member is shopping an idea, um, that in and of itself wouldn't create a Brown Act issue. Um, if you say, I, I'm interested in bringing forward a, pro a proposed ordinance for you know, whatever, um, and you shopped it to Council Member Crone and to Vice Mayor Myers, and they both said no, that wouldn't prevent you from shopping the idea to another council member. Um, where you would have a problem is if the three of you were working on an ordinance and then one of you got cold feet and said, I'm out. Mm. Now you have a Brown Act problem, and I think the remedy for that is for um, there to, for the issue to be raised at a meeting so that you could at least ask for an item to be agendized without having that be um, you know, uh, outside of the context of a, of a regular meeting, so. But just to, to respond to that, but how would I talk about it at a meeting if it wasn't agendized and I had already hit my Brown Act limit because I was working with some people and then they got cold feet and, you know what I mean? By making a motion to add it to a future agenda. Oh, during the, that'd be interesting, okay. <laughs> Council Member Brown and then Council Member Watkins and then City Manager. Yeah, um, so I wanna appreciate the work you all put in and really appreciate the uh, efforts to uh, establish what is pretty involved taxonomy and also think about flexibility. I appreciate you mentioned that because not everything is gonna fit into this taxonomy as is never the case with, with classification. But with respect to the challenge that Council Member Glover brought up uh, and uh, our city attorney's response, I, you know, I feel comfortable with that um, kind of moving forward, but we also have, you know, in the notes here, additionally that the city council meeting calendar is for changes in the schedule, not for the content of meetings. So that is a space where some of us have, that some of us have used uh, when we felt uh, that was kind of the only way to move forward. Um, but here, the policy statement suggests that that is not, it, it not available to us. So, you know, I don't wanna suggest that calendaring time is a time to kind of get everything on the agenda. I would prefer to go through the other channels, but I also wanna make sure that, that the potential challenge there can be addressed somehow. If our requirement is that we have to have three and somehow we get kind of stuck without three, then I think being okay with saying, okay, well then if it has to come to the, a public meeting, um, then we do it that way as a kind of last resort. I, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that, but if uh, it's the only way, then I mean, it's I, the only I, way. I, I, fully agree with your earlier comment about how, how this is a guideline that as it is implemented, we're, we're going to have to really learn how to work with it and get accustomed to, to that. But I also think that's the same point that goes to the question of what if I'm trying to get council support and I, and I reach out to one council member and they say no, does that taint the well for, for reaching out to other council members? And I think the way to work through that is um, you know, that, that's one of the reasons that you have a city attorney who's pretty much, you know, available any time of the day or evening or weekend to talk through those issues. And, and um, you know, I see my job as to assisting the city council in, in getting the work of the council, you know, on the agenda and done. Um, and, and so, while that's not a direct response to uh, Council Member Glover, I think the intent is to, um, make it a more efficient way to conduct city business, not not make it less or, or, or more difficult. Can I add to that? I mean, I think the way that is addressed is that, in, particularly when it comes to the, the more than eight hour items, because that's where you have the three requests, is that the first step is to, you, you do get the sponsors, but the first step is really for council to consider whether to proceed or not. So I think that's where that comes in, where you, you know, your first step really is, is in part is to gauge how your colleagues might feel about it and the community as well. Um, and, and I think, because I think sometimes what we struggle with is when an item comes and it's already sort of 
in place and, and done. And this is this uh, sort of sense of like, you know, we have to take action today. Um, and so I think that's that's sort of the idea here is that, you know, for these big items, the the first piece is, is to, you, obviously you have to have all the justifications and, and the filters and the requirements put in place, but it's not forcing you to, you know, make a final decision. And so I think, you know, it seems to me that council members would be more apt to consider each other's requests if they know that there's, you know, a, you know there'll be a follow-up step. The first step will be to bring it forward uh, and then the council can then decide whether they want to move forward with it or not. And, and, so, and I think that's the way it works in a lot of cities and, and I think it works really well because it provides that additional layer of sort of review and discussion and consideration before people sort of feel like they're sort of forced to sort of take action without really sometimes knowing what other considerations might come up or how the public might feel or some other consideration. Um, and I think, again, it also allows you to just have more thought and consideration around the work plan, around all kinds of issues that you might not know by so simply, you know, putting an item that's already sort of, people feel it's already baked or it's already in the works. That's what Watkins. The only thing I would add is that, um, well, there's two things. I think uh, maybe I just thought it and we didn't discuss it, but I do think we maybe talked about if you did shop for that third third council member and they declined, then you would say, and I reached out to a third council member who declined and, and it wasn't. So you would just sort of notify the um, the mayor and the, and the city manager and the city attorney of, of that. Um, the other thing I'll just sort of highlight is that this is not um, a way for the mayor to withhold any item. Every item will have an opportunity to be heard. It's really a prioritization filter mm -hmm. of how agenda items come on. And so the um, if there's an item that will come forward, it will come forward. I think it's just how we were thinking it through was as a prioritization filter, not as a, a place for no item to be brought forward in the future. That's not the role of the mayor to make that decision, but how you identify managing a meeting and prioritizing items is the role of the mayor. And we really wanted to kind of find some guideline associated with that essentially for context. And I'll also add that um, ultimately at the end of the the end of the day, the mayor has the discretion of putting anything on the agenda. So these are criteria that we um, are recommending that council members meet in order to put items on the agenda, but it doesn't um, eliminate the ability of council members to then go to the mayor and ask for an item to be put on the agenda. So um, I just want to state that as well. I, if I could. Sure. And or for an item to be in the queue, essentially, for how they would be agendized. Okay. And just to add a little bit more, I think the other key to this being successful too is we have to have consistency, um, not just among the council, but also with the staff too. We also have to sort of have that discipline to when a you know, council member approaches a, uh, a staff person that you know we apply this as well and not have sort of different treatment of how we deal with various issues. Um, and I think, again, that's just really critical. So it's not, it doesn't serve us well if we have a policy and we don't really follow it. So I think I just, again, encourage us to, really be very deliberate and uh, consistent with the, the approach. I just um, thank you for the work you guys. Um, definitely um, well thought out and you know, just I like the idea. I like that you kind of tested some real life examples. I think that's always good. And um, I think g along those lines, um, one thing I found a little bit hard is that at, at this point, at least maybe it's, I haven't, I haven't asked or I haven't been trained or I'm not quite sure, but you know, even just having, you know, make, having a place where we can get the agenda report for, template and some of those things, I know they always get refined, you know, once it's gone, you know, into the system, but even some samples or something, you know, just, you know, if there's a couple of good agenda reports that you felt like really met the, would meet kind of the intent of this, you know, maybe make those available somewhere. So, you know, as you're thinking through this and maybe maybe doing a report yourself, you've got some standards that you can look at so that you kind of see the flow of what really the agenda report is supposed to do and the accompanying attachments. I think that would be very helpful. I think particularly for the, again, for the eight hours or more one where four, you can have yeah, a template, because I think that's the one where I think we tend to have the biggest challenges with. Uh, I think if we have a template where, again, you have the basic information, 
uh, and then council can consider it, and then then it then it really moves on from there. And in, in, in terms of the ordinance being developed or whatever process you know needs to happen for it to move forward. But I think we can do a template for that one. I think, yeah, that's I think a good it, idea. it really, um, as you're working with your colleagues, you know, it really gives you that chance to pause and say, do we really have this ready? You know, and so I think there's also this this piece of re reflection on readiness that sort of comes from that expectation. Whereas if you don't really have a guideline, you put everything down on paper and it feels like it's ready. But, you know, I think that that might be a, a good set of, um, you know, things to have for us. But great job. Thank you. We actually, I've actually started a process with another staff member to go through some historical agenda reports so that, especially with the subject and recommendation language, mm -hmm. to standardize that so you guys, you know, in a form approved by the city attorney, you know, direct the city manager to execute, blah, blah, blah. Each department and within a department has different ways about doing that. And what I've noticed over the last seven months as interim is we could really standardize on that so you guys aren't guessing. So whether it's a grant, whether it's an RFP, whether it's an award of a RFP slash bid, all those different things, we can make it a little bit easier for you to navigate so that something you see is like, oh, this is, a, they, they're requesting us to go out to grant. Yeah. Oh, this one they're joined during to a state contract, so there is no award, they're just entering into a contract. And then along with that, I, um, I also, depending on it, it, how the 6.9 went, we could tr create a standard area for this one, as well as with the previous direction in December for health and all policies. We also need to put standard language in the agenda reports of the line of sight to the health and all policy three pillars. So it, it's something we definitely already would like to follow up on in different ways as far as standards so that it's easier for people to write agenda reports and easier for consumers to read them and then we can incorporate this. And I, I think as um, as we start to work through this, this is sort of the first iteration in flow and just an attempt to really help streamline the processes. So I'm sure there'll be improvements along the way. Um, I just had a question really quickly for the city attorney in regards to the council meeting calendar item. And if I yes. um, understood you correctly, my understanding is you're suggesting that that is the place where a council member could potentially seek the support of their colleagues to have something placed on the agenda. Is that accurate? Not necessarily. Um, there is a provision of the Brown Act that says essentially that no discussion or action shall take place on an item that's not on the posted agenda. However, the council may refer the item to staff uh, to respond briefly to questions or uh, to get further information or the council, um, a council member or the council may uh, direct that an item be agendized for a future meeting. So so we've said in the past that that, that could be a parking place for asking items to be placed on a future agenda. But the advice is really based on the Brown Act provision that says, um, that there's an exception to the general rule about no discussion or action on items that aren't on the agenda. One is to direct that an item be placed on a future agenda. And, you know, I've been terrible at policing this in the past, but when that happens, there should be a motion and a second, and if it's got support, it should be voted on, and there should be very little or no discussion on it. So, so. Okay. I guess the reason being is that, um, that is advertised as a way that we're thinking about the calendar in terms of calendaring. Mm -hmm. And um, if that is the place where that is, because of the Brown Act, we're required to have a space for that, then I think it should be identified as such, that it's for council meeting calendaring and or council initiated items based on, without discussion or something like that. Because I think right. what I feel is, you know, we would have that and it was not really properly um, understood, you know, in terms of past practice, one, but also in terms of what I think the community and expectation of the item is. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. Uh, historically, that has been an opportunity for the council to really look at what its future meetings are, not to have a debate about what should be on the next agenda. Right. Um, it is an 
atypical for agencies to have an item at the very end of the meeting to uh, give an opportunity for council members to ask that items be agendized for consideration at a future meeting. So, so that would be a, a change in the practice. But isn't that contrary to what you've just described here? Yeah. And, um, yes. So I can think I, if, if we're going with this, right, the in, whole idea, well, right. Well, in our conversations, and, and Tony wasn't in, in, in all of our conversations, sure. but so what we talked about is this really replaces that because th that is the issue that, you know, what was, what I heard in the committee in our discussions was that, you know, items would be brought up and people wouldn't know enough about them to feel comfortable one way or the other. Uh, and so the thought was, let's have a more deliberate process for that so that, uh, and that means doing some additional homework, you know, assessing what the workload would be, doing some homework and putting it together, and then bringing it forward to council and getting some support. So the idea was council members would have to do a certain level of work with their colleagues, with staff, to have something brought forward for your consideration. And the first step is to consider whether you want to move forward with it or not. And that way you would have all the information, the public would have all the information rather than you know, an item that you know generally has been used to calendar items. It's really just about when the next meeting is going to be, or there's going to be a change in the calendar, um, and to kind of avoid uh, some of those issues. And that was part of the discussion. But uh, I mean, I, oh, sure. yeah, I guess if I may, though, that's um, that definitely was part of the discussion. And what I'm hearing is there also needs to be space for something else based on the Brown Act in terms of adherence to that. And yeah, so what, I, what I think it contemplates is, for instance, uh, members of the public come in at oral communications and <coughs> raise the issue of uh, the dangerous uh, intersection at Laurel and Washington, and the council could at that point say, staff, I'd like to get a report back on that, or city manager, I'd like to ask that we agendize that for a future meeting. You know, that's that's the opportunity to do that. So you don't need to have a... a um, an item on the agenda specifically for the purpose of adding items to a future agenda. And I, I agree that this policy um, is really an attempt to provide that mechanism outside of the meeting agenda. Um, but there is that narrow exception in the Brown Act as well. Councilmember Crown. Just a couple of questions. Um, so, uh, Council member communications with staff should be limited to normal city business hours. Um, I mean, that sounds good, but practically, it, it you know, the way it functions, we don't have much time when that agenda comes out. And, um, you know, a lot of my questions, I, I meet with people Saturdays and Sundays, and so I'm firing questions and um, at um, department heads really all weekend, uh, and they're usually responding which is really good. So does that mean I, that I shouldn't be doing that? You no, know, that doesn't apply. This does, that doesn't apply to that. I think that was related to, to request. I think, you know, I think uh, with respect to the agenda, that's perfectly okay. Um, and actually we prefer that you email us with your questions ahead of time and uh, recognize that uh, a lot of that work has to, ha has to happen over the weekend. So that, that's not a problem okay. at all. Okay. And so um, also, uh, uh, Laura, I, I gave you, what would that request look like that I, I requested today about putting up board, boards and commissions and links to those agendas and minutes of those boards and commissions that council members sit on because currently that isn't up on our website. So what would that be, what would that look like as a request and time commitment? At this point, not having looked into it very much, I think it's a number two. I think it would take me less than an hour of work to research that and get back to you. Okay. And then if it's something that we can post up um, with under, underneath the hour. Okay, and Tony, you said something before, by making a motion to add it to a future agenda, when would you make that motion? If you couldn't get the, the three council members, I think it was in response to what um, Councilmember Glover said, and you said, uh, by making a motion to get it on future agenda, and if you don't make it at the calendar time, and then you just gave the example of oral communication, giving right. it right after oral communication. Right. Um, but there again, we have the conundrum where a lot of council members might not know about the issue and, and how important it is or whatever, or, or what very much about it. 
Well, I mean, having not been part of all of the discussion that went into the, the development of this policy, it sounds like the intent here is to provide a mechanism for council members to bring these items forward. Um, that doesn't involve the same, I guess I would say awkwardness of having a motion to add an item to a future agenda without the ability to discuss it in any depth. Um, because of the restrictions provided by the Brown Act. So this is really, an, it looks like an opportunity to, or, or an attempt to provide a, a more workable mechanism for getting items on the agenda. Um, not only um, to be more efficient about it, but also um, <coughs> to ensure that when they do come forward, um, there's been thought put into it at the staff level and that they're ready for a full-blown council discussion. And, and can I add that you know 99.9% .9 of the time, items there's 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 time to consider the items, and I think that's the idea here to do some some work ahead of time. Um, if during a council meeting something comes up, uh, it's typically if it does come up, it would be in oral communications, and the council could you know if something it was an emergency or situation that needed, needed to be followed up on, you could at that time say we want this to come back for whatever reason. Uh, also, there's the emergency provision that's here. So if something is really of an emergency nature, then it could be brought in, in that context. So I, this has mechanisms, you have mechanisms to do that, but the idea is to, you know, generally uh, for most items have a process so that there's some analysis, some research. You know, again, the easy things, we just do them. The things that are, are gonna be challenging and affect your work plan, affect the strategic plan, affect uh, and be controversial, that there's some uh, deliberate work done to them bringing forward and it, that it's more thoughtful. And just two things that I'd like to share on this. One is that, for example, for number four, um, it should be that there's this note kind of in the bottom right corner that the agenda report submitted so that city council can approve, disapprove the request to proceed or not. And I think that that really encompasses like the first step when it comes to these bigger items that you're sending a request for consideration of, you know, an ordinance related to, let's just say, surveillance for example so then or if it's something that's that's going to take a lot of staff time that um that it's directed that staff work on that and it can be with council members or a subcommittee and then the agenda then the requested documentation which is kind of this uh, second bullet point in, in the second column you know it has an outline of what are the things that we need to see when that comes back to council so um, what is being requested, you know, how is it in line with the strategic goals? If we do something, um, if we don't do anything, what happens? Who needs to be contacted? What's the timeline? What are the costs? And then that can come back and then further action can be taken. So that we really have a, a clear sense of when we're going into this, what are all the different factors that need to be taken into consideration? And then we can move on those items and, and kind of have that process take place. So, and then, and as I said before, ultimately as well, the discretion is with the mayor when it comes to putting items on the agenda, because ultimately um, having to go through agenda review and see where things fit in and what the timing is gonna be is also a really, it's you know essentially the role of the mayor. And so um, really trying to make sure that things are done in a way that's efficient is, is also a part of this. With that, um, if there's no further comment, then we can open it up to public comment. <laughs> what do you have to say? <laughs> Sergeant at arms. <laughs> Is there any member of the public who would like to address us on this item? <laughs> You're gonna get out by 10 if you wrap it up. Yeah, I think we might be out of here. All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Uh, I'll move approval, thank you. I'll second. All right, so we have a motion made by Councilmember Matthews to approve the recommendation, which is to accept a status update regarding a process for routing and working on new council requests and adopt the process as part of council policy 6.9. It was seconded by Councilmember Watkins. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All, any opposed? Nope. That passes unanimously, and that will conclude our uh, meeting of January 14th, 2020. Efficiently done. Yeah. On time and under budget. There we go.